<laughs> it feels so silly, but hopefully it'll be worth it. All right. Going live. <laughs> it feels so silly. But all right, let's, we'll... let's go. <laughs> all right, all right. One second, one second. Sorry. <laughs> Okay. Um, so I want your honest opinion. My audio, does it sound good? Does my audio sound good? Because I hope so. In some testing, it was actually sounding pretty all right. <laughs> and I feel like a fucking loser. <laughs> good. Because I hope so. In some testing, it was actually sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I got rid of some of the echo. And I got rid of a lot of the clicking noises when I clicked my mouse around. <laughs> That's because I just have a fucking sweatshirt over my hand. <laughs> so that's kind of funny. And then behind my microphone, I set up a bunch of blankets and shit, like, draped over. I have this super scaven contraption. Of like, you know when you were a kid and you went to the science fair and you had that cardboard thing that was like one panel here and then two panels that go like this? I got one of those and I set it up behind my mic and I draped a blanket over it. So now my microphone is in this little blanket cave. And I also have my second chair over here with the blanket draped over it. So, because I was reading online on how to improve sound quality, it's like, if your room has hardwood floors and hard walls, which this one does, uh, I already drape a sheet behind me to block out the light from that window, but it was saying you should have as many blankets as possible on the soft surfaces to absorb echo and help the sound quality. And I was listening to like Milk and Cookies, uh, Total War. I was listening to like Turin and some of the other big streamers and their audio quality was just a little bit better than mine. So I, I set this up into testing. It actually sounded a little bit better. So we're, we're rolling with it, but it's just like, over here, I look like I have a four-year-old's version of a, of a fort, like a blanket fort. And over my hand, when I'm clicking around, I have a sweatshirt to block out some of the clicking noises. So I just feel like a goon, but whatever, man. If it improves audio quality, that's fine. So we'll see. Because, like, if this actually helps audio quality, I can go to Home Depot or a, a appliance store and get... Uh, some sort of arch, like a little wooden arch and put it over my hand and then drape like a towel over it. So it's not as goon, <laughs> as goon feeling as just having a sweatshirt on my hand. Um, I could be a little more professional, but let's see. <laughs> but what kind of audio setup is? I don't know, man. <laughs> 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 I just can't. Every time I look at my second monitor, I just see this giant fucking blanket fort. Oh, it's too funny. All right, let's focus up. Let's focus up. What do we have today? It is... Something. It is a new player tournament, one of our usual ones. I know I have not been streaming a lot recently. I just finished up my last week of work at Mayo. I'm moving to a new job for the state of Minnesota April 10th. So I have a bit of time here to help move and stream and stuff. So you'll be streaming more often. Uh, I didn't get to stream a lot this last week because normally in a normal work week, I know what my schedule is and I can work around it for streaming, right? Where it's like, oh, I have to extract a run. I can start that at 4 p.m. So I'll do a stream from like 10 to two and then get ready for work and go in, right? On the last week of work, it's like, I don't know what people are gonna want. What for me is I'm handing off projects. I don't know where people are gonna want me to be. I can't come in after hours because people are gonna be looking for me and just like, hey, I heard it was your last week and whatever and do this and this and this. So I, I wasn't streaming because I just didn't know what my office hours were gonna look like at my job. But I'm here now. I'm here now. We have... What do we have? We have five streams in six days. So calm your... Calm your titties. There will be content. Alright. 
as with most of our new player tournaments, we have four Swiss rounds we got to get through. And then if anybody ties, we'll do some tiebreakers to determine a winner. We have some replays sent in. Let's get to it. Only 25 people showing up? Why? What happened? Why did we do bad? Okay. A lot of replays sent in already. That's intimidating. We'll start at the start. Love the look of the new room, by the way, you men. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, thanks. I'll cast your Spartan, don't worry, I was just figuring out where the start was. So with my new with my new and improved sweater over my hand, hopefully you guys won't hear as much click 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 click. For game one of the day we have Nerd on Bretonia. Versus Michael McCallum. Uh, yeah. On Norska. Bretonia is top of the meta. Very, very, very strong. Maybe not the best faction in the game, but one of them. So much so that we have placed several restrictions on them, and they are still getting played, and they still have above a 50% win rate, even with the restrictions. It just shows how strong this faction really is. Heading it off for Nerd is... Lewin with Sword of Crone and then his uh, Foe Seeker. Damsel of Life with Regrowth and Earthblood. Whole bunch of Knights of the Realm which are quite good against Norska. Norska traditionally has low armor, so that anti-large is all you really need. Hippogriff Knights for Terror and really good armor piercing. Some Archers, some Spearmen. That's it. For Norska, a middle faction. They're not bad. They're not bad. They're just not, like, amazing right now. We have some Rotter Horsemen throwing axes for armor piercing missiles. Some dogs, including the Beasts of Tash and our ROR dogs. Marauders and Marauder Champions, some Javelins, a Deathcaster with Fate of Good and Spirit Leech, a Skinwolf Werekin, which more people have been taking recently, and I like it. I think it is neato. And then some Skinwolves. Oh, and Wolfric is already in deep. Knights of the Realm fighting the Maws of Savagery. Even though these are armored Skinwolves, they still only have 70 armor, and the Knights of the Realm are more than up to the task, especially with Lewin helping them out. Sword of Corone lowering that armor down to... 40, and their melee defense down to 12. More dogs joined in the fight, but the Balls of Savagery are terror routing away. And King Lewin and the Knights are going to now take their fight to Wolfric. But one of the Knights is out of here. Another Knight of the Realm also taking significant damage. So this fight hasn't been all bad for Norska. Not in the least. It really depends on how Wolfric does versus Lewin. It looks like so far, not great. Marauder Champions are coming out to the fight, but already some Hipgriff Knights have gotten out of the back line. Elsewhere, we still have Skinwolves fighting Knights of the Realm. Why does Norska have a Silver Chevron Poison Hound? Yeah, they have a caster. They have a death caster. I don't know. They just wanted the extra stats, I guess. The dogs did okay. Both Knights of the Realm are gone. The Balls of Savagery and all the dogs are gone. So it really is just Wolfric and Lewin. But I did preface this by saying this fight will be determined by how well Wolfric does against Lewin. And that answer is very, very poorly. As Lewin beats his ass, pushes him off the map, maybe... Nah, it's just a terror out. He'll be back in a second. But then Lewin can free dive him again. So things are going bad for Norska on this, this flank overall. Central fight, a bit more mixed. Skinwolves doing pretty well against Knights of the Realm in a prolonged fight. Some Spearman support is trying to help out a little bit. The Skinwolf Werekin is surrounded by Spearman at arms and having a bad go of it. He tries to trudge away a little bit. And Norska's infantry were trying to get to the back line of these peasant archers, but it looks like most of them have gotten away free and clear. Lewin's still fighting with Wolfric. That slow healing of the King of Bretonia, his natural regen. Probably outlast Wolfric, especially if we get some Earth, Earth Blood support in here. Now, these are Marauder Champions that are founding Wolfric, so they should be able to beat up on everything that's here besides Lewin. But uh, really, the big fight that matters is Lewin killing poor, poor Wolfric. Wolfric traded admirably, but Lewin has a larger health pool, and Lewin has self healing, so it just didn't work out, unfortunately, for the dangerous Marauder. Without that, I really don't know what Norska can do here. The loss of their leadership is too much. You can see these Skinwolves are routing from a fight that they were previously winning. Skinwolf Werekin also starts routing all of a sudden. Things are looking a little bit doomed.
We did have 30 people sign up to play today, so I have a lot of replays coming in. I'll do what I usually do and try and make sure I cast everyone's games at least once so everybody has something on the stream. And then after that, I'll just cast whatever I find interesting. But I will try and get one of each. Alright, for nerd, his Knights of the Realm honestly underperformed a little bit from what I would have thought. Hippogriff Knights just ran some stuff off the map, but Lewin bodying Wolfric in 1v1 was kind of the tail of the tape. Nothing else really mattered too much on the battlefield. For Michael, Macallium. I don't know how to say that name. Anyways, Marauder Champions did pretty well supporting Wolfric in that fight. Wolfric honestly did okay for himself. Doug, Skin Wolves, mixed overall. And then throwing X didn't get to do very much. Peasant Mob with 38 kills. Yeah, that's, that's pretty chad. Alright, Chalk, Mr. Chalk, Chalk Crow. Versus Buttonized Mark. Beastmen and Lizardmen. Beastmen are quickly becoming one of my favorite factions. I'm enjoying them quite a bit recently. I don't think they're like one of the best factions. When I say favorite, I don't mean just strength. I mean like enjoyment. I'm really, really enjoying playing Beastmen. I think they're very fun. Okie dokie. I'm going to play this on slow motion while I cover the armies because we have a vanguard, so this is going to get kicked off pretty quick. For the beastmen, we have centigors, ungor spearmen herds, a bunch of ungor raiders, four of them in fact, four minotaurs as well, three of great weapons, one is the butcher scout guard, bright shaman of wild, which is traitorkin for that blob punishment, and that is it, a very straightforward beastman build. On the other side, for the lizardmen, we have four pterodon riders with fire leech bolas, croxigors and skinks for a front line, feral cold ones. Skink Skirmishers, Mazda Modi, Onslock with his heal and harmonic convergence plus his crowd clearing spells. And that is about it. Both sides going with pretty straightforward builds here. The Skink and Crocs Gord synergy is really, really good now since uh, the last update, where if a Crocs Gord is near a Skink, they get 10% more damage and Skinks get cause fear. Did Hubby clean his room? Uh, no. Actually, we're moving, so my room is dirtier than ever. But we are hoping you're enjo enjoying the new and improved audio quality. We work hard on it. Mazdamundi chucking out the first of his banishments, trying to get rid of this Ungor Spearman herd, so the Minotaurs of great weapons that are trying to surround him get uh, poked by spears in the butt. But his Skink Cohort's also taking a lot of damage, so it looks like both sides just going to rock from the central fight. And the Minotaur push on the front line is pushing the Skinks away rather quickly. Meanwhile, in the sides, Centigore's not having a great time fighting these Feral Cold Ones while getting bombed by Fire Leech Bullets. That is not their favorite thing. But Centigore's are already free and clear in the back line. They can do some good harassment over here. And where there are no Pterodons harassing them, you'd think they'd beat the Feral Cold Ones, but something seems to have gone wrong, so they're just trying to opt out of this fight since they're losing it. I guess they just want to leave. Archer's getting harassed by the Fire Leech Bolas, and Archer's shooting at Pterodons. If the Pterodons just sit still right in front of them, they'll do a lot of damage to those uh, bird things. But in general, they tend to just Shrek archers right now. It's kind of the state of flying skirmishers. You can see it with dwarf uh, dwarf gyrocopters are also very hard to punish in that way. Lord Mazdamundi having a terrible go of it, surrounded by these minos, beating the piss out of him. And while I would normally feel sad for his lock and Mazda, because I used to like them a lot, in the current state of the meta, the Lizardman being so strong and healing single entities being so strong, I must say it brings a little bit of joy to my heart to watch Minotaurs just kick this guy's ass. Mazda Mundi is about dead. Another Apotheosis tries to heal him up. All the Pterodons and Feral Cold Ones and Croxagors route off all the Archer support. A lot of the Ungors are also gone. But the Beastmen don't need them. The Beastmen just need some angry Moo Cows with giant axes beating up on dinosaurs. That is the game we are talking about here today, ladies and gentlemen. GG. Nice job, Mr. Chalk. Nice job. 
Good use of Minotaur Rush. Centaurs had a bit of trouble getting anything done, but it was fine. The Minos did more than their fair share. Archers were around. For Mark, his croc scores got rolled by the Minotaurs, so did Mazda. I like the Pterodons. I like the Feral Cold ones. Honestly, versus Beastmen, I wouldn't mind putting one or two Saurus Spears in, because then you have something for Mazda to pull back to against the Minotaurs. But overall, I don't think Mazda on Slack is that good versus Beastmen, because your main threat is going to be Minotaurs and Traderkin. So I tend to like going with just a regular Salon, make him cheaper, and don't put him on a giant dinosaur. And then get uh, some Saurus Spears, get some more Croc Scores to defend you against the Minotaurs. Because Minotaurs are really, really... Okay, they're a good unit overall. Right, there's... There's a reason you see them all the time, so I'm not going to shit-talk Minos. But one of their weaknesses can be taking a 1v1 fight with, like, Croxagors or something else with multiple models. But if they get to surround a single entity, they'll just dumpster it. And we saw it there, so... That was pretty good use of the Beastman from Chalk. Alrighty. More lizard men showing up. Alright, so we have Niklaus versus Zarkas. As I save some more replays. Okay, okay, okay. Tomb Kings versus Lizard. For the Tomb Kings, we have Tripalu Shopti Grapa, one of which is the Chosen of the Gods, Grand Hierophant Katep on his horse, trying to reset those cooldowns of Lizardmen. Ooh, and he brought the spell I really like. I have been taking Patra's Incantation of Righteous Fighting a lot recently. 40% more damage for your primary weapons teams is amazing, but it also is only 6 Winds of Magic. The physical resistance is fine for 6 Winds of Magic, but it's a little more expensive than in, like I feel like some players appreciate. And a lot of things in the game cause magic damage right now. Anyway, two Sparkle Stalkers, one just adds the desert. We have some two Guard with Halberds, a front line of Skeleton Spearmen, and more Tomb Guards with Halberds. So a very elite Tomb Kings build. No side four, the Lizardmen, Feral Cold Ones, Ripperdactyl Riders moving into flanking positions. Front line of Skinks backed up by Croc Scores, the tried and true combo here. Skink Cohorts of Javelin, Skink Skirmishers, a Rev Crystal, and a Life Salon for a ton of healing. But I must say, that ton of healing has to start now. They need to preemptively heal up these croc scores before they start losing models or anything. If you're taking this much healing, you have to really abuse it. And uh, they're a little slow on the draw. Here comes some of that healing that we need, but the croc scores are already routing. Ripperdactyls dive in. There's the incantation of protection, 40% physical resistance against these Ripperdactyl riders who do not have magic damage. But look at the damage still coming out from them, plus the skinks. That is a lot of of DPS onto the Zushapti without the Neuro's Incantation of Protection, they'd actually probably be dead already. Oh, we have Horned Ones! I didn't notice we had Horned Ones. I thought it was just Feral Cold Ones. The elite cavalry of the Lizardmen plowing into Sporkle Stalkers. Sporkle Stalkers are anti-large armor piercing, but they are a hybrid combatant. They do not stand a chance against the Horned Ones. One Ushapti Great Bow is dead, though it did cost almost the entire Ripper Dactyl Rider to do. And meanwhile, the Stildon Rev Crystal almost dead himself. Now he does have a backup Slon that can heal him. Rev Crystals cannot heal themselves, but the Slon can just throw a regrowth his way and make everything a little bit better. First regrowth is actually going under the Ripper Dactyls, though. Another good target. No complaints from me there. And the Horned Ones are actually getting massacred in this backfield. Something terrible is happening to them. Eyes of the Desert are shooting over at them, it looks like, while they still fight these other Sparkle Stalkers who are holding rather well. And the Rev Crystal's back here, but now he's surrounded by Halberds. Can Lizard Men really withstand this? We'll have to see. Tomb King's front line still holding, because there's a lot of Tomb Guard in there, but the center has broken, so these Croc Scores can get back here and help out. Looks like our Horned Ones are about to fade. And other Croc Scores... are stuck fighting random Spearmen. They really need to pile on to the weapons teams. Ripper Dactyls are back as well. Lizardmen, as much as I hate to say it, the effective thing to do would be to back off and cheese a little bit here. Back off your Rev Crystal and heal it up. Back off your Horned Ones and heal them up too. 
These Croxagores need to just focus the back line. They really need to abuse their healing. You need to get into a state where the late game is just a bunch of tube guard with halberds, and then you can kind of like cycle charge them to death. Skink Skirmish is running back here to cause a little bit of disruption, but this Rev Crystal is in too deep. He really has to back off. Something was getting cast, some healing somewhere, but there goes the Rev Crystal. If he dies, that's like half your healing that you brought knocked out. Horned One's diving back in again on the Swarm Stalkers. Get good damage on the charge. We're protected, still trying to fight the eyes of the desert, but having a tough go of it. And these Croc scores that have just been AFK on Halberds, unfortunately that is just a mistake. They're going to take a lot more damage than they should have and probably get routed off. Some people really like Horned Ones. I tend not to, and this is largely the experience I have. I mean, they got close to paying for themselves, but for some reason it just feels like they don't do as much damage as they should, even if you get them in winning situations. Sparkle Stalker is going to light up the Stellar Rev Crystal, taking out that free little source of healing. We still have Feral Cold Ones fighting the, their best, and a lot of Skinks are left. I'll give the Lizardmen that. They still have a lot of infantry support, but like I said, they just need to back off and play a little cagier with their healing. Like These Croc Scores need to just back off and wait for a regrowth on Earthblood or a Rev Crystal. Again, assuming the Rev Crystal isn't dead. But the, lizard, <laughs> the Lizards are playing a little too honestly. A little too chivalrous, uh, chivalrous re, chival, chivalry, chivalrous, that one, whatever. Just like actually fighting the tomb guards instead of largely ignoring them, is uh, proving problematic. Croc scores going to try and fight the chosen of the gods, but that extra forty percent physical resistance from Mirror's incantation of protection. Will not be enough. Another Croc score is pushed off. This Horned One is actually, this Horned One Sigular is fighting to the end, so kudos to him. But he's just about dead. And another Skull Storm from Kotsep goes through the Sneak Skirmishers. And I suppose that has been complicating things. I need to appreciate that. Kotsep's plus 15 cooldown is really, really annoying for Lizardmen. So even if they wanted to heal spam, they're probably just getting set on cooldown. That is looking like GG. Zarkus, you got a little overwhelmed? It happens, man. It happens. Nick Klaus, good build, played it well. Sporker Stalker's got a lot of value. Tomb Guard with Halberds held forever. That's GG. For Zarkus, I like the build. I think two Croc scores is sufficient. Uh, three might be a bit much, since you know the entire Tomb King's frontline is going to be spears of one form or another. Uh, horned Ones are Chad. Zarkus, I know he's in VOD, and I know like some other VOD members really like Horned Ones, but... Excuse me. I hate them. Um, Ripper Dances are fine. I think you had a lot of good engagements, but the Horned Ones let you down. You you played fine with them, but they just didn't perform for you. The Croc scores, I will admit, got into some bad situations and just fought Halberds. What multi-entity model unit do you think is most dangerous at one model? Ah, uh, Croc scores. The, the Sacred Croc score ROR, because it applies that Daze debuff if it hits you. So just keeping one model around, which its leadership is high enough to actually hang around to one model, it can just constantly apply days to your army, which is really annoying. How does one go about joining the new player tournament? Uh, I'll get to that in a second. We have Bahrain versus Corvus Glaive. Or is it Chaos? Beastman. Alrighty. If you want to join these new player tournaments, you can join my Discord. Go to give Rado your role. And you can ask for the Rattle Girl in here. People give that to you. Gives you access to our new player chat, our best of one practice pit, the list of coaches who will help you with any faction you need. And then you can also submit replays for coaches to give you advice on your play. But it also lets you sign up for tournaments I post every single week 
Um, new player tournaments every week, flipping between NA and EU friendly times week per week. So if one week it's in an NA time and you're asleep, next week it'll be in a time zone more friendly to you. That is how you get involved with these tournaments. Do one every week. Lampers Revenge probably has slightly more DPS, but I'd rather have the cohort. Sipe, you are on stream. Killing it, dude. Okie dokie. For the Warriors of Chaos, we have two Chaos Knights of Zinch, Archeon the Ever Chosen, a Mutal Vortex Beast, the Severed Claw, Aspiring Champions, ROR, and then some Chaos Warriors with Halberds mixed in with Marauders and two Chaos Warhounds. I wonder what Chaos God is currently doing well if we have four marked units of Zinch on this army. Strange. On the other side, for the Beastmen, we have Razor Gore Herds, Centicores, and Centicores with Throwing Axes on each flank. Some Minor Tars with Great Opens, a Razor Gore Chariot, which I am extremely suspect of, but sure. Then we have a Beast Lord with his melee buffs. But no caster. This happens a lot in new player tournaments. It happens all the time. But I will always say it because it is always true. You should bring a caster. There is no situation where you have the option to take a caster. And if you and not taking one is the correct decision. Playing without a caster is like playing without a queen in chess. It's just such a versatile unit that will always be worth it. All right, on the flank, Centaurs take fights with the Chaos Knights. Now, the Chaos Knights will demolish these fights with their heavy armor and high stats. They'll just massacre Centaurs. But we'll see what the Beastmen can get elsewhere. Through the front, front line, Arcan uses a Burning Head to try and get rid of some of the Ungor herds, but already Marauders are taking a lot of damage. And Ungor Raiders are starting to fall back as the Warriors of Chaos punch through the front line very quickly. Now, the Beastmen did not bring an elite front line of any kind. That's kind of their thing. But they also brought a small front line, so it's pretty easy for Chaos to find the holes in it. Minos are recharging some Marauders, but Chaos Warriors and Halberds are here to catch them. And uh, Razor War Chariot's unfortunately doing Razor War Chariot things. Just getting caught on heavy infantry and not doing a lot of damage. The Beast Lord is here, trying to fight against Archeon. Oh, Archeon's on foot and so is he. I love it. Foot Lord duel. Let's fucking go. But Archeon's, uh, kinda whooping his ass. As on, it, like, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. If Archeon Lord of the End Times had trouble with a random Beastman Lord, I think I'd be a little upset. Razor Gore Herd's still trying to find a fight, but the Razor Gore Chariots are getting clobbered. The Beast Lord is on the ground again. Mutal Vortex Beast hasn't even broken its shields. As it dives into more spears. Words of Chaos taking a pretty good command of this game, though the Beastmen are getting some archers back online. They have Minotaurs going to go charge these Marauders and give them a little bit more space to work. I don't know, man. We still have two healthy Chaos Knights in the distance. The Mutalith and Archeon are both chilling, and the Beastmen have taken severe attrition damage. I don't see how they can win it from this point. I know that feels early to call, but just like looking at the state of the battlefield, I don't know what they're going to do about the Mutalith. Beast Lord terror routes away from Archeon. Everybody's terror routing away from the central fight, leaving Chaos standing triumphant. Now, if these Dogs of Chaos can get back here onto the Archers, that would really seal the deal in this game. The Archers being allowed to free fire is mildly problematic. And here comes the last hope of the Beastmen. Minos with great weapons trying to surround the Mutal Vortex Beast, get buffs from their Beast Lord, and beat the shit out of it before the Chaos Knights arrive. And they are coming over to deal with the Archers at last. Maybe the Mutal Vortex Beast can get killed off before they even show up. Archeon and the Severed Claw are providing a constant backbone. They're killing off the Razor Gore Herds. Looks like the Minos will be the next target. These guys are slapping me to Vortex Beast, something fierce. Chaos Knights will not be stopped chasing Centigors around. And the dogs are here at last to really stop the archers from firing in. And the archers could have been shooting the Mutal Vortex Beast. I guess I, they should be doing that rather than shooting at the Severed Claw or whatever they were shooting at. I'm just killing Mutal. Minos doing their best against it, but... Now they do have these crazy halberds of Zinch chasing them down while the Mutalith also routes them off. That'll be army losses and a solid win for the Warriors of Chaos. Good win for Balrain. Mutalith and Archie doing fine. Chaos Knights did well. 
halberds, more mixed. One of them got roasted and toasted. For Corvus Glaive, his binos did all right. Razor Chariots are just unfortunately not a good unit. The Beast Lord really struggled to get anything done. Centaurs and Razor Corps struggled. Harpies struggled a bit. Archers were fine. GG, though. I'm saving more replays. TYTY. For anyone out there who's in the tournament, I'm going to stop replying TY and I'm just going to keep saving your replays. If you DM me your replays, I'm saving them. But replying TY is taking me too long. Because there's a million of you. Alright, nice. Saved a bunch! Perrier Post versus Samaric Pale Ale. Some more Tomb Kings, but now with a little bit of green skin flair. How's the bracket doing? Bracket is partially in round two, but mostly in round three out of four. This tournament is about half done time-wise. Not the stream. Stream will go on for a while, but tournament's about half done. Okie dokie. For Parry Repost and the first green skins of the day, we have the Eight Peak Loons in the woods. Both Skirmish Cab ROR's, because both are extremely good units. We have two Orc Borbo Biggins, one of which is Broken Tusk Mob ROR in the woods. And then Goblins, Orc Biggins, Orc ROR Boys, Azhag the Slaughter up on his mount with Spirit Leech and Fate of Buna, and two Stone Trolls. On the other side, four of the Tomb Kings and Samarek. Pale Ale, Cetra the Imperishable on his chariot with a whole lot of buffs and two spells. Eh, three spells. He's got to be about 3,000 gold with this setup. Not even joking. Two Shop to Great Bow regular, one who Shop to Great Bow, ROR, the Chosen Gods, two Tomb Guard with Halberds in the back, and then a front line of Skeleton Spearmen with two Melee who Shop to give him a bit of backbone. Chosen of the Gods, deleting an Orc Biggin. With their spread arrows, they are very, very good at hitting infantry and cavalry. Hi, KBH. Yes, it is an early tournament. All right, Cetra's trying to roll through some goblins, get good damage done, but in come the AP loons. Do they spin? Do you spin, you fucks? Nope. They ain't spinning. I'll keep my eyes on it because I like the spinning. Meanwhile, Orc Borbor Biggins getting to the back line. Usurian's Incantation. There's the spin. Does a little bit of damage. Usurian's Incantation of Vengeance can do some damage to them while Halberds try and intercept, but the Orc Borbor Biggins do get a good charge on the Chosen of the Gods to see how much damage they can do. But a Waz in and the Broken Tusk Mob is uncontested on the backfield. The Ushapti should be in a bit of trouble. Now with the Halberds, the Ushapti, and Satra, these Orc Corver Biggins are having a bit of a tough go. And they do get pushed off. Azhag is also landed in this backfield. And he has Azhag's Ard armor. I wonder if he's going to pop it soon. We'll see. Tomb Guard Halberds getting rolled by the Eight Peak Loons with a little bit of support fire from Orc Ard Boys and the Skirmish Cav. And the Wiggly Blades of Dejaf are in helping out a little bit. And the Orc Boar Boys are off. They don't want anything to do with this. Cetra on his chariot? Yeah, the problem is, is he's 3,000 gold. That's a quarter of your army, and Cetra's not worth a quarter of your army. Orc Borbiggins, uh, Orc Biggins, sorry, and Goblins have to peel these Skeleton Spearmen away from the Orc Arbor Boys so they can continue firing. Stone Trolls trying to hold the front line, but with their Goblins routed in this portion, they are alone versus some Spears. That will be pretty bad for them. Cetra's trying to duel with Azhag. Not doing the best at it. TBH. Kind of losing. And the Borber Biggins are back in. The second wall is out. New Shops are taking more damage. The Tomb Guard Halberds try and get over here and help out a little bit. Tomb King's front line is holding for now, though for now is a very key word in that uh, sentence. And one Orc Arboy is already pushed off as Skeleton Spearmen have routed them. 
Azhag sitting in Spears is still beating up Cetra. It looks like he's going to opt out now that his uh, Azhag's art armor has worn off. And the Borba Biggins retreat away from the Ushapti Great Bows and instead of rear charge some halberds to help out the AP Thulins a little bit. Just as the free Ushapti summon comes down from the Tomb Kings, Azhag did get back into the sky at half HP. Cetra has a little bit of healing from being a Tomb King and whatnot. But not significant amounts. Like, he's not going to get back to full HP or anything. So both these lords are pretty banged up from their time. Ushapti Great Bows trying to uh, stick together, strengthen numbers and whatnot as they fight against these Orc Borber Biggins. They will push those guys off, but at what cost is kind of an important question. Greenskins are starting to pull ahead on the balance of power as they're slowly working their way through the Tomb King's front line. This Ushapti summon is fake. It is a summon. It will fade away, so it's really not a consideration of ours as for the overall state of the battle. As Hag is diving on the Ushapti Great Bows, at some point blank shoot him in the face, and Cetra is trying to come over and charge him. Looks like he's going to ignore the Broken Tusk Bob and just go for As Hag. I think that is appropriate. The Lord Snipe is really your last hope of winning here is just to abuse the Greenskins' low leadership as you can see these Stone Trolls are about to break. And Cetra is getting in here. Azhag surrounded on all sides by Ushapti. He's trying to get away for now. He does lurch his way out of here. He did take some damage, though. That was overall a winning trade for Cetra. Meanwhile, the Broken Tusk Mob finishing off some of the Ushapti Great Bows. Spirit Leech taxing Cetra's health. And the Tomb Kings are just about out of people to rely on. They have a full health Tomb Guard Halberd. Everything else is so tattered beyond all repair that I really don't know what they're going to do. Cetra goes burr through some goblins briefly, and then he gets stuck a little bit. Starts to wander away as the Ushapti summon fades before our very eyes. Dooming the Tomb Kings just a little bit more. Skirmish Cav out of ammunition. Now just going to dive in onto the Ushapti Great Bows, trying to stop them from shooting at anything. And Cetra continues to get poked by Spirit Leeches and Orc Arboys until he will crumble himself to death. GG. Some fast and furious games today. None really dragging out into the distance. Orc Biggins, Orc Borba Biggins, Stone Trolls all did fine, AP Lunes did fine, and all the Archer Variants did pretty well. As I could tell, the Toner Value was nice. Someone dropped from the tournament, which fucks with the bracket a lot, so we'll just have to deal with it. We've had several people drop from the tournament after losing once, which is annoying. Since everybody's sending me stuff, it might have some repeats that I will obviously just uh, skip. So we saw Cetra failed. You have Boone Tax Evasion versus Hohenheim.
Okay, okay. More green skins. This time versus high elves. Our first high elves of the day? First high elves of the day. For the high elves, front line of spearmen, back line of silvering guard and archers, triple, quadruple war lines of grace, including their hoggers pride. Including their hoggers pride? No. Oh, okay. Especially versus greenskins, you probably want Rahagra's Pride. Their minus eight leadership aura is really nice. Then we have the Fireborn and Teclas. Teclas has his net, Flock of Doom, and Regrowth. On the other side, for the greenskins, a whole bunch of Skirmish Cav, including Goblin, Wolf Rider, Archers, Spider Riders, and then both of their ROR variants. We have two Black Orcs, a bunch of Goblins, Orc Boys, Stone Trolls, Grom the Paunch, an Orc Shaman with Foot of Gork and Brain Burster, and then Gobbos. Uh, my, my scree against Black Orcs continues. Don't take Black Orcs against High Elves. High Elves actually aren't that armored. Sorry, this is just an important thing, and I don't want to miss a lot of the battle while I rant about it. A common misconception about High Elves, because their front line is so tanky, is what the tankiness comes from. Their armor is dog shit. They only have 40 armor. That's not, it's not the problem. The problem is their 50 melee defense. Black Orcs are the exact wrong thing to take into them, in my opinion. Because you're paying extra for armor piercing, which you don't need, and your melee attack is still lower than their melee defense. So don't bother with black orcs. That's why I really like savage orcs into high elves, because savage orcs have high weapon strength and high melee attack, but they don't pay for armor piercing, which you don't need. Right. right. Just an FYI. Some people like black orcs. So that's definitely a human boy opinion, not a human boy fact. But some people do like black orcs. The Greenskins are mobbing the front lines. Now, the High Elves will hold, especially with their little Lion compatriots. It is what they do. The Grom is on the backfield here, rolling through some archers, trying to distract them. And an Orc Shaman is beating up on Teclas. Deciding to opt out for now, Teclas on his horse is not a good melee combatant, which is fine. I mean, he's a caster. That's okay. The Fireborn are stuck chasing four Skirmish Cav, and they're having a hard time catching these guys while they're also just getting shot in the face. So, Greenskin Skirmish Cav doing very, very well. And the first Wa is out. Frontline holding for now, as the Spearmen beat up on Goblins and Black Orcs alike. The Grom's rolling through some Archers. Not doing too much damage, but a lot of disruption. And the Silver and Guard do need to be pulled up to support the Frontline that is faltering. I think they're staying back here to protect the Archers from Skirmish Cav, but uh, that's not really achieving too much, and your Frontline's falling apart. The Fireborn stuck fighting all these uh, Skirmish Cav is also problematic. I wonder if the Fireborn should have been used to just, like, signal so charge the front line or fight Stone Trolls and whatnot. Because chasing the Skirmish Cab, they're getting nothing done. The Greenskins finally break through. They actually just start pushing past the High Elf Spearmen. They don't even finish killing them. They just walk over them to get to the back line. But here come the Silver and Guard. Nice. Nice. Good job pulling the Silver and Guard up just in the nick of time to intercept the Stone Trolls and to save the Archers. That is excellent. You'll love to see it. Good stuff here from the High Elves. The Greenskins overall are just slamming, though. Our front line is getting through. Teclas is struggling as Grom beats him up significantly, and the Fireborn in the distance have just achieved very, very little for their extreme price point. And they're distracting the Skirmish Cab, I guess, but... Yeah, it's gonna be tough. Regrowth for Teclas, trying to heal him back up, get him back in the fight as Orc Boys... Stone Trolls are routing, but Orc Boys to maybe get these archers soon. Silver and Guard still fighting. And the second Wa is out for the Greenskins. That is going to be the last Wa of the game, most likely. I ex I really, really rarely see games where Greenskins get three Wa's. In comes a Foot of Gork. Does good damage to Spearmen. A little bit of friendly fire on the Black Arcs, but overall more damage onto the Spearmen than themselves. Balance of Power is stabilized for the High Elves. It's not getting worse. It's just not really getting any better. This Tekla still runs around. War Lions and Silver and Guard trying to hold the fort. We still have a healthy Black Orc, and the bla that Black Orc will do well against Silver and Guard. Silver and Guard do have armor. The Black Orcs can actually chew through. There was a Flock of Doom, but what? It didn't hit that Black Orc? Really? Black Orc was definitely in it, but sure, whatever. Fireborn in the corner do need to come back while the Greenskin Skirmish Cavs still shoot at it. And the High Elves, secondary front line, the Silver and Guard are holding just indefinitely. They don't give a single shit about these Orcs, man. They'll fight forever. Grom is going for Teclas. Looks like Teclas is actually going to net Grom in place to get himself a little bit of distance. And Archers are trying to shoot at him a little bit. But here come the Skirmish Cab. They could rear charge the Archers just to stop him from shooting for a little bit. High Elves are rallying Warlines of Grace and such. And the Fireborn are trying to charge downhill. 
Black Orcs decide to just walk past the Silvering Guard and finally get onto the Archers. Another Flock of Doom is going to hit them all in the face. Fireborn are coming. What can they do? Can they get a regrowth? YouTube has you shadow banned. You never pop into my feed. I'm sorry, Looming. That feels cringe. But no, I'm right here. We ain't banned. Oh, what I wouldn't give for Hogra's pride right now. That minus eight leadership roar would be clutch. Clutch, huge. All the good words. Fireborn definitely need a regrowth soon. They're losing models now. They're just getting so low. They can't attrition through this. I know Teclas has used a lot of ones of magic on various things. So he probably doesn't have the bomb right now. There's another Flock of Doom and the Black Orcs. And Teclas actually does stop to take a fight with the Orc Shaman. He still has the Martial Prowess buff for High Elves. Portion of Kroy giving him some healing, giving him some ward save as he tries to beat up the Orc Shaman. But he's just not up to the task of combat. And those Fireborn are getting dangerously low. Silvering Guard still holding. We still have a full health Silvering Guard here walking around. And Archer's proving tenacious. Greenskins, health bars are getting a little bit low, which is always concerning for the Greenskins, because that's, you know, bad for your leadership. We do have a bit of a mass route coming in. Four Lions of Cray still charging into the Black Orcs. Om and on And the Fireborn, down to one-third models total. So their DPS is rather lower, but they did push off a lot of Skirmish Cav. Now the Skirmish Cav is out of ammunition. Grom is still taking fire from arrows occasionally. And he's taken a good bit of poke damage over the course of this game, so I wonder where his heal cap is. I wonder if he's been healing a lot and he's like actually close to his heal cap, or if it's not even close at all. Fireborn coming downhill. If Grom can get netted in front of them, that could be pretty good, because his lucky banner is about to wear off. So that could be huge. That or the Fireborn get a regrowth. Either or. Either are good we use the winds of magic. Or more flocks of dooms onto these black orcs. Really, any winds of magic are good winds of magic. Teclas does not want to stay in this fight with the black orcs all on his own. He needs to back off. Grom's still taking that constant poke, man. There's another flock of doom. Teclas staying a little too long, though. The black orcs are beating him up. He needs to leave. Uh oh. Elsewhere, the high ups are doing fine, though. They pushed off all the green skins. Fireborn charging Grom once again, but Grom sneaks away, just being a bit cagey. And Teclas, unfortunately, is far overstaying his welcome in these Black Orcs. And Grom's going to recharge him, probably to seal the game at this point. Bop. Two shots him into the dirt. Army losses. That was a good scrap. Good scrap. Got some people missing. Saving up some more replays. Nice job, Spartan. Nice job. Grom and the bl and the Orc Shaman did pretty darn well. Black Orcs, one of them got a lot of value. The other one struggled a little bit. Goblins did fine. Skirmish Cab did fine. You proud of me yet, human boy? I'm always proud of you. Tax evasion. Taxes are for nerds and responsible adults that care about society. 
Ooh, nice value on the archers. Nice job. More lions. I don't know. I've seen mixed results with them, but you definitely, if you're taking, if you're fighting the green skins, you need for Hogwarts Pride. The leadership roar is just too good. It's too good to pass up. Oh, why? Why did my camera turn off? Is it still off? No, it's back. What up, dude? I'm the High Elf. Hell yeah! Is your name a reference to Full Metal Alchemist? Hohenheim. Because I'm not actually super familiar with German stuff. Is that a fucking Blue Scribes? Anyway. I don't know if Hohenheim's like actually a normal name that people use, or... If it's just a Full Metal Alchemist thing. All right, we have Zero versus Aki Royochi. Zinch with the fucking blue scribes. Uh, against the Empire. This Empire build looks solid. The Zinch build shakes me to my very core. Why does he have the blue scribes? Lol guy, you're the Empire player on this one. Well, now I'm not going to cast it. I'm just going to cast it from the Zinch point of view. Okay, so for Zinch, we have the Screamers of Zinch, the Shrieking Sky Rays, the Changebringers, two Centigors of Zinch, a front line of all Zongors, a Chaos Lord of Zinch, and then the motherfucking Blue Scribes. And for the other army, no one cares. All right, for Zinch, the only faction that matters in this replay. No, I'll stop at the bit. I'll be serious. For the Empire with Boris Toddbringer, he's very good against demonic factions, but his self-healing, but also uh, his various debuffs to the leadership of his enemies can get them to demonic and civilian crumble faster. Empire Knights are good against Zinch usually, though with the advent of Centaurs of Zinch with their armor piercing, that actually is less true than it used to be. Hammer of the Witches is great, Netcaster is great, and the Frontline of Swordsman is fine. On the other side, we get to see those Centaurs doing exactly what I love out of them. They melt fools! They're so good, and I don't know why. Their stats don't look amazing, but they just are. They're just incredible combatants. And they're they're rolling Empire Knights. Now, it is a 1,050 gold unit, and then they're very squishy. So I, I actually don't think the Centaurs of Zinch are overpowered. I think they're just good, which is fine. Not everything has to be perfectly balanced. I think Centaurs of Zinch should be a, should be a valuable unit, like Skin Wolves. Blue Scribes chucking something out. It's a banishment from the blue scribes. That feels kind of fucked up that you have a light caster on the other side and you got a banishment. Anyway, Changebringers are trying to find something to shoot at. We do have some slightly AFK Empire Knights. They get moving just as the Changebringers fired at them. Take a bit of damage, but they will get away to safety. And the Handgunners are having a hard time really punishing these guys in the sky. It looks like they're shooting at the Chaos Lord of Zinch, which I must say I don't like, especially against things like the Changebringers. You really gotta snipe them out. They're super squishy, but like trying to kill this tanky Chaos Lord of Zinch is a bit of a bait, unless you fully kill him, right? But I don't think that's gonna be the case. Hammer of the Witches is trying to fire at the Screamers, all lined up. The Changebringers are shooting at Boris, but Boris is slightly protected by the Chaos Lord, so instead the Changebringers are gonna shoot at Handgunners. And the Centigors have made short work of those Empire Knights on the high ground, and now they're coming into the low ground to hit all this stuff. And Boris needs to probably dive onto them, just get their lower ship, uh, leadership nice and low. Centigors are still beastmen at the end of the day, and actually very prone to routing off, especially if Boris lands on them. Hammer the Witches is still trying to help out Boris by sniping that Chaos Lord of Zinch, but again, I think that the bait is real. I think he needs to focus on taking out the DPS of everything and ignoring the Chaos Lord of Zinch until the very end. Blue Scribes are doing something somewhere. I haven't noticed them too much besides that first banishment, but uh, yeah. The Empire Frontline is doing well against the Zongors. We have some Empire Knights up supporting the fight against the Zongors, which is okay. It's fine. It's not like an ob objective mistake, but I would rather the Empire Knights be like charging the stuff in the backfield. Because the Empire relies on its ranged units more than its melee units to win games, so you need to keep your ranged units alive. The Changebringers have taken a lot of damage. It looks like they dove into the Handgunners because they were taking too much damage in the, the range trade. So they instead opt into melee to try to stop those guys. But now the these guys get free. And they're shooting the Blue Scribes. No! Focus the Changebringers! No! Little bit of a whoopsie there. 
is again just dividing your fire too much trying to like kill the sorcerer of change but not actually finishing him off kind of poking at the blue scribes but not finishing off the change bringers like in general it's important but especially versus demonic factions you really need to like focus fire and like finish your food before you start on a different task Zongors are just starting to break through the front line a little bit in certain areas. The Empire is winning in other areas, but overall Zinch is very favored, especially on the back line. You can see they've won so much stuff. These Empire Knights probably have to dive in and support Boris versus these Screamers. Maybe with a rear charge from them, you can get these guys to Mnemonic and Stability Crumble with Boris's debuffs and all that stuff, but it doesn't look like it's going to happen. The Lord of Change definitely got some healing from somewhere. The Blue Scribes had some form of healing spell while I wasn't looking. I don't know if it was a full-on regrowth, but it might have been, like, Apotheosis or something. Changebringer's good volley onto Boris, knocks him out for good, and then Boris dies. Without him, the Empire is doomed. We even get an acquiescence onto these poor swordsmen. That should be GG. Pretty good play from the Empire overall. He had good micro. There are certain things where, like, I'm like, oh, this player had good decision-making, but his micro was just a bit slow. I think the Empire was the other way. I didn't notice a lot of micro mistakes. He was really, really good at clicking clicking on units and making them do things, right? Like, he never forgot his units. He did good stuff. So I like that. I think he needed to pick better engagements. So it's the opposite problem I normally see with new players. New players, it's very common where it's like, I mean, yeah, you have this, like, this handgunner rallied and just sat there facing the wrong direction because he didn't get orders for a long time. That wasn't a keys problem, right? He had his, his Empire Knights cycle charging pretty good. I just think they took the wrong engagements. So you could improve on that. But, like, pretty solid showing if what you're saying in chat is true. First time playing, you did one match for Warhammer 2. If that's true, if you're not lying to me, because the internet is a scary place full of liars. Then, yeah, it's a, it's a real good start. You just gotta change up some of your engagements. I think your build was solid. Your build was solid. Your micro's good. It's good shit. Zero? Not a lot of comments, honestly. I think the blue scribes are silly. That's really, really silly. Other than the blue scribes, I think his build was fine. And I think he played it really well. Blue scribes got a Tomb King spell. Those jerks. Blue Scribes, 400 value. Chaos Lord of Zinch, 2,100. Changebringers, only 1,200. Centaurs of Zinch, doing amazing. Screamers, doing very well as well. And Zongor is kind of getting trucked, but they hung around. Swordsman did okay. Hammer of the Witches did not do a lot, unfortunately. Artillery, in general, in Warhammer 3, is having a bad go of things. There are a couple artillery pieces that are having a good day, but most of them are struggling. The Hammer of the Witches is good overall, though, because, like, what about Soul Grinders? Hammer of the Witches is good at pressuring Soul Grinders. Because you can't just go medium range stuff or you can get kited. Like, if you just go Huntsman, you'll probably get kited by Zinch. It's a little bit of hindsight there. The Hammer of the Witches didn't have much to do in that matchup, but, like, that doesn't mean it's a terrible choice in this matchup in general. Alrighty. Where are we at for the tournament overall? Do I need to do admin stuff yet? Most people are in round four. We have one person left in round three. I'm going to start looking specifically for people I haven't cast at all today. Hey, Trogdorn Hellion. I haven't cast them yet. Rogue Consultant and Geraldo. I haven't cast them at all. Yashkov and Tamo. Incars and Michael. I don't think I've cast Incars today, but I have cast Michael. Okay. So we're getting to the end of... Everybody gets one. More High Elves, more Bretonia. Trogdor with the... Bold build versus Bretonia. We'll see how it goes. Hellion's got a strong build. While I personally don't like trebuchets, I know trebuchets are solid here. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna dock someone points on their build for personal preference. I tend to like 
separate those where I'm like, oh, this unit is objectively bad and you shouldn't take it. And I think this and this would improve your build. This other one is opinion. Some people like it, some people don't. So the Trebs are some people like it, some people don't. I think it's a good build. Bretonia is a very solid army here. For the High Elves, it's bold. I'm thinking about it. I'm still kind of processing what this is because it's so different than what I usually see that I don't have like off the cuff thoughts on it right now. We have the Fireborn, Phoenix Guard, Spearman, Silver and Guard, Rahagra's Pride, Teclas with a Net and Flock of Doom, a Noble for his anti-large arm piercing, and then a Frostheart Phoenix for their magic damage, but also um, their various debuff auras. In cards wants me to do one against Nerd. I'll try. Okay, sorry. Someone's messaging me something. Yashkov. I'll try to remember that, but this is a big tournament, so I might not remember the manual stuff. Okay. On the other side, for Bretonia, we have Alberic de Bordeaux, Royal Hippogriff Knights. Oh, there's one Illyrian Reaver in the distance, okay. Then some Knights of the Realm, Peasant Mobs, Spearmen at Arms, more Knights of the Realm, Double Trebs, Peasant Bowmen with Fire Arrows, and a Damsel of Life with Regrowth. The Trebs are to punish exactly this Phoenix Guard. There's a little bit of RNG because some games trebuchets decide not to hit anything ever, but if they decide to hit, they do a lot of damage. Especially since the, the Phoenix Guard are in more of a box formation than a true straight line. Like you can see, these guys are more in a straight line. The box formation does allow the trebs to hit more often, and when they do, they'll do more splash damage. Rahagra's Pride jumping on the front line. If they use their roar, they should like instantly break these peasants. On the charge, already down to 29 leadership. Alberic in the Hippogriff Knights trying to find a home. Alberic with his Trident of Manon is very good versus High Elves, but especially these clumped up formations of extremely elite spears, they can get a lot of value out pretty quickly. Laren Reaver is going to try and suicide dive for the Trebuchets. They are pursued by Knights of the Realm. These are not Kislevites. They don't have Byron Blood, Unbreakable Passive, or anything, so with the rear charge coming in, they might just route before getting the Trebs truly offline. The Hives are cleaving through the front line of Bretonia, getting onto the secondary formation. And the Hippogriff Knights and Alberic land onto the Frostheart Phoenix right in front of the Spearmen. Could be a little risky, but these are Bretonians we're talking about. Countercharge in from the Fireborn, and that is a net of Amatok on the Royal Hippogriff Knights. I really like this combo. This is lit. While I am suspect of the High Elf build and don't really know how I feel about it, their play so far has been pretty good. Nice net with the Fireborn. Though you are partially seeing why uh, Bretonia is ridiculous right now, is the Fireborn getting a free charge on a netted Royal Hippogriff Knight are losing badly. And a Regrowth Overcast is going to heal those guys right back up. They also have Strider, so I don't believe they're taking any p penalties from fighting in the forest. So the Tribes are still firing, the Archers are still firing, and now Rahagra's Pride taking a fight with the Knights of the Realm. Knights of the Realm should win that overall. Teclas tries to push through. The Fireborn got destroyed by the Royal Hippogriff Knights, even with all the buffs they gave themselves. They got massacred. Balance power is pretty heavily against the High Elves at this point, and I am in agreement. At this point, it is just looking over. I know it feels early to say that, but like the balance of power is correct. Things are looking doomed here for the High Elves. They just have some spears that are slowly getting boxed in and shot at, and Trebs are just lighting up these uh, Silver and Guard that are in this clump formation, so they are going to take a lot of damage. We have a Noble dueling with Alberic and the Frostark Phoenix as well, so like this could be maybe a rare win for the High Elves in this moment. But if Alberic gets his shit together and just walks out of here, he'll be fine. Bretonia has all the tools. Right, they have all the agency. They can back off, they can heal, they can take their engagements. They're overcommitting though. This Hippogriff Knight fighting right on top of the Phoenix Guard is not ideal. They managed to tear off the Phoenix Guard. I thought last patch gave a bunch of the units ITP. Did Phoenix Guard not get ITP? Did Black Guard of Nagron get ITP, but Phoenix Guard didn't? Because that would be the stupidest thing I've heard in a long time. But okay, so I guess Phoenix Guard can just tear it up. Fine, I guess. Whatever. Another overcast regrowth onto the Hippogriff Knights while Eric dives onto Teclas. The Trebuchets continue to punish these poor Silver and Guard, and the Fireborn are actually brought it off. Phoenix Guard win whatever fight they were in? No, they were just terror routing. 
So they're walking to shut down the Trebs now. We'll see if it even matters. Meanwhile, Knights of the Realm and Hippogriff Knights. Still trying to fight. These Hippogriff Knights got stuck on something a little weird lane, but now they're here. And as soon as I say that, they get netted. But is there any punishment? Is there any follow-up to the net? I guess these are Phoenix Guard they're sitting in. But if you click the Phoenix Guard, you can see none of their models are down here where the Hippogriffs are. So they're not able to actually punish right now. Bounce power is dangerously low for the High Elves, and I 150% agree with that assessment. Teclis is routing. Still have a full health Noble, still have a half health Frostheart Phoenix, some Phoenix Guard fighting up there. And the Damsel is getting killed by the Ragra's Pride right now. She needs to be a little more careful. Bretonia is getting a little reckless in this late game. Haven't seen an expert showcase of Bretonia in a while. The current meta for Bretonia doesn't take a lot of micro. It just doesn't. Heal spamming with a super powerful single entity lord and hippogriff knights does not take a lot of brain power. I'm not trying to be a shitter against Bretonia. I'm just saying, like, Bretonia used to be a high micro faction to play correctly, and now it's not. Like, I don't know. I play factions that aren't higher micro factions too, though. I'm not trying to be a shitter. There's just some factions that are harder to play than others. Skaven are honestly not a high micro faction. They're not. Oh, boy. Like, what else? What else are high micro? Beastmen are high micro. Sloan Ash is high micro and stuff, but... Bretonia can be. Depends on how you're playing. If you're dealing with, like, five to eight archers and a whole bunch of different knights going on and stuff like that, then yeah, you can make them a high micro faction, but Hippogriff Knights plus Super Powered Lord is not a high micro build. Well played by Hellion, though. No real complaints. He had a solid build. He played it well. His Treb's got a lot of value. Picks overall good engagements. The only complaints I had about how he was playing was in the late game, when he got a little sleepy. It felt like it was just like, oh, this game's about over, so I'll just end it. And he let his damsel almost get sniped. He let his Hippogriff Knights fight on a bad fight for too long. He let Alberic fight in a bad fight for too long. But I don't know. I get that. When you're far enough ahead at some points, you're just like, this is going to end, so I'll do whatever. He did darn do the good and. Rogue Consultant versus Poseidon. Gerardo versus Zero. Okay. Uh, what are we doing here? Some people have finished their fourth round, but not a lot of people have yet, so I'll hold on to that as we continue on. Okay, where are we? Rogue Consultant and Geraldo 7. And then Incars wanted his game cast versus Nerd. He said that was a good one. I'll try to remember that for Incars. All right, Rogue Consultant. And Geraldo. Seven. Our first Chaos Dwarves of the day. Versus more Greenskins. In fact, you described it as a bad fight. Yeah, I mean, having a low model count thing with high ward save and resists plus perfect vigor and... Uh, a shit ton of healing is not a good idea, which is generally why Bretonia has been Le Broca. Oh boy. What do we got? What's going on? What's happening? For the Greenskins, we have a Goblin Great Spider Shaman. Hello, friend. Vindictive Glare, Curse of the Bad Moon. And Sneaky Stabbin' with his Bound Don't Even Try It. We have two Nasty Skulkers, four Nasty Skulkers on the flanks. 
some Orc Boy Viggins, Night Goblin Squeak Hoppers, Orc Boys, and Savage Orc R Boys. This is a wild build. On the other side, for the Chaos Dwarves, we have a Demon's Tongue, Iron Demon, ROR, Astrodoth Iron Hand. Some Infernal Iron Sworn mixed in with Orc Laborers for our frontline Goblin Laborers as well, Hobgoblin Archers, and then Goblin Wolf Raiders with one Bull Centaur Renders with great weapons. Two pretty unique builds, as Orc Boys are going to get uh, destroyed by our Blasting Charge pals. You wish more stuff got to be as good as hippos? I wish way less things were as good as hippos. I generally don't prefer single units to be able to win entire matchups. That feels kind of fucked. Anyway, Chaos Dwarves off to a good start as they've already pushed through the Orc Boy front line with their grenades and now they're wa waltzing up to Savage Orc Rs. Orc Biggins fighting against Orc Laborers and they don't really seem to take any mercy on their enslaved kin. And where are those nasty skulkers? They're trying to get over here, but it's going to take them a long time to really execute that flank. So they're not in position right now. Meanwhile, Bull Centaur renders the great weapons, taking a fight against Morgan of Age of and the Broken Tusk Mob, and they are not winning it. They're having a terrible time. That is a good win for the Greenskins on the flank, taking out that very, very expensive piece. Curse of the Bad Moon going through. Applying the nasty curse to whatever it touches that's an enemy. And the spider, Great Shaman, doesn't seem to want to get involved in the fight just yet. We do have some Hobgoblin Wolf Raiders in the back just shooting at random squigs and stuff. And then comes the Demon's Tongue to try and route off some Orc Biggins of their own. Alright. Greenskin's doing well in the flanks, and the Nasty Skulkers haven't even joined the fight yet, so of course we can't count them just yet. But the center went to the Chaos Dwarves, and not even close. A lot of archers are already under duress or leaving. Most stuff is breaking, and the Chaos Dwarves are more than happy with how this went. Orc Biggins fighting some goblin laborers while getting shot at by the Demon's Tongue. And the skirmish begins. Can Nasty Skulkers pen in these guys? Not really. Not if they're paying attention. How Goblin Wolf Riders can just outrun them. Spider Shaman is going to fight at, uh, Astrogoth, but its bonus versus large is useless here. He is infantry size, so that is 20 bonus versus large going to waste as he starts to fight back against it. Some archers trying to help out Astrogoth in that fight. The Iron Demon is also shooting, and it probably needs to get committed to melee more. It is a chariot. Its range attack is fine, but it's more of an add-on than, like, actually the reason you take it. So it's going to want to get some charges off here. Broken Test Mob get a good charge in onto the Hobgoblin Wolf Raiders and Hobgoblin Archers, along with Squig Hoppas. Good stuff there. Balance power is about even. And Astrogoth gives himself a Cascading Fire Cloak. Should be much harder for the Goblin Great Shaman to hit him at this point. He has higher melee defense than it has melee attack, and it definitely hasn't been charging him. There goes the Iron Demon routing off some Orc Biggins. A lot of range units are routing. Where are those Infernal Iron Sworn? They're way off in nowhere, Nowheresville. They're starting to come back to the fight now, but that is a lot of the balance of power of the Chaos Dwarves off in the middle of nowhere. The Iron Demon is still trying to shoot at the Goblin Great Shaman, while Astrogoth still gets hit in the face. Don't even try it. Did some guaranteed damage onto him. This Iron Demon, stop using it as a cannon. Get into melee. Ogre Khan's Wolf Boys fighting with the Morgan's Winter Marauders. They will win that fight, but they will lose versus the Broken Tusk Mob and the Night Goblin Squeak Hoppers. Ashgoth still having a bad time against the Goblin Great Shaman overall, and a Cascading Fire Cloak is cast to try and keep him safe as the Infernal Iron Sworn come back to the fight. Orc Biggins will fight the Infernal Iron Sworn, but the Infernal Iron Sworn should be able to beat them up with relative ease. Orc Biggins aren't exactly the best units in the game. They're fine, but they don't have significant armor piercing to do with the Infernal Iron Sworn. Now the Iron Demon is in melee with the Goblin Great Shaman. Without support, he is just getting anti-large right in the face. He uses a flamethrower on its face, but doesn't do very much damage, unfortunately. And the Chaos Dwarves are falling further and further behind. Iron Demon does need to back out. Keep charging. Hobgoblin Wolf Raiders fighting against Night Goblin Squig Hoppers. I don't know who wins that, because Squig Hoppers 
do okay in melee with infantry, but they often disappoint me. Like, even versus other things. It's looking bad for the Chaos Dwarves overall. I will say that. We have some Infernal Iron Sworn still trying to get back to the fight. But when heavy infantry is your win condition, I do tend to get quite scared. Demon's Tongue still having a rough go of it against this spider. Ah, uh, he's doing the Demon's Tongue thing, where he just ends up with his back to it and sits around doing nothing. Now he's starting to get away. If he charges these Broken Tusk mobs, he should be able to free up Astrogoth. Yeah, nice shot. No, you gotta complete it. You gotta go. You gotta jump all the way in. Uh, he's not gonna do it. Good surround onto the Goblin Great Shaman. Fire in the back might get him to rout soon. But Ashgoth also ain't looking too hot. Two leadership left on him. Cascading Fire Cloak to give him more melee defense as he fights back. But this uh, this this uh, this demon's tongue has just been following the spider and shooting at it. Frontal Iron Sworn still trying to kill off the last of the Orc boys. Demon's tongue is still harassing the Goblin Great Shaman as he starts to rout finally. There's not a lot left for the Chaos Dwarves except for these Infernal Iron Sworn, but to be fair, the Greenskins are running out of stuff that can kill the Infernal Iron Sworn. Maybe Nasty Skulkers will do something for once in their entire lives and uh, kill heavily armored infantry, but I doubt it. The Greenskins leadership is betraying them. Broke Test Mob are out. Orc Boys, Orc Biggins get roasted and terrorized by the Demon's Tongue, but eh, the Goblin Great Shape is going to be allowed to come back. Demon's Tongue probably has to spend some time chasing him down. Or Astrogoth. Someone has to chase him down. Doesn't look like they do, so he'll be able to come back, turn around, use a Vindictive Glare or two, maybe to kill Astrogoth, maybe to kill the Demon's Tongue. That could be the game-winning play here for the Greenskins. Nice tear out onto the Death Creepers, but there is the Goblin Great Shaman. Zero, first time playing online, had a lot of fun. Good. Good! We host one of these every week, differing time zones each time, though. Uh, bah, bah, bah. Goblin Great Shaman's trying to rally over here. Still have two healthy Infernal Irons for him. Could be a problem. <laughs> and the fucking Demon's Tongue is just back to shooting at people. I love it. Sorry, somebody's messaging me on the other side is why you lost audio. There's a Vindictive Glare, a little bit of damage. On to ye old Demon's Tongue. Astrogoth is barely clinging to life. Same can be said of the uh, Demon's Tongue. And Ogokan's Wolf Boys charge into the Savage Orc Armor Boys, trying to take them out once and for all, but it's getting a little hairy. And that is a Dynasty Curse going through these guys. Doing some damage. It's doing okay. Not amazing, but okay. The final blah is out for the Greenskins. The Demon's Tongue barely clings to life, and it does cause terror, so as long as it can be around, it can help out. It aims its flame cannon at the Goblin Great Shaman, never giving up in his immortal task of harassing that guy to death. Astrogoth is getting chased off, however. The Goblin Great Shaman just lines up a Vindictive Glare. I think he's probably just going to kill him. Oh no, kill him on the charge. He does it like a man. There you go. No more Demon's Tongue. Bounce Power is turning against their Infernal Iron Sworn, though this could be their moment to shine. If they just clobber these fools, they could cause a mass Greenskins route that would carry them into the late game. Astrogoth is allowed to rally because the Nasty Tulkers went stalking. But that shatters him. Then a uh, Terror Route takes one of the Infernal Iron Sworn. And that should be GG. Oh! Goblin Great Shaman routes for no reason! Does he take everybody with him? Ah, there's army losses. That's fair. I don't think that was an inappropriate army losses, it just looked funny. Okay, Rogue Consultant, good W, good W. Oh, look at that. 2,400 value on uh, the Orc Board with Biggin RMR. Night Goblin Squeak Hoppers, 1,600 on one, 180 on the other. That is a that is a spread. Nasty Skulkers didn't do too much, but whatever. For Geraldo, Wolf Riders did pretty well. 
Iron Demon did pretty well. Astrogoth struggled. I have not seen Astrogoth do well in a long time. Infernal Iron Sworn did okay. Both Centaur Renders getting massacred was a problem. Alrighty, let's check in on things, my friends. Scott? Hey, thanks, man. Thank you, thank you. I gotta do some tournament stuff, everybody. What happened to the bull renders? At the very start of the fight, they on the right-hand flank, they got rolled. Okay. Where are we at? Bump, bump, bump. So Rogue Consultant and Akir are still fighting, and then Poseidon and Zarkis are still fighting. Okay, so Niklaus and Tomo have four O's. And then we have a bunch of threes. Chalk, Warson, Incars, and Rogue Consultant. Do any of them have buys? Incars had a buy. Nerd had a buy. So Nerd only had two points. Did he have two buys? Or is he out? Okay, he lost in cars at one point. So in cars had a buy. Some of these got grayed out because certain people left the tournament, right? Alright, so Niklaus, Tamo, in cars. Warson and Chakro. I think they had natural losses somewhere. Warson, Warson. Ah, he lost to Michael in the final game. Damn, that stopped his 4-0. Michael with the clutch. And then Rogue. I just, I'm just i just making sure I find their loss, if they did have a loss. Oh, Rogue Consultant's still fighting. Yeah, he's not done. He's not done. Akir could still stop him from getting the 4. The 4-0. Alrighty, so we know, we know, Nick, Tommel, and Incar have 4-0. Rogue still could. He's fighting right now. Cool, cool. I think that's it for four O's. Zarkis, Poseidon, Akir, and Rogue. Everyone else has fought. And with the buy rounds, I don't know, Trogdar? He lost against Warson, yeah. So that's it. Okay, so. Has Tamo fought any of these two recently? No, he wouldn't, because they have four O's. Duh. Duh. I'm stupid. You can't have a four O and fought somebody who had also had a four O. One of you would have lost. Don't be dumb. Let's have Niklaus fight in cars right now. And Tamo fight Rogue if he wins his last game if he does not you are in finals yeah because someone someone gets a buy round if there's only three so I don't fucking know
Okay, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Sorry for that distraction, everybody. Comes with the territory of uh, doing some new player shenanigans. Let's get back to replays of people. We still haven't even, like, listen, this is how many people signed up today, which I love it. It's super stressful. It's super stressful for me, but I do love having this many new players around. We love you guys. We appreciate you. But I haven't even cast one of everybody's game, and the Swiss part of the tournament, which is most of the tournament, is over. <laughs> that's, that's how many fucking people we're playing today. Which is fine. We take that. So we have Tomo and Yashkov. First Grand Cathay of the day versus some green skins. Rogue Consultant sent me some shit. No way! No way, dude! So, Michael comes in clutch to knock Warson out of the 4-0 in, in the last round. He was 3-0. He fought Michael and lost. And then Akir comes in to knock Rogue Consultant down. Making him 3 1. That's insane. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. So, Tomo is in finals, just by nature of someone had to get a buy round. So, the, your, your perfect 4-0 candidates for today, just to shout them out, uh, is Incars, Tomo, and Niklaus. Those three will be doing battle in the, uh, the finals here to see who is the bone ripper of the day. But congrats, congrats to all of them, man. 4-0 is a strong performance, even if you don't end up winning the whole thing. Also, three ones are... Pretty nice. At this point, maybe you should bring in another caster. What, like... Turin? That piece of garbage? That disgusting human being? Turin? No. No, I can't. I can't, dude. Turn as cooties. I can't hang with a guy who has cooties. Turn once insulted my mother. Rumor has it he hasn't paid his taxes either, so. Yeah, no. No, I don't like him. He's a jerk. Okay, we need to actually cast this game instead of memeing about Turin. And for anybody who didn't know, that's a joke. Don't go posting on Turin's Discord. You're my boy! Said some mean things about you. I I was joking. It was a joke. All right, all right. Cathay versus Greenskins. Let's focus up. For Yashkov and the Greenskins, we have Wurzag. The boy in blue. Gave some Morgan Brain Burster. Plus, I think that's his Boneless Staff. Yeah. His Boneless Staff is no longer global, but it does, you know, still have a little a AoE effect. So any Greenskins near him will get those nice juicy bobs. We have some Stone Trolls, some Orc Boys, Orc Biggins, Orc Arbor Boys, Savage Orc Biggins. River Trolls and Stone Trolls, and then Squig Herds for that anti-infantry armor piercing. Some Goblin Wolf Raiders chase stuff out too. For Cathay, it is a Cathay box. It is a well-constructed box. Jade Warriors and Peasant Long Spears all around. Some Jade Lancers and Peasant, uh, yeah, Peasant Horsemen. Do we have the Righteous Lance of Weijin? Zhao Ming with Final Transmutation that should be cast in Warzag on cooldown. Two Iron Hail Gunners, three Jade Warrior Crossbows with Shields. I heard turn is wanted by Interpol. See, this guy gets it. Ooh, I like this. Stone Trolls just pass straight through the Jade Warriors. Don't even bother fighting them and just get onto the crossbows and stop them for a little bit. They've taken so much damage on the way in that those Stone Trolls are going to rout, but that doesn't mean it's a 
it's not a good play. It is a good play. That's what you should do. It just happens that they took so much damage, it didn't matter. What an MTK turret ever do to you? Hell yeah, this guy gets it. I love MTK turret. <laughs> I have a funny story about MTK turret, but this is not the tournament to talk about it because it's so busy. Anyway, the Savage Orc Biggins and Orcs are on the front line. Orzek's trying to help them out every little bit as he keeps casting spells, and they are into the cookie jar just a little bit. Here comes Final Transmutation. Is it overcast? Nope, regular cast. Still do some good damage to Wurzag, but he's just starting to tax that HP a little bit. Jade Lancers are chasing off anybody that routes, plus going to harass the Orc Arboys a little bit. We do have the Righteous Lancers away, Jin. They need new orders. They need to come back to the fight. So that is a bit of a whoopsie here. And the Greenskins have really broken up this box. A lot of the ranged units of Grand Cathay are routing, though. Wurzag's down to half HP. And that is going to be a problem as Xiao Ming dives onto him, gets a good attack off already, too. And Goblin Wolf Raider is also diving into the back line to continue routing stuff off. So the Orcs are pushing through the front line. Jade Warriors are almost... Well, I guess half of them are gone. The other half are doing fine. Ah, but the Wurzag tear out is going to be brutal. Can Zhao Ming just pursue him? Yeah, he's faster. So Zhao Ming can take Wurzag off the battlefield here. As long as he hits this charge attack and actually routes him for real this time. There we go. But Cathay is in dire straits. Is the Lord Snipe onto Wurzag enough? So we're getting down to just peasants. Peasant long spears should run train over uh, these poor river trolls and stone trolls. It was Savage Orc Biggins helping out. Never mind. Savage Orc Biggins will do really, really well versus peasant long spears. He'll do fine. I just worry about the Greenskins' leadership with Warzag going off the battlefield. You didn't do the funny voice, so how are we supposed to know you're joking? Think about your audience next time. <laughs> Zero, I saw you liked your blue scribes. That was insane. <laughs> Why are you taking the blue scribes? <laughs> I mean, you won. You won, so in the end it works out. Ooh, no! Why was Wurzag allowed to come back? No, 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 no. That's not real. You can't let that happen. A little effigy to get to net jumping in place, get a little bit of damage, a brain burster out. But unfortunately, Wurzag is not next to his units, so they aren't getting any of the Bonewood staff effects. Elsewhere, the Greenskin infantry are still pretty healthy and doing okay, but their trolls are overall too damaged and routing. Their archers are gone. Wurzag's pretty much gone. So, the Greenskin infantry being the last thing left doesn't usually lead to success as the second and final wall comes out. Still killing off some Jade Warriors, still killing off some Peasant Long Spears. That's going okay, but too much... Too much else has gone wrong. Yeah. All right. Has the green skin slowly wind down to death? How has the audio been? Have you been able to hear me clicking at all? Because that was always annoying me when I did, like, reviews of my streams or something to check on things, and I could hear myself clicking. That just pissed me off. Having a sweater on my hand is very annoying, but if it actually stops the clicking sound, that might just be what we do. At this point, I just don't see how the Greenskins are going to win. I'm going to fast forward just because we have a lot of replays to get through, and I really don't want to just watch Greenskins slowly die. No clicking? Yeah. Having a giant sweater on my hand is worth it. Alright, trolls didn't get a lot of value. Savage Orc Biggins got a lot of kills. 101 and 150 kills on Cathay is nothing to sneeze at. Orc Boys did okay. Squigs did alright. For Heim... Heimdaller. Heimdaller. Jade Warrior Crossbows did pretty well. Just a round paying for themselves. Xiao Ming did great. Righteous Lance Evasion did fine. Jade Lancers did okay. Iron Hill Gunners did fine. Jade Warriors did fine. Peasant Long Spears all did pretty well. What did the Greenskin players mess, mess up? I really struggle to make Warzag worth it. Uh, his Bonewood Staff applying to only stuff directly around him is really tough because he is not tanky. That's the problem with Warzag. Is he kind of has the Kalita problem. And when you when you hear that, you're going to get mad at me. Because you're going to be like, Warzag is way better than Kalita. He is. He is. But the Kalita problem is thematic, right? Like, 
Kalita has other issues. But the Kalita problem is she has an AoE buff to ranged attacks when she is a melee duelist lord. And that's that's some asynchrony in her kit that doesn't work, right? Because, like, what do you do? Do you leave her back next to the Bone Giants and Ushaptis for, like, a 15% bonus to damage? But you have a 1,500 gold lord sitting around doing nothing to help out 15% more damage. Or do you throw her into your front line and, like, use her as this duelist? Well, that's great, but now what's the point of that 15% damage boost? So there's a mismatch there. And Wurzag, with the new way his bone and staff works, in my opinion, has that same mismatch. There's two or three matchups where I still take Wurzag, so he's not a dog shit lord, but he does have some bad synchrony, and that that's, like... Because you want him to be in the frontline fight, so when he casts spells, the Bonewood Staff buffs up your, your melee units. That's great, but he's a super squishy caster lord that's supposed to be cheeky. He's supposed to be in the backline running around, like your backline, running around and dodging damage while casting spells. So he's not supposed to be near the frontline, because if he's near the frontline, he gets completely fucked up. Archers mess with, him, mess with him, artillery messes with him, spears mess with him, monsters mess with him, like... He's not really supposed to fight anything. Most of his kit helps him get away. He has a net that makes him really good at getting away. He's on his boar, which is pretty fast, good at getting away. So that's that's the trouble with New Wars Egg. It's like... It's really hard to use his Bonewood Staff. When I do bring him, I don't even bring his Bonewood Staff. I just bring him as a cheap... Uh, big Wah caster with a net. So... Unfortunately, I think that. I think Yashkov played really well. I think his build just didn't have the teeth to kill the Cafe build. He just got outstatted. Okay, are we finally done with all of the round one games? So that I can cast whatever I feel like. I'm just looking for people I haven't cast yet. I haven't cast in cars, but I know he gave me a specific game he wanted me to cast. That one. We still in round one? We would have been in round one if I didn't skip to this replay that Incar specifically requested. But I think I have cast everyone's games at least once now. I know, actually, fuck. Poseidon sent me, he didn't play in round one, but he did send me a replay I'll have to get to. Slow motion while I do the builds here. We have the Heralds of the Wind and other earlier and Reaver Archers, Dragon Princes, and the Fireborn for the High Elves of Nerd. I believe this is Nerd. No, Incar's is the High Elves. Nerd is the Dark Elves. Got it, got it. So for in cars, silver helms, silver helms, Lothern Sea Guard in the back line, spearmen on the front, and then we do have an Archmage of Metal with Plague of Rust and Searing Doom. On the side of Nerd, we have two Cold One Knights, two more on the far side, a front line of all Witch Elves, and then Dread Spears, and then Dark Shards with a Dark Caster on her dragon up above. Cool, cool, cool. Hi, Yashkaf. I got it. No, I think you, like, I don't want to be a dick, right? So I don't... It feels bad to say this, so I'll preface it that... I think it was, it was Strat Game who said it, right? But, like, multiplayer has three phases. Matchup, builds, and then micro. Getting in a bad matchup, depending on what it is, like Dwarves versus Skaven, you can just lose the game on that. Um, having a bad build can lose you the game. Or playing bad can lose you the game. So it feels bad to say in-game Yashkov played better, but his opponent won. But that is actually how I feel. But I feel like his opponent just had a more cohesive and better build, and Yashkov's build had some issues, like Orc Boys didn't really do too much damage, and Warzag wasn't the right lord choice there. So, like, in-game, I felt like Yashkov played better. And that feels horrible to say, but it's like... You know, I'm not trying to be a dick about it, it's just like... I mean, his opponent didn't play bad, he played fine, while Yashkov played pretty darn good. But his build was just much more cohesive and much better. And it's Cathay, which is a tough faction to beat. So I think he I think he just had a better build. So it's like, you could take that as a compliment in that way and just be like, yeah, I think his opponent had a really good build and he didn't fuck it up. Okay. So for this game that's actually in front of us, we have Cold One Knights getting overcast the Plague of Rusted while Fireborn tear them to pieces. Oh, 
That is a big pick for the High Elves to start off, but their Archmage of Metal with no healing on the roster here. They didn't bring a Life Caster. Archmage of Metal is already down to about half HP, so that Dark Caster could cast Soul Stealers on her every so often and just keep poking her down. But the Fireborn and other Dragon Princes, really, really good start to this game. Also, the Illyrian Reaver flank is going to shut down the Dark Shards post-haste. High Elves off to a good start. Witch Elves on the front line, however, not to be outdone. Ever since their rework, they lost their Rampage, but they did get some other buffs, and they are massacring themselves, some Spearmen. With super high melee attack plus bonus versus infantry, they are getting through those stats without any problem whatsoever. And here come the Cold One Knights on the far side. Now, these are not Dragon Princes, they're Silver Helms, and there's no Plague of Rust support this time, so the Cold Knights will perform quite a bit better on this left flank than they did on the right. Soul Stealer is down in the middle to hurt the Fireborn a little bit. That could be a nasty Searing Doom on that little clump of Dark Elves. Gooey owie, big damage for such a cheap little spell. And overall, both sides trading. Both sides have had really good engagements. Like, the Dark Elves slamming through the front line is huge, but also the High Elves have been playing amazing on the flanks. The High Elf player is playing really, really well on the flanks. Dark Elves continue to roll through the front line, however, and they're harassing the Lothian Sea Guard. They did lose all of their Dark Shards, which is a big loss, and now the Alien Reavers are even rear-charging Witch Elves, which low armor getting rear-charged by Light Cavalry will do a lot of damage. The Dark Elves still have plenty of infantry to fall back on. They have a very healthy Dragon Lord with the best breath attack I have ever seen. That did so much damage. I know breath attacks always do a lot of damage, but... That was a lot! That was a lot of damage! Okay, well that Spearman's just fucking dead. Okay. Not sure I outplayed Tomo. Eh, I still think he played pretty darn well. You busted the box really good. Yeah, I I liked when you snuck the squigs through the front line. That was... That was good. Witch Elves charging in the Lawland Sea Guard. Do they still even have their Witch Brew, or did they all pop it on the charge? They popped it on the charge, which is correct. Should have done that. That's how that spear died in cars. Yeah, that was... That was a full spear death. Alrighty. For the Dark Elves, we still have a full health Cold Knight out here. We still have the Hellebroni, and then a full health Dragon Caster, but that's about it. Otherwise, the Dark Elves are about tapped out. For the High Elves, we still have some Silver Helms, some Dragon Princes, some Love and Seaguard. They're a little more spread out in their damage. And their Lord is, eh, one-third HP. There's a Breath Attack down the side of Love and Seaguard. They try and dodge it, but still a good amount of damage is done. Plague of Rust onto the Dragon, just to make her a little more vulnerable to Love and Seaguard shooting at her as she flies straight at them. She'll take a bit of damage. Nice Soul Stealer onto the Silver Helms, Fireborn, and uh, Lava and Seaguard. That's going to be solid. Good damage there. And I really don't know who's going to win at this point. Because the High Elves have a bunch of wounded units, but I mean, a couple solid units in the late game can really do wonders for you. Hellebron, I still half HP, and this Cold Knight at full HP is going to be a problem. Plague of Rust, 10 more seconds left on it. Supreme, Supreme Sorcerer's Dark goes for the Lord Snipe on the Archmage of Metal. Gets a good hit, but is getting poked by an awful lot of arrows for her effort. The Fireborn look like they're about to die from a Cold Knight charge, though. Wow, they did good damage back. That was a full health Cold Knight. And the Nasty Searing Doom also hits them. And that full health Cold Knight went down to a quarter HP at the blink of an eye. But up, 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 not loving it. Elsewhere, High Elves are just cleaning up Dark Elf Stragglers. It's all fine. Lothar and Seaguard poking away at the Supreme Sorceress of Dark. I am so scared for the Dark Elves now. I don't know what they do. Another Plague of Rust as the Dragon Prince is charging into the Cold One Knights. 60 armor on them. Dragon Princes should do fine just with their crazy high stats. The Dragon Lord's trying to come over and help, but it is too late. It looks like her Cold One Knights are going to rout any second now. Another Breath Attack is down on the Love and Sea Guard. Pretty good damage. All three of the Breath Attacks have been quite good from the Dark Elf player. Bounce Power is still dead even this late into the game. But, uh... 
I don't know, man. I don't know if this Dragon Lord can carry this situation. It depends on how many soul stealers are left, obviously. If she still has, like, three left and she can heal up to full, then she'll be fine. If she only has one left, then she's probably doomed. And that's largely what this game's going to come down to. Terror Out is out for the Silver Helms when they naturally route. Looks like Terror Out should come in for the Lawton Sea Guard soon. Only 2,600 HP left. And these are... Oh, I guess that's an archer. Oh, okay. I thought all of these were Lawthorn Seaguard. This is a little more doable. This is a little more doable. Now, that's just a basic archer and not also a spear unit. Overcasted Plague of Rust. Oh, no! Overcasted Plague of Rust takes out the Archmage of Metal. Walla Soul Stealer is healing up this uh, Dark Elf Sorceress who used it on the infantry, which is correct. I mean, like, there were two infantry next to each other at this late point in the game. You definitely want to do that. But the Overcast... Just deleting the Archmage of Metal. Balance Power is still about dead even, but these archers are still, you know, doing really good damage to Supreme Sorceress of Dark. She terror routes away the archers again. Lob and Seaguard are going to shoot her in the back. She's getting so low, but the Hellebroni are here. Can you see the message, please? Yes. Sorry. One second, one second, sorry. The finalists had a question for me. I know it's a bad time, but they just popped up in chat and had questions. All right, big damage. Archers are routing. The Archmage of Metal still negative two leadership. And if she goes, if she gets all the way off the battlefield, maybe the leadership spikes down enough that the Supreme Sorcerer Dark can win it. The Hellebroni trying to brace in the face of the Fireborn, and they just rout anyway as she lands onto Lava and Seaguard. One more Soul Stealer, and this game is over. No more Soul Stealers, and this game is over, but in the completely other direction. Two leadership left on the Supreme Sorcerer's Dark. She's about to get charged by the Fireborn. Routes away the Lava and Seaguard. Can the Fireborn really brace up for the charge? Five leadership on her, and she turns towards them. Can she get the charging leadership deep buff she really needs? She goes in, gets the leadership she needs, but takes a lot of damage on the charge, and a Plague of Rust is back as that bitch didn't go off the map. It's GG! Oh, uh, high off leadership. I'm so jealous. I'm so jealous. It's fine. It's fine that their leadership is high. I'm still jealous as a dirty Skaven Greenskins Beastman made. That was good. That was a good game. Well played by both players. 2,800 for the caster. Everything else, I kind of scrolled through it, but we're not going to delay too long on anything. Okay, I got to look for a Poseidon game. There it is. Because Poseidon's another player I know I haven't gotten to watch just yet. And then what time is it? Okay, I still have time. I'll scroll through and then I'll just cast interesting ones, but we will get Poseidon. And then I have a semi-final and hopefully a final to cast. Rogue Consultant, yet again, on his Goblin Great Shaman versus Poseidon. higher leadership the higher the casualties dude i wish my casters would come back at 200 hp and save me in the late game skaven casters never fucking come back and that's fine i'm not saying it's an issue i was just saying i'd rather have high leadership than low leadership i want i want my casters to come back and save me all right for the green skins here of rogue consultant we have nasty skulkers mixed in with orc boys and orc biggins some Savage Orc Aura Boys, the Warlord's Boys, the Armor Sundering Night Goblins, Death Creepers, Goblin Great Shaman up on his Spider, Orc Borber Biggins, and then some Skirmish Cab, and some Sneaky Night Goblin Squeak Hoppers in the Vanguard. For Poseidon, Empire Knights, Spearmen, Swordsmen, Huntsmen, standard state troop build so far. Do have a net caster, Marcus Wolfhart with another net. That is, like, FYI, if you're watching and you know all the rules perfectly, double net 
targetable like that is illegal, but it's a new player tournament. We tend to be a little more chill with the rules because people are learning. But just if you're if you're out there, yeah, you can't take double targetable net. But shit happens, right? So Caster brought a net. Marcus brought his net and both of his abilities. Hammer the Witches and then some Empire Knights and the Tattered Souls Flagellants ROR. Empire Knights checking for some stocked units, but they might not like what they find as they're going to run into Night Goblins and Squig Hoppers in the woods and they'll get surrounded by these uh, boar boys, but doesn't look like the Night Goblins pull the trigger fast enough. And they, the Empire Knights do avoid their almost disaster they ran into. These Empire Knights get a downhill charge in the Orc Borber Biggins, but they're just so outclassed in stats and armor piercing that they're going to lose it anyway. Which is fine. You don't really want Empire Knights beating the Arwar Orc Borber Biggins. That would be a problem. Huntsman trying to fight. Death Creep is moving in for a bit of a flank here to stop some Huntsmen. And in comes a net of Anatok onto the Goblin Great Shaman. Marcus might pull his abilities too and just really try and burst out this Goblin Great Shaman. But the Greenskin front line is here. So the Empire's time might be limited. Empire Knights will get a rear charge on these Death Creepas with more Orc Biggins coming up behind him. Some of the Orcs are a little slow on the start. And the Goblin Great Shaman is taking a lot of damage. So the gun line of Poseidon's doing just fine. And this forest area is where they're doing all, uh, the greens because they're doing a bit better. These Orc Barbagans are kind of wandering off into nowhere, though. They gotta come back. They gotta come back. They gotta get involved. Nice flank from the Night Goblin Squid Hoppers. Hits the hammer of the witches just as a wall comes in. And now the Greenskins should start to really win that front line fight. But the, uh, the Goblin Great Shaman is already out of here. Marcus Wolfhard's still trying to get up there. I think he was trying to get up for a little bit more sniping, but didn't quite get it done. Hammer of the Witches is entirely deleted. Orc Borber Biggin's going to take a fight with these Empire Knights who are chasing off Morgan's Ranger Marauder, so they're going to walk straight into their death, and those Orc Borber Biggins will claim a second Empire Knight for their bounty. Really mixed battle so far. Both players having good engagements, or both players having whoopsie engagements. Orc Biggins down the field. Should have a good time fighting everything in this little area. And the Goblin Great Shaman is back. He's very low on HP, but if he can just stay at a distance and throw out Vindictive Glares and try and snipe a little bit, that could be okay. Orc Biggins and the Warlords boys moving in, pushing through that front line. And the Empire, along with Skaven, Vampire Coast, any shooting faction, a lot of their balance of power is in these range units. So if the Night Goblin Squig Hoppers and the Orc Borber Biggins can roll through the back line, they can even up this balance of power like nobody's business. It'll be back to middle in no time if they can get back here and really shut these guys down. The Tattered Souls are taking a fight with Orc Biggins. They'll lose it. They'll lose it slowly over time. Though hopefully the Greenskins just target the range units. It looks like they overall are trying to get back here and do some good disruption. The Orc Borber Biggins, again, kind of wandering around the wilderness. It's cool they're sniping out these Empire Knights, but you have bigger jobs. The Empire Knights are not what's going to win the game for the Empire. It's the Huntsmen. we got to get back here and shut down the Huntsmen. Lightcaster is dying, pushed off. The Goblin Great Shaman is here as well, but he might be wandering a little too close to the sun. If these Huntsmen realize that he is back in range, they could turn and snipe him out. But a good Dictive Glare on the back of that uh, Lightcaster does well. The second and final Wah is out. Giving the Greenskins more stats, baby stats. Orc Borber Biggins and Night Goblin Squid Hoppers need to return to the main fight. But the front line of the Greenskins is providing that constant nice pressure you really want out of them. The Huntsmen are less obstructed than I would like, but it's going fine. Oh, big snipe in from Marcus Wolfhart. That is probably the death of the Goblin Great Shaman. Yeah, Huntsmen will finish him off, but even then his leadership is just not going to allow it. Can the Greenskins withhold the loss of their leadership? It's not looking great for them. Orc Borbigan still chasing around shattered units in the distance. The Warlords boys, these Orc Biggins are doing well. More Orc Biggins doing well. Nasty Skulkers and Orc Biggins doing well. And the Empire lost everything on this bottom flank, finally. We do have some Empire Knights rallying that could charge back over here, but we'll see how much it matters. Night Gums Week Hoppers route on the charge. Because Huntsmen have firewall moving, so when they're running away, if something is in front of them, they can shoot at it. Greenskin's getting real close to that mass routing point, though. They lost an Orc Biggin, which probably means these nasty Skulkers will be the next to go. Rear charge in from Empire Knights. There they go as well. The Warlords boys getting close to routing. Also, here comes the nearly full health Broken Tusk mob in the late game. Ugh. I hate to harp on it, but 
They needed to be here a lot earlier and shut down all these huntsmen. There go more orc biggins. Maybe the greenskins can wander off into the distance and rally. Maybe. As the Night Goblin Squig Hoppers, Morgan's Major Marauders, and the Orc Biggins charge in. This will be a lot of damage. Ooh, don't go for Marcus. You can't really damage him. Eh, that was going to happen either way. But you can't really damage Marcus. You're just going to take a fight with all these other things. Leave Marcus for the hyper late game. Because there we go. A Huntsman is routing. Other Huntsmen are doing so well. Empire Knights get a free charge on the netted Broken Tusk Mob. But they're so damaged, they can't stand up these guys at all. And they just get pushed away. Tattered Souls fighting to the last man, as Flagellants do, but that will free up an Orc Biggin with plenty of HP into the late game here. We have three Huntsmen routing. One's actually shattered. Uh, that one's going to route any second now. And a net of Amnitok is cast on the Broken Tusk Mob. Oh, the Lightcaster's back. Welcome back, Lightcaster. But the Green Seeds are pulling back on the Balance of Power. This is what I was talking about, man. If you shut down those ranged units, all of a sudden the Balance of Power reconsiders. So the Huntsmen are all going. I don't know what's left that can kill Marcus. That's looking a little suspect for me. Because Marcus is a decent alien combatant. 58-45 for stats. 360 weapon strength. Still a lot of orcs to deal with. Say goodbye to Light Wizard and, ah, Poseidon just FFs. And I think Marcus could have done a little better there than Poseidon was giving him credit for, but... Good tenacity from Rogue to stay in it. Orc Biggins did well. Night Goblin Squig Harpers did well. The Broken Tusk Mob did amazing. GG. For Poseidon, the cannon, 1300 value. Marcus, only 750. His light caster isn't going to get a lot of value because he's just doing nets and stuff. Huntsman did very, very well. And the State Troop Frontline did okay. G. G. Okay, I think that is everybody, at least once. I have faction face-off things, I have to say. BC versus... What was Galrunch? Why does Marcus have so high of melee stats? I don't know. Because he's a Giga Chad. Let's get on to our first semi final here. So, this is post Swiss tournament semi final between Incars and Niklaus. Neither of these players has lost up to this point. One of them gets knocked out. If you cast all any of my remaining games, the Lizard vs. Hiles game versus Parry or Post was a good scrap. Shiggy Diggy. Shiggy Diggy, I know you've told me in the past, but you're going to have to remind me in Discord what your name is. If you don't want it on stream, that's fine. But... You have to remind me, because I know your Discord name honestly is Shiggy Diggy, but when you say my game versus blank and blank was good, I'm like, oh shit, what is your Discord name? As soon as you tell me, I'm gonna be like, oh of course, because I knew it at one point. Okay, okay, okay. So we have Incars and Niklaus here. Bahrain? Ah, there you go. Lizard versus the house. I'm trying to remember that. Alright, Silver and Garden Spearmen for the front line, Lava and Seaguard, and Sisters of Avalorn for the back. Sisters of Avalorn with their armor piercing shots are good versus Lizards, but also that critical fire damage. And honestly, the magic damage is good too in case they bring flesh to stone. So, Sisters of Avalorn, just really good here. More Lava and Seaguard, some Silver Helms, and then a Metal Cast with Plague of Rust and Searing Doom. On the other side, for the Lizards, we have Soros Warriors marching up the front line, Legion of Chakwa Spears, Temple Guard in the back, and some Skink Skirmishers for a little bit of poison pressure. We have some Feral Cold Ones, Cord of Waddle, a Life Salon with Regrowth and Earthblood, and a Bastildon Rev Crystal. This is a very tanky Lizardman build. I worry there's no DPS here. I worry they're not going to damage anything. Lairn Reaver Archers rear charging into these King Skirmishers, trying to get rid of them while the Cord of Waddle fights back. But can the Saurus really get through the Spearmen, man? Let's find out. 
Hollywood stars and celebrities, do they kill Soros? Let's find out. Archers all pouring in fire while the Lizardmen did offer a little bit of healing. A Banishment and a Blood Statue Respite did half HP to the Sisters of Avalorn, but we'll see how much that matters. Legion of Chocolate and the Structure of Guardians taking some Searing Dooms. And Silver Helms get a rear charge on these Soros. Already one Soros is about to rout, another Soros is almost dead. Shield of the Old Ones is cast, but Plague of Rust overcast onto the Bastilled on Rev Crystal. Still has 110 armor because of the aura of Quetzal that's coming in right now. And a regrowth trying to heal it up, but it just gets deleted by all those archers. And that is a lot of Lizardmen healing gone. Croc scores in Feral Cold Ones, busy dealing with those Skirmish Cab in the back. Court of Waddle are re trying to rejoin the frontline fight. We've already lost one. And then two Saurus are about dead, so like almost three Saurus are gone already. The Rev Crystal is gone. And the Balance of Power thinks it's only slightly high on favor, but I think this is a slaughter. As the Searing Doom hits the Star Chamber Guardians and Temple Guard, doesn't do a lot of damage to them. But the Slaw and Mage Priest ends up a little overextended, though there's nowhere to really to hide from these archers unless you're just not in the fight. Saurus don't have the stats to trade into High Elves, in your opinion? I agree. Saurus are a very defensive unit. And uh, the High Elves are better at being defensive than anybody. Saurus are trying to just sneak past the Spearmen. They're not even killing them. They're just walking past them to get onto these archers. But I don't know if it matters. That's on his toast. 40% missile resist trying to save him. There's a lot more than 40% missiles. NP? Eh, it happens, dude. It happens. I agree. I don't love the build. I won't sugarcoat it. Uh, the Saurus and Temple Guard just have nothing to do against the High Elves, but shit happens, man. Another Searing Doom onto a big old blob of Temple Guard and Saurus. Have I been all all up? Have I been on it all after my initial replay, Spartan? No, but I don't think anybody has. I cast like one of everyone's games, and then we got to semifinals. That's how many people were in this one. Source weapon strength is solid, uh, lol guy. Their weapon strength isn't the problem, it's their melee attack. High Elves melee defense is really, really high, and Saurus are paying an awful lot to not get through them very quickly. Sisters of Avalorn, good value. Silver Helms did fine. The Spearmen and Silver and Guard just never routed. Love and Seagird all also did fine. Um, not a lot to comment on here from Incars, but it was a good build, executed well. It's just not, like, the flashiest thing. The archers were firing and peeled for. Ooh. Yeah. GG. GG. While we wait on the finals, let's scroll through and at least eliminate some stuff. Corn versus High Elves? Maybe. Dwarves versus Dark Elves? Uh, fine. Norska versus Empire? Uh, fine. Nerd versus Bahrain. Bretonia. Pass. Zinch versus Hiles. Niklaus Perry Post. Ah, there's a good amount going on there. Dark Elves versus Dwarves. We have a different Dark Elf versus Dwarves, and this has Malice versus Heroes, so no. Pass. Not trying to be a dick, but we can't cast every game. What the fuck is that, Zero? <laughs> what the... What? What? What the hell is that? <laughs> Whatever. I'll get back to it. I'll get back to it. Dark Elves Green Skins. As a giant. Sure. Ogre Kingdom's Dark Elves. Sure. Nerd and Yashikov. That's the same game. So I'll delete that just because it's the same game. Hiles vs. Coast. Maybe. Norska versus Chaos Dwarves. Maybe. Wasson versus Zero. Ugh, Bretonian. Bretonian! I don't want it! Oh, it's not just that I don't want it. I have a very I have a limited amount of time, so I can't cast every game, right? Chalk and Niklaus, that looks fine. High of Lizardmen. Uh we just cast High of Lizardmen, but that's a very different take on it. Ugh! Slash versus Tomb Kings. Greenskins, what elves? Greenskins, high elves. I'll skip that one, sorry. 
That looks wild. Whatever the fuck that is. Okay, those are the same. Uh, boy, oh boy, oh boy. High elves, chaos dwarves, greenskins, high elves. We've seen a lot of greenskins and high elves today, so I'm just gonna skip that one. Dwarf hero hammer. Oh, versus rogue idol. Okay, okay, I can make an exception for that. Bretonia Grand Cathay. Sure, that seems fine. Corn lizardmen. Okay, we saw that. We saw that, but from the other side. We've not seen that, and we're here. Okay, so these are all the replays, right? Here's the deal. Here's the deal. We have a we have a final that we're gonna cast no matter what, and I'll announce that. Other than that, I have two and a half hours left to stream before I have to get ready to go to dinner. I'll cast as many of these replays that I find interesting until that time point. If we hit that time point and I still have replays to cast, the stream has to end. Okay? But other than that, I'm just going to start going through these. And these happen if they happen to be replays, great. I got one of everybody's at least. That's all I can guarantee. After that, there's too many for me to cast them all. So we just pick the ones that look interesting. So let's bounce around and find a faction we haven't cast in a while. Uh, what else is each? Fucking sure. Mr. Chalk and Trogdar the Flagellant. No, they were the Blue Scribes. I think there's others with Blue Scribes. I'm sorry, lol guy. <laughs> I'm sorry. Do I see Kairos? Uh, he got unbanned when CA removed regrowth from him. Okay, 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 okay. Zinch versus Wood Elves. For Zinch, we have Marauders Frontline mixed with Blue Horrors and Pink Horrors, Chaos Knights and Chaos Warriors, and then we do have a Chaos Lord of Zinch with Blue and Pink Fire. Hey, Edwin. On the other side, we have Deepwood Scouts, the Hawkeyes of Chikira Way Watchers. I love the Hawkeyes of Chikira versus Demonic Factions. That minus 16 discouraged leadership aura is really brutal for demonic instability crumbling. And then we have some spears, including the Wild Rangers, RR Wardens of Sithril, some Wild Riders, some Glade Riders, a Glade Lord with Prey of Anoth Rhema, and then a Spellsinger, Shadows of Melkos, and Pit of Shades. But look at that! Look at the chromatic abominations! They start demonic instability crumbling. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. And a good start here for the Wood Elves. Because Chromatic Abominations are a really tough ROR to get rid of most of the time, so that minus 16 from the Hawkeyes of Shakira little Discourage thing is actually pretty huge. So I'm loving it so far. Ba -da -ba -ba -ba. Oh, we have some sneaky Wild Riders. That doesn't look like anybody's seen. Chaos Knights of Zinch get Prey of Anoth Rayma. They have no Missile Resistance. They are going to get shot a little bit, but their barriers should be able to eat a lot of the damage. Oh, but they can't uh, can't block that Pit of Shades. Pit of Shades going to hit them and the Marauders. Meanwhile, Wild Riders get a rear charge through the Pink Horrors. I'm really liking the Wood Elf play so far. A lot of crafty little sneaky stuff, and their micro is pretty good. Crushing it. Chaos Knights now fighting Eternal Guard. And Eternal Guard have armor piercing, not just anti-large. They're one of the few base spearmen in the game that have armor piercing. Eternal Guard have other problems. They're not OP, but they do have armor piercing, which is a problem for these Chaos Knights that are stuck in them right now while they're also getting shots. This is really, really good for the Wood Elves. This is a great start. Blue Horrors firing back. We still have Chaos Warriors, the constant back line of the Zinchians. A nice little pink fire through the Hawkeyes. It actually did good damage, but it wasn't overcast. So far... Wood Elves are getting the better of Zinch in a lot of areas, but what they are running into is Wood Elf Syndrome. Anybody that stays in a fight for any amount of time is going to take such significant damage that you're going to lose it. So that Wild Rider, not having like literally perfect micro, would get him out of the fight as soon as he gets into it. Uh, he just dies outright. That's a very expensive unit to lose. The Pink Horrors are still offering a little bit of fire while the Hawkeyes of Jakira and the Deep Wood Scouts fire into those Pink Horrors, giving a lot of damage out. A Blue Fire tries to curve and hit some of the Wild Riders. Gets a couple of them, but then doesn't get insane damage or anything. Blue Horrors starting to demonic instability crumble away. Other Blue Horrors are fighting back. 
And Corys will fire at the Wild Riders who are charging them. Prepare to watch some little pink balloons fly. Whee! Oh, no! Woe is us! We got trampled by randos. Deepwood Scout's still very, very healthy. Probably have enough Rayma Caster is healthy. Oh, but we have a full health Chaos Knight, and I cursed it because he just got netted. And he's going to get Pit of Shades while getting shot in the face. Okay, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to mention that you had a unit that was still alive. <laughs> Please forgive me! <laughs> As he's getting lit up. He still has 120 armor and bronze shield, so it's not like he's just going to die. But yeah, it's not great. Chaos Sorcerer Lord of Zinch. Almost dead. Needs to be a little more careful on that far side. And there go the Chaos Knights. From full HP down to just below half and still following blue horrors trying to fire in but the wood elves pull further ahead on the balance of power the only thing i'm concerned about is that their archers are running low on ammunition which is a good problem to have in a way it means you've got all your ammo off but in comes a tier three army ability of zinch do the wood elves notice it there's no net or anything to hold them in place it looks like they start to run now Still get hit with some of the volleys while the pink horrors are firing in, but uh, it was a bold attempt. I appreciate it. I like it. It didn't end up working out as the blue fire tries to go on the clumped up archer units to hit both of them. Doesn't really do that much damage since it changes to blue fire. It doesn't go down the line anymore. It just kind of hits one target and stops, which is huge to why it's not considered like wildly OP anymore. It's just like, it's fine. Wild Riders pushed off, other Wild Riders trying to fight it out, and the Chaos Warriors still have a good amount of HP, but as I mentioned before, these Eternal Guard have armor piercing, so they're not helpless against Chaos Warriors. Chaos Sorcerer Lord of Zinch pulling away. Hawkeyes are secure down to two volleys. Deepwood Scouts still have a bit more, and the Chaos Knights of Zinch were trying to charge over here, but they get blocked up by a Glade Lord who sacrifices her body to not lock these guys in place. But there's still two Pink Horrors with a ton of ammunition and a lot of health. That actually could be a big problem in the late game. Could be. Oh, that was a good final volley from the Hawkeyes of Jakira. Delete that fool and send him routing. We'll see if he comes back, maybe, after the Discourage wears off. Like, he took a shock of damage, so he might come back, but I don't know. Wild Riders charge in, only to shatter moments later, but uh, they broke the impetus here of those, uh, the, the Chaos Knights of Zinch. They'll get routed off. Wild Riders still stampeding through the back line, but the other Glade Riders are pushed off, and uh, these pinks could be a real, real problem. I know I mentioned it before, but they can kill most of the infantry that are left, and then they can get good damage onto the single entities if they spread out, right? If they don't stay on top of each other, so the single entities have to pick one or the other to go fight for a while. We have our finals replay in. Just saved it. Deepwood Scouts pushed off by the pinks. Marauders peeling for... Uh, yeah, these are both runners. Peeling for the pink horrors. In comes a bold pit of shades. Gonna catch some of the little pink models. Flop them around in the air. And then the Deepwood Scouts volleying onto them as well. This is gonna be good damage. Glade Lord's also diving in. Chaos Knights of Zinch and the Marauders. Gonna take out the Hawkeyes of Jakira. They gotta stop these Deepwood Scouts before they get any more dangerous volleys onto our pink horror friends. Pink horror's getting very low on leadership. Modicus stability is a hell of a drug. And oh no! The exact thing I was worried about happening is happening. The Pink Horrors are clumping up, so they're both fighting the Glade Lord instead of either of them shooting at him. That'll probably be Demonic Instability for one of those Pink Horrors, and then the other one can just get focused on by the Glade Lord all game. Hawkeyes of Shakira are gone. Blue Horrors and Chaos Warriors are fighting as the Spellsinger of Shadows, beating her up slowly but surely. There goes one of the Pink Horrors. Chaos Knights will take out the Deepwood Scouts that still have ammo, but a Melkoth should finish them off entirely. They should actually just die from the spell. More Marauders coming to help out a little bit. The Knights of Zinch survive with 100 HP. Balance power is still 50-50. Hey! The Chaos Sorcerer Lord of Zinch is alive in the distance. He's technically here. I feel like if he didn't go off the map, he must have rallied and then routed again. So we'll see if he can cast pink uh, blue fires from like an extreme distance. But Marauders are piling in to fight the Glade Lord, who's still trying to kill off Pink Horrors. Firing arrows into their dumb pink faces. And the Shadows Caster is gone. She running. Eternal Guard is chasing around Chaos Warriors of Zinch. Da, 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 
One leadership on the Chaos Arch of the Lord, man, as he's trying to come back. Pink Horror's beating up the poor Glade Lord. And I think the only way the Wood Elves can win this is if they have a Pit of Shades to hit, like, all four of these clumped up infantry units. That would be pretty brutal. Without it, I just don't think they can kill, like, all this extra stuff. Because you can Pit of Shades them, and then this Glade Lord needs one arrow to shatter off the Chaos Sorcerer Lord of Zinch, then this shit's over for the Wood Elves. There's the Pit of Shades! Oh, okay, the leadership hold! Zinch does not dodge in time. Big damage onto the Blue Horrors, onto the Marauders, onto the Pink Horrors as well, and all of a sudden the balance power should shift pretty heavily just from how many units got massacred right now. Oof, duh. And Zinch is going to want that one back. Definitely overclumping on their units there. Getting punished. Still have two Chaos Warriors running around. Though the Glade Lord does cause armor piercing damage. And there's a red dot behind me. We still have some Eternal Guard who are technically trying to come back to the fight. There's a final blue fire. The overcast damage hurts the Chaos Sorcerer Lord of Zinch. But it does a lot of damage to Spellsinger of Shadows. He stays in the fight. Still one leadership despite the overcast damage on himself. But there's the arrow. There it is. There it is. There it is. Hey, it caused him to shatter. No more spells for Zinch. And as soon as that guy gets all the way off the map, which is far away, to be fair, but their leadership will spike down. I wonder how much Winds of Magic the Spellsinger of Shadows has left if she has another Melkoth to cast in this castle Warrior of Zinch. Or even, I mean, a Pit of Shades would be welcome, but I really don't know if you have that kind of Winds of Magic this late in the game. We'll see. We'll see. But the Glade Lord's fighting it out. 60 melee defense, 65 melee attack, armor piercing strength, and ammunition. Plenty. Can do an awful lot of grinding. Can the Spellsinger of Shadows help out in any way? I think, I, I without any Melkoths being cast here, I think he's saving up for Pit of Shades. Because otherwise, there had to have been at least like one or two Melkoths left, and he would have cast them by now. So I, I have to believe he's saving up for Pit of Shades. But you can see the Glade Lord is actually doing very well against the Chaos Warriors of Zinch. At this point, I really think, if you are saving up for Pit of Shades, skip it. Just Melkoths that Chaos Warrior and get a rear charge in. That should route it off. And then everything else is just Marauders, and they're so weak your single entities can carry. I'm saying that like it's present tense. It's a replay, so whatever happened already happened, but here, that's my point. Leadership Shock from getting rear charge will take out the Chaos Warriors. No, they rally at zero leadership, and they hold on. The Glade Lord is going to stay in combat while the Shadows Caster gets to safety. But it looks like she was maybe trying to bait. Is there a Pit of Shades for these two clumped up units? There it is! It was a bait! It was a bait! Eternal Guard also jumping into the some Marauders, but the Pit of Shades is going to catch out the Chaos Warrior that is healthiest and the Marauder that was healthiest, probably turning this game into a Wood Elf's dub. Spellsinger Shadows kind of wanders too far off into oblivion there. I wonder what she's doing. In comes the Stag Charge. Bop! It's going to hurt some Marauders. The other Marauders of Zinch are just trying to get their Vigor back. Ravenoth Rama nets these Marauders, getting them to rout and kill them. Spellsinger of Life, uh, sorry, Shadows, just charge over here. Yeah, everything's routing for Zinch. I think this is over at this point. They are in this game by one leadership on this Marauder. Marauders, one leadership again, but other Marauders have rallied. They're doing good damage to the Glade Lord. They're doing their damnedest. One leadership as they continue to beat her up. One leadership. They're all it, baby. Ah, they finally routed you fucks. Glade Lord's down to lower than 700 HP. Chaos Warriors are rallying as she's going to charge downhill into these guys. Antlers couched, boys. Charges in. Takes 30-ish damage, but those other Marauders are back yet again. Shady's back. Tell a friend. 500 HP and falling. And these Marauders have 23. 
leadership. They're chilling, and they get the Glade Lord knocked down. They route her off, and all of a sudden, the balance power is like, fitty fitty. Glade Lord's routing off. 150 HP, 2,000 on these Marauders, but what spells do we have left? Do we have Melkoths? Do we have anything? That's crazy that these Marauders held on with literally one leadership, and that ends up maybe winning the game. I'm going to times two speed for just a brief moment as this spell Weaver is just killing some people. So Glade Lord does not look to be rallying. Oh, zero leadership! Is it a positive zero or is it a negative zero? And the fact that that sentence makes sense is, is sad, but it's a negative zero. So they're off the map. Balance of power, still 50-50, but the spell Weaver, her leadership dips super hard. 21 leadership left for her. She's going to fight some Chaos Warriors, but they're, they're too powerful for her. She needs a Melkoth to kill them off if she's even going to at all, but I don't know if she has that kind of Winds of Magic left. If you're saving up for Pit of Shades, that is objectively the wrong choice. You need a Melkoth, so you're going to die right now. Uh, she's dead. Cuden, I know you're memeing, but that is weird. I feel like the Marauders are doing more damage than Chaos Warriors. That was kind of weird. Chaos Knights did fine for Mr. Chalk. Zinch Caster did pretty fine. Pink Horrors did great. Blue Horrors did uh, all right. Was I allowed to run down those routing units with my single entities? Yes. Yes, Chasing Routing Units is attacking, I believe. I believe? Though now you've made me paranoid. Why would you do this? Why would you make me paranoid? Okay. Yes, chasing routing units is 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 that that was good. Chasing routing units is uh, is attacking. Really good values for the wood elves across their archers and their single entities. Wild riders mixed. Glade riders and spears struggled a bit. Internal guard did okay. That was good. So this is the finals. Both players sent me the finals. I just saved one of them, so I actually don't know who won. Um, but let me find that game so I can delete it. There right, we go. Alright, so this is the finals for the tournament. Who wins? New player tournament number 47 is Heimdera or Incars. Grand Cathay versus the High Elves. For the forces of Grand Cathay, we have two Fire and Rockets, Jade Warrior Crossbows with Shields, Xiao Ming with Plague of Rest, Fire Breath, and Fire Transitation. Two Jade Lancers, a Peasant Horseman as well mixed in here usually. Oh wow, three Jade Lancers this time. Peasant Long Spears and Jade Warriors for Frontline, and then two Jade Warrior Crossbows with Shields. On the other side, four M cars in the High Elves, we have Triple Lyran River Archer, one of which is the Herald of the Wind. Three War Lines of Krace, five White Lines of Krace as a front line with some Spearmen and Log and Seaguard and Archers to back them up. We do have a Metal Caster with Plague of Rust and Searing Doom. Uh, Lyran Reaver Archers taking too long of a trade with Jade Warrior Crossbows. That is not going to go their way. And War Lions going way ahead of the army. I do not agree with this. I do not like this. I do not condone this behavior. As the Illyrian Reaver Archers are trying to hit the Firing Rockets, they're also going to get outshot by the Jade Warrior Crossbows. And uh, Lions without support, they're doing well against the Jade Warriors, but, I mean, they're just getting recharged with uh, Jade Lancers here, and now they're going to rout. Two... Two ham. Other white li uh, War Lions of Krace diving into these guys, but again, we do have Jade Lancers around that can try and peel. Now, the War Lions have dove all the way in to really stop the Fire Rain Rockets, and Overcast's Searing Doom does good damage to those Fire Rains and a little bit to the Jade Warrior Crossbows, but we have lost a War Lion of Krace for it. The Archers have taken some damage from the Fire Rain Rockets. Spooky, scary. Valerian Archers losing the fight against the Jade Lancers. 
They'll need to back off. Looks like they're actually running forwards, which is a little odd. The War Lions of Kreis still disrupting the Fire and Rockets. Looks like they destroyed all of the Fire and Rocket models, so they did suicide for a successful kill on the Fire and Rocket. The other one is getting killed off by the Archers. So Thay's artillery has been destroyed. Does it matter? In comes a big Searing Doom. Look at that clump! Look at that clump! That's a dead clump. That's good damage. Again, considering how cheap this bell is, right? Uh, Jade Lancer's trying to charge out here, getting shot by archers at the moment. White Lions of Craze just starting to reach the front line now. Archmage Metal might be overextended. I mean, Zhao Ming is going to run in here and say hello. She probably has to back off. But without the firing rockets, now the archers at least have a chance of fighting back. If you can take out the Jade Warrior Crossbows, maybe they'll do okay. Jade Lancer's running down archers. Lawther and Seaguard reforming lines to fire up and over into, unfortunately, armored and shielded Jade Warrior crossbows. Leonard Archer is trying to get through the back line, being pursued by Jade Lancers. This is bad, though. Final Tentation plus Zhao Ming sniping out the Archmage of Metal is going to kill her off. Yeah, she shatters, so no more magic for the High Elves. They might even lose their leadership if Zhao Ming gets one more hit on her. Archers are mostly shut down. It's all just on the white lines of Kreis now. Yeah, it's looking like GG. Cathay is going to just stat stick you to death. Look at these poor archers. They don't even know. Bim bam bop. I trained for a thousand years to shoot this bow. And a horse kicked you in the face, and now you're dead. Zhao Ming is helping the boys hold the front line. Doesn't give a single shit. And now your Lava and Seaguard are trying to fire against the superior crossbows. And that is just GG. Not to be rude, but there's no hope for Cathay in this game, uh, for High Elves in this game at this point. Now be it. Heimdallar! Winner of the new player tournament. On Grand Cathay. Jade Lancers did very well. Jade Crossbows did fine. Zhao Ming sniped out the enemy lord with gusto. Jade Warriors did well. That was all you really needed. Who do you think is stronger Salon casters or Grand Cathay Dragon casters? Oh, Salon's easy. Easy, 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 easy. I think Grand Cathay Dragon casters are kind of a bait. Honestly. They're they're fine, but they're not actually that amazing. I have a lot more success with basic Shugenin Lords and going with the wider Cathay army. Abuse your higher stats. Alright, let me congratulate Tomo Man. Nice job. You are no longer a rat ogre. You are now a bone ripper. Gone with the silly replays! Uh, we just cast some high elves. Let's do some derfs. We have Corvus Glaive versus Heimdallar. Derf, 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 derf. Four shades, five dark shards. That's a lot of armor piercing Daka. Rest in peace, hammers. Unshielded, relying entirely on their armor to keep them safe. We have a Dragon Soul Stealer caster, four shades as we mentioned, five dark shards, and then a bunch of bleak swords, two dark riders to run some stuff off, and that is it for the dark elf build. Straightforward, armor piercing missiles, shoot the dwarves. For the dwarves, we have two cannons, two hammerers, iron breakers, the grumbling guard, more iron breakers, thunderers, rangers, the great weapons, the dwarf warriors, and we have a lord. 
Hi, Nathan. I also think this might be rather one-sided, but... I like dwarves. I like dwarves, I hate Hero Hammer. That's the hard part about liking dwarves right now in the current meta, is Hero Hammer for the dwarves is really strong. So, I don't see why you wouldn't do it. Shades get a good volley onto the cannons, while the cannons try and hit the Serene Sorcerer Dark, who is dodging very well. Thunder is going to counter fire back at the Shades. But uh, the Shades are more than up to the task. Nice breath attack in from the Dark Elves. I love how the rest of their army isn't even moving up. They're just relying on their Shades, which I don't think... While it's a Chad move, it's not correct. Like, these Dark Shards should be getting up into range. There's no reason not to. You outshoot the enemy, so... Five Dark Shards, like, would offer more DPS than the Dwarves are going to get countering the Dark Shards, if that makes sense. So it's more worth it for you to have them in the fight. Relying on four Shades to kill this entire army is just like... I mean, the whole army's already here. It's already going to participate. The Dwarves should realize that they're outshot, though. And they do need to just, like, move up and try and get into melee. Cannons take another volley from the Shades, but they're thumping the Shades in return. And Dark Elf Lord just parks over here. Wonder what she's waiting for. Wonder what she's looking at. What she sees. Dwarf Warriors pursuing Shades into the woods. And in comes a point blank breath attack onto the Grumbling Guard. Get a little bit of poke. Big Soul Stealer cast. How many dwarves does it hit? It's the Rangers, but not the Iron Breakers. That feels a little weird, but sure. But sure. Hammers moving up. Sorcerer's of Dark might have overstayed her welcome a little bit, but she can just walk out of here. The dwarves have no mass to stop her, obviously. Shades firing in. And the Dark Elves still not moving. There we go. Now they're moving their Dark Shards up. Are the anti-infantry shades? No. No, they're just regular shades. The Dwarven Cannons are proving rather hard to take out. <laughs> they're just chilling. Oh, and a nasty blasting charge volley out of those shades. Cannons now starting to turn their fire on the Bleak Swords. Dwarf is going to retreat. That could be bad, though. Turning their Silver Shields away means if these uh, Dark Shards and Shades just turn a volley on them while they're facing the wrong way, they'll, like, die. So the Dark Shards aren't going to stop and fire for these Dwarf Warriors, though. They're busy doing other stuff. Supreme Source of Stark's Dark still taking a bit of damage. And Dwarf Warriors are going to circle in those other Shades. In the distance, Dark Riders catch some Dwarf Warriors to get them off of the Shades in the woods. Now, Cannons are still at 7 out of 8 models, so they're actually still pretty high on DPS. Another Breath Attack, Point Blank Range into some Hammers and Rangers. And another landing in from the Supreme Sorceress of Dark. Knocks Cannons offline, but in come the Hammers, and she might be fully surrounded by Hammers in just a hot second here but uses that dragon mass to pass straight through them, but she stops. Eh, you don't want to stop here. You don't want to stop here. Uses a soul stealer to do some damage and heal herself back up, but she's taking significant damage as she starts to leave. The cannon's still firing it out. Dark Riders rear charge the cannons, trying to knock them off their mounts. So far unsuccessful. And the Sorceress still trying to get up in the sky. Here the Dark Shards are finally in the fight. And they can shoot at these hammers. There you go. Good damage onto such an elite unit. <laughs> I love how long it took the Dark Elves to be like, Fine, I'll bring my army. I'll bring the whole army. Jesus. And then they just walk up and start deleting some fools. At this point, that's a GG. 
There's nothing the dwarves can do. Their lead infantry are just gonna get kited. Like, look at the damage on these hammers and iron breakers. Big soul stealer onto a clump. Balance power just continues to ebb away from the dwarves. And that is GG. For the dwarves, you probably have to bring a bunch of quarrelers or rangers in this matchup. You need shields, your own shielded archers. Cannons, unfortunately, don't do a lot. In like, I complained about it earlier, but artillery is just not in the best place in general. But dwarven cannons are niche. They're good against very certain things, but not against mass infantry. Dark Elf Caster did fine. Shades did fine. Dark Shards did fine. That was all you really need. Corvus, Zion Breakers, Blast Charges did okay. Hammers just got kited. His cannons did okay for firing all game. Rangers did alright. Alright, let's do this. Rogue Consultant versus Aki. High Elves, very popular faction today. Versus Kar. Is that a Chaos Warrior or a Chosen? Looks like a Chaos Warrior with dual weapons. It's not a full Chosen. I love my Chosen. Alrighty. For Zahiles, we have Imric. Imric, Imric, Imric. Mage of Life with Awaken to the Wood and Regrowth. Then we have Towns of Torcaleda, some Lava and Sea Guard, White Lions of Cray, Spearmen, and Silver and Guard. Then we have the Fireborn and Illyrian Reavers. Straightforward, nice, high elf build, I like it. I like it. On the other side, Valkia, good lord against the high elves. Your Spear Slopnir is good at punishing their extremely tight, long formations. Some Mind Hearts Great Opens. That is a cultist on a war shrine! Okay, okay. I don't know if it's a good choice, but it's a choice and it happened. Tons of leadership, and it gives more melee attack and weapon strength. For every enemy that dies. Nearby entity death. Ooh, you could even charge off your own guys. Okay, cool. Blood letters, chaos wars with dual weapons, a whole bunch of minos. Blood letters, blood letters, blood letters. So blood letters are in. Spear slop near down the line of Lava and Sea Guard. That's why we love to take that versus these guys. Silver Guard with 54 melee defense, but the blood letters, how much bonus for symmetry do they have? Nine. Ugh, that sucks. Okay, so blood letters actually won't do that well against Silver and Guard. Okay, as far as the dual weapons will do great. They'll do amazing. Minotaurs standing off for now, hoping to figure out something to do. And Imric's going to try and land on some Skirmish Cav. That's not going to be a good use of his time. Illyrian Reavers will get massacred by these Minotaurs here. We are about to lose a Bloodletter already, unfortunately. Say goodbye to them. But over here, double Minotaurs plus Valkia kill off an Illyrian Reaver, and the Fireborn get caught napping a little bit. They don't get a charge, and instead they get charged. This will be terrible for the High Elves. I am very concerned. My concern levels are high. Imric stops chasing the Skirmish Cab, realizes it's not worth his time, and starts to come back. But we are about to lose the Fireborn for free, unless they run away. Run away! Run away! Run away! You got inspired by a turn build by the Cultist on a Shrine? Okay, lol guy, that's cool, that's cool, that's cool. Have you ever considered that we don't like Turin here? Stop bringing him up. It just makes me angry. Ooh, I hate that guy in his full head of hair. I wish I had a full head of hair. My, my shit's thinning. Getting thin hair. Anyway, Hyle's quite down on the bounce of power. Bloodletter's still trying to get through the front line. And, uh, yeah, Minos killed the Fireborn. I like this. I like this. Pulling the Minotaurs away from the main fight is pretty good use of the Fireborn's time, considering how damaged they are. Okay, Bloodletter still taking, uh, taking damage, but the Cultist, his various leadership buffs will be quite nice to keep them in the fight and stop them from Devonic instability crumbling. That'll be good. That'll be good. Towns of Torcaleda get attacked by Minos, and I thought the Bloodletters would go for them, but the Bloodletters are actually going for a rear charge on the White Lions, which is not a bad decision. It's not the one I would have made offhand, but now that I think about it, it's fine. You mean Caster Turin or MTK Turin? Caster Turin, dude. MTK Turin is a Chad. I'll, I'll, uh... Well, I can't say I'll never insult him, because I have insulted him before, but that was me being a salty loser, because he beat me, and then I got mad.
Fireborn charge in. Now the Cultist has taken a lot of damage, and this full health Bloodletter is a summon, so it's fake. Those are the pros. The cons are, there's still a full Chaos Warrior with dual weapons. There's still three Minotaurs who are all very healthy, and Balki is healthy. Imric is currently surrounded by some of those Minos. He's getting dragged into the dust. This looks... This just looks like a good corn build somehow. Like, on paper, I didn't believe in this shit at all, but like, in-game, it just looked really solid. Like, for the High Elves, Imbrick went on a bit of a la da and his Fireborn got caught, sure. And that is a lot of value, sure. But I was surprised by like, how tenacious the Blood Letters were. I kind of felt like they would die super quickly, and they just didn't, so that was cool. I like that. Well done, Cord. well done. <laughs> I didn't believe in you, but you proved me to be a fool. Glancing through the valleys, just seeing if anything is worth noting. Imric and the Fireborn getting, like, nothing done was problematic. Blood Letters and Chaos Warriors... Blood Letters overall did fine. One got deleted before the fight really started, but otherwise it was fine. Mino's just getting a ton of value. Look at him go. It just works, TN. Norska versus Amp. Norska versus Chorfs. Now nah, we haven't had Amp in a while. Let's do Amp. It's fine. Brett Michael brought the mammoth again? Of course he did. So, Norska versus the Empire. For Norska, we have Skin Wolves. We have the Mist Stalkers from your warrior ROR. Skin Wolf Warekin. Marauder Horse with Throwing Axes. A Marauder Chieftain on his mammoth with Fight or Die. The Beast of Tashnar, Miles of Savagery. Norskin Trolls and Marauder Spearmen. Okay. Shame and Sorcerer Death with Doom and Darkness. And uh, Spirit Leech 2. That is a very diverse Norska thing. On the other side for the Empire, front line of state troops. We have the Silver Bullets in the back line, Sunmaker, Halberdiers, Empire Knights, Empire Knights, Carl Franz, and a Lifecaster. Dwellers below. And regrowth. A uh, little note. You don't want to take two expensive spells and then a lore passive of any lore, not just life, but you're not going to get enough casts of these spells to make life bloom worth it. Just a heads up. If you want build on optimizations. Franz lands in front of the Skin Wolf Airkin and uh, the Skin Wolves. Now maybe his Spearmen will be able to help him out, but he is not going to enjoy this fight whatsoever. Norskin Mammoth Lord is trying to get through the Spearmen and get some good damage in somewhere else. And the Skin Wolves tore through the front line, but are very much regretting it and starting to pull away from all these Halberdiers and stuff. Not having a good time. Other people not having a good time is the Beast of Tashnar getting cleaved and the Maws of Savagery stuck fighting Spears. So overall, a kind of a tough start here for Norska. This is the one thing going their way is sniping out Franz. We'll see if the Skin Wolf Werekin can regen up throughout the fight, but if Franz gets a big, meaty regrowth right now, he'll be just fine with what's going on. In comes the Mist Stalkers, but there is the regrowth we were hoping for. Overcast regrowth onto Franz. He'll be full HP and fine with it. But the Sunmaker is offline. It's a very expensive piece that didn't get to do a lot because his opponent didn't really bring much infantry for it to slay. Silverbull is trying to get free, and Carl Franz is landing on the Chieftain right now, then he takes off. He decided he didn't want it. He didn't want that that noise. Spirit Leech onto him is good use of their time. Silver Bolt shooting the Marauder Chieftain. I'm shocked how many of them still miss a Mammoth. Do you see all those bullets going past it? It's a Mammoth, for God's sakes. It's the size of a building. Mist Stalkers use their terror to get through the Spearmen, though the Hand Gunners have turned. Can they get a good volley off? Yes. The answer is yes. Franz lands on the Deathcaster, though, and snipes him out, like, immediately. Ooh, that is a really good play here. 
I like it. I like it a lot. Halberdier still fighting back against the Marauder Chieftain and the Skin Wolves. The front line of the Empire is overall holding quite nicely. The Monster Mash of Norska is not beating out the state troops just yet. Mist Stalkers walk right up to the Silver Bullets and will take them down. And we do have a lot of healing here for Norska still. Skin Wolves, Skin Wolf Werekin, all this stuff doing okay. The Skin Wolf Werekin again finds his way onto Franz. He is surrounded by Marauder Horsemen throwing X as well, but if Franz just gets one big hit on the Skin Wolf he can take him out. But he doesn't want that noise. He wants to get away from the Marauder Chieftain as fast as possible. Marauder Chieftain just has 10,000 HP and Franz only has 3,000 right now. So even though his stats are better and like he can win the duel against him like pound for pound, you're fighting a lot more poundage. Good charge in from the Empire Knights. Going to get good damage on the Skirmish Cav and also saved Franz. Franz is up in this guy. For the Empire, we have a lot of state troops left. Most of their ranged has been shut down by Norska, which is good for Norska. But yeah, it'll be a slow attrition of feeding state troops into the pyre while Franz hopefully gets some good snipes out here and there. Regrowth healing him up yet again as he dives onto the Shaman Sorcerer Death. He misses the first attack because the Shaman got knocked down, hits the second one, and will route that Shaman yet again. Now Galmaraz and Foe Seeker are popped. Knocks the Shaman away, but he is surrounded again by those Skirmish Cav, and Skim Wolves and the Skim Quirkin are nearby to punish him even more. And Franz's heal cap is here, so we really can't get that much more healing. Hellion, you were expecting more champions. The Sunmaker's very sad. That's fair, my friend. That's fair. The Lifecaster throws himself into the fray to try and save Franz. Doesn't look like it's going to work. Skin Wolves will poke him a little bit. Deathcaster's back once more. If he routes any more time, he'll just shatter. We'll see if that even matters. Oh, what happened to the Miststalkers while I wasn't looking? These guys got rolled. They don't have the slow healing of uh, Skin Wolves, so they can't just bank on that for late game. But a Spirit Leech Overcast, that killed the caster? It did. The Spirit Leech Overcast killed the caster. You'll love to see it. Anyway, it did poke Franz down enough to get him to route in front of these Marauder Horsemen Throwing Xs and the Skin Wolf Werekin. So Franz is probably off the map for now, and the Skin Wolf Werekin takes exception to what is going on. As the Silver Bullets try and save Franz, he is going to make sure they never do anything ever again. Slap. Carnage. Oof. But Franz is dead. Without him, the Empire's leadership will spike downwards. Silver Bullet should be running from the Square Kin any second now. Big Spooky Mammoth standing in a giant pile of spears. But that is a big mammoth. Look at him. Look at how big he is compared to these boys. Goes straight through him. Mist Stalker's still taking a lot of damage. The Mist Stalkers are out of here. The Mammoth is whittling down. We still have the Maws of Savagery. Armored Skin Wolves take a charge with the Empire Knights. Empire Knights get decent damage on the charge, but they should lose overall to this armored, armor-piercing, anti-large, regening monster. And they're just poor Cav. Water Chieftain is terror routing and routing off the Halberdiers. The Spearmen still poke his little bum. He's lost about 1,000 HP since we last really checked in on him. And a regrowth is here for the Empire Knights, and it's an overcast to regrowth too. Which actually healed them up quite a lot. Empire Knights are in. The Empire is just having serious issues with DPS. Because, like, look at all this healing still happening. Skin Wolves, Skin Wolves, Skin Wolves, Trolls. Skin Wolf Werekin is somewhere healing. So Norska is just slowly healing up, man. As the Skin Wolves pursue something. Oh, they're pursuing the uh, Overcast of Regrowth Empire Knights. Terror Out wears off. And then the Skin Wolves catch back up and claw through some fools. That's looking like GG. I'm going to fast forward for just a second while Norska cleans up this stuff in the backfield and the Empire reforms lines. I'll slow back down when the fight's about to commence. All right, Skin of Werekin charges in to break the charge defense, and then his, his boys are going to follow up. So in he is. Albert's poking at him as more come in. The wolves are back in town. The wolves are back in town. It's a very different song, but it was there. Everything's routing. The mammoth is here, lurking, ominously staring down at the fools who dare oppose him. And he somehow managed to miss all those spearmen. Alright, so the Mammoth is uh, underwhelming me right now. There we go, he finally got a real charge. But he missed several attacks on the spearmen in a row. 
Empire Knights still chasing around the Marauder Horsemen, throwing axes. Several bullets actually managed to rally in the far, far, far distance. But I don't think these swordsmen and tattered souls can carry. The halberdiers would need to be much healthier to be able to kill all this stuff. Look at all these almost heel capped skin wolves and trolls and shit. Times two speed through an infantry grind as we see whether or not the Empire has the stats. That's, that's all it is. It's not a lot to really analyze. And yeah, he'll just F out. Good Norse can win. You don't see it. Ugh! Stretch! Woo! Woo! That was a weird build. Hmm. Mixed value overall. The skin wolves coming in clutch as they usually do. Wow, Marauder Horse and Throwing Axe is 1900 value. That must have been from Franz. For Hellion, Franz did all right. He had some good snipes, but uh, yeah, the Sunmaker, as he noted in chat, just had literally nothing to do this entire game. Empire Knights were played with well. Halberdiers were chilling. Spearmen were chilling. One of the Spearmen got a thousand value. But it's tough. It's tough, my friends. I'm going to grab something to drink before we cast this very strange Vampire Coast build. Very strange. Beer me! Tangle up in my wires. What do we got? What do we got, lads? So, for the High Elves of Incars, we have Alien Reaver archers in the Vanguard. Some silver helms, a crap ton of archers, which is always great for the Vampire Coast. The Coast hate dealing with archers. Then we have Rangers, Spearmen, and a Firecaster for Hogger's Pride. Love it. Great build. On the other side, we have double Death Streak Terror Guys, one of which has Luther Harkon on it. We have some deck droppers with handguns, four of them. A bunch of handguns mobs, regular mobs, and a death a vampire's caster with just invocation to heck up in the trees. This is a very strange build. This is strange. I don't think it is very competitive or strong, but I do think it is funny. I think it is funny. Deshri Terror Guys trying to clear out Lava and Sea Guard while the handguns offer a little bit of support. We have already lost one handgun deck dropper in the distance, and the Alien River Archers are now going into melee. With these, uh, the Hanga mobs in the back line. Terror Guy's starting to take big damage as Luther has also landed, but the Rahagra's Pride are going to charge him. Do some damage to that lad. Archers have killed off one of the handgun bats. Another handgun bat's about to go down soon. Why do I have a ping? Sorry, I got a ping and I was confused by it. All right, Destry Terror Geist number one, just about toast. Overcast and Invocation to Heck trying to keep it in the fight. Luther's doing fine. And overall, the Vampire Coast backline is getting rolled right now. Archers, archers, archers. That's how you beat the coast, archers. Hey, human boy, how do you beat the coast, archers? But what about archers? I was thinking, no, whatever you're thinking was wrong, it's archers. All the deck droppers are dead. One of the terror guys is actually dead, and that is a GG. I was curious if the terror guys would do anything. They did not. I imagine he probably took him to deal with. Um, probably took him to deal with Imric, though. To be fair. But what if I was thinking archers? I would disagree. We have Nick Klaus versus Perry Post. I would disagree with archers, but like, if you must go with archers, then maybe go with some rather than none. 
Another High Elf game, but that's kind of the theme of today is High Elf games. But we have Kairos! Kairos Fate Reaver is back, baby! Back from the dead! And by the dead, I mean I banned his ass in most tournaments, but he's back now because he lost regrowth, thank god. So we have Kairos with his net, the Gaze of Fate, and we have double Changebringer to try and get some snipes out. Other than that, we have Marauders, Soul Grinder of Zinch, Chaos Warriors of Zinch with Halberds, and some Screamers of Zinch. I lost my camera again for a second, but it's back, so it's fine. This is a super snipe-heavy build for Zinch. On the other side for the High Elves, we have Dragon Princes and Rahagra's Pride in the forest. We have Imric, the target of said sniping. And then Silver and Guard, White Lines of Krace, Sisters of Avalorn, including the Towns of Torquilate. Ooh. Towns of Torquilate are not to strap on. I thought that was the Evergreen's Court Guard for a second. Bob and Sea Guard and a Lifecaster. So actually, it's funny that we brought the full Zinch snipe build versus a very elite High Elf build. So it's kind of like both sides are teeny tiny. Yeah, these are small builds, man. Imric gets a breath attack down the Changebringers, doing so much damage to them. And they did not do a lot of damage to him. He does have impressive fire and missile resist stats. So unfortunately, the first net did not go Zinch's way. The Soul Grinder, I love this target selection. Sniping out the Mage of Life is huge. Instead of dealing with Imric twice, just kill the Mage of Life. And the Soul Grinder is really good at hitting foot characters. Most things, being a foot character makes you tankier, but Soul Grinder of Zinch doesn't care, and I think that's fine. The Soul Grinder of Zinch is a strong unit, but I don't think it's overpowered now that Regrowth got taken away from Zinch. The Soul Grinder's just, like, good. Alright, Chromatic Abominations and these Halberds trying to hold against the Dragon Prince and Rahagra's Pride charge. But Rahagra's Pride with that roar already almost getting the Marauders to leave. Not quite, and we do see Screamers coming in on the rear, so it looks like the High Elves know they need to just get out of here. The Changebringers had a bad, bad time. So far for the High Elves, they've gotten some good damage onto the Changebringers. And that's about it, actually. On the side of Zinch, they're almost done killing the Mage of Life. She probably has to regrowth herself. You gotta regrowth yourself or you're gonna route, and if you route, you can't save yourself at all, and Soul Grinder's gonna finish you off. She doesn't look like she has the will to do it, though. Imric's full health again. Did you regrowth Imric? No, oh, no, he didn't need it. He didn't need it at all. He was barely damaged from that first fight. Ah, oh, shit. Mage of Life is routing, which means one more volley, and she's dead, and she can't even attempt to dodge it. Dun, 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 He's obstructed barely. Da -da 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 -da. She's back. Regrowth yourself or do something. You're gonna die. Meow. She's dead as hell. All right, the high elves are out. A healer. Oh, and the change for Gavali is big damage. It is big damage. Goodbye, Sisters of Avalon. Goodbye, Towns of Torquilada. Zinch is overpowered. There's nothing the high elves could have done this game. It was unplayable from the start. This shit is broken. God damn, son. God damn. Dragon Princes and Rahagra's Pride still charging around as best they can. They're getting decent damage on the Marauders, even a little bit on the Blue Horrors, but... They're just... They're gonna lose the War of Attrition at this point. Zinch is gonna cut you out really hard, and you can't heal up anything. Dragon Princes and the Rahagra's Pride get surrounded by the Screamers and the Shrieking Sky Rays. That'll probably be GG. The Changebringers don't give no fucks. Changebringers don't give no fucks! I'm just fast forwarding because I feel like this shit is, is the most over anything's ever been in my entire life. Hyle's moving up now. Bolt of Change hits Imric in the back of the head. Gets a little meansy weensy breath attack, and the white lines of Kraser are here to do some damage. Imric himself lands on the Soul Grinder. The Changebringers are just killing off all the archers in the background. Verona's Time Warp is cast on all these Halberds to give him even more melee stats. And the Changebringers are here to seal the deal. Yeah, you're right, though. They really don't do much damage to Imric because of his fire resist and missile resistance. Well played to, to Nick Klaus. Perry played, played all right. I think he really needed to realize much faster what a disadvantage he was at in the range game and move up. He needed to move up much more aggressively and get his archers into range of the Chaos Warriors and the Blue and the blue Horrors. 
so that he can pressure him and force the change bringers to either come back and then you can counter fire against them or just make Zinch play without the change bringers at all. And of course, obviously the one I was focusing on, he needed to regrowth his own caster to save her from uh, Soul Grinder. Cool. All right, let's 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 jump down to the middle. We'll get some middle gameplay. More High Elves. More High Elves. Dark Elves each. Fuck it. Heimdallar versus Zero. Let's go. More Blue Scribes. Someone was angry at me earlier for skipping Blue Scribes. I didn't skip all of them. Here's your second Blue Scribes replay of the day. I love how Zero has a full DLC army except for the two Screamers. The two Screamers are the only base game Zinch Unity brought. Okie dokie. Dark Elves versus Zinch. We have the Ravagers of Rakarth, Arawar, Scourge Runner Chariot, and then another Scourge Runner Chariot. We have some Cold One Knights, Harpies, Marathi with Soul Stealer, Melkoth, Center, Bound, Doombolt, and then a bunch of Dread Spears and Bleed Swords. On the other side for Zinch, we have the Change Bringers. Two Screamers, one of which is the Shri Shrieking Sky Rays. Two Centaurs of Zinch, a whole bunch of Zongors, a Chaos Lord of Zinch, and of course, the Blue Scribes. Blue Scribes use a Chill Wind to slow down the Scourge Runner Chariots and maybe let the Disc Lord get in there. The RORs DLC, true. True. Changebringers trying to light up this Harpy. And they do, but do they get enough damage out to get their leadership to, to, to fall away? No, it looks like they're going to hold on. And oh boy, Changebringers do a lot of damage, but they are so squishy. They lose a quarter of their HP on the charge of the Harpies, and that includes their barrier, too. Zero's in the chat right now. Hi, Zero. Zongors are creeping up on the Bleak Swords. They'll get there eventually as the Scourge Run Chariots kite away, though so far, Gas Lord of Zinch is just uh, teasing them a bit with his barriers. They'll wear off soon. Another Harpy Suicide Charge to hurt the Changebringers even more. They're down to about half HP. Let me get off some point blank volleys. That'd get them to safety. If the Scourge Around Chariots can get like two or more volleys off onto them, that would be quick pub. Santagoras of Zinch charging Cold One Knights, tearing them apart, but a Melkoth's plus, of course, the Cold One Knights just fighting back a little bit, has almost taken out one of the Centagoras of their own volition. Something is getting cast right here. Something terrible. Oh, it's her Doombolt. Got it. Doombolt down on these guys. As the blue scribes get, uh, what the hell is that? That's Kislev's wind spell. All right, there's a reason we don't see that spell ever. It sucks ass. Meanwhile, the harpy's persistence takes out the change bringers, which is a big, big win for the dark elves. They are very happy about that. Scourge and chariots all also offered a bit of fire, but it was mostly the harpy's sacrifice. I won't take that away from them. The blue scribes are now suffering a pretty bad fate as another Kislev spell, Hailstorm, comes out on the far side. This is just a Kislev caster. The blue sky, blue scribes just are in a Katarin confirmed. Centaurs overstayed their welcomes, however, and they were not able to kill off the Cold Knights, and they got surrounded by spears on both sides. That's one of the reasons I like Centaurs as a unit in the DLC. They're very strong in the right situation, but they're expensive, and if you misplay with them, you'll die so, so fast. Random Thunderbolt is out from the Blue Scribes. The Blue Scribes are honestly doing work this game with some jank-ass spells, but uh, they're getting some good casts out. I like it. Dark Elves are overall quite favored, and I definitely agree. Centaurs are gone. The Changebringers are gone. So, Dark Elf's feeling fine. Chaos Source the Lord almost done with the Harpies soon. These Harpies have just been annoying. They're keeping the Screamers busy instead of having the Screamers rear charging Cold Knights or chasing around the Scourge on Chariots or something. It's like the Screamers have just been trying to protect all of their Sky units, like the Blue Scribes and the Change Bringers from the Harpies, which they're doing, but like it's taking them so fucking long to do so. That the, the ground fight is going slowly in the favor of Zinch, but uh, Dark Elves are trying to bail it out with cycle charging and stuff. Because five Zongors will beat, like, five Bleak Swords and Dread Spears. Not much of a contest. Melkoths plus the Scourge Runner Chariot Volleys onto these Screamers, the Shrieking Skyers that are surrounding Marathi, is uh, is quite a lot of damage. 
Looks like a Soul Steel is getting thrown out to heal her, of course, but also to damage these fools. Change or die. Nice 20% damage resistance flat for these guys. Nice job, nice job. Zinch is blue, Kislev is also blue, makes sense to me. Ah, uh, see, that's why, Grieven, that's why you have the big brain and I have the small brain. Marathi dives down on the Shrieking Sky Race, trying to get them to Demonic Spilly Crumble. Harpy is still harassing the Screamers in the sky, and they're starting to actually win it for now. They are infantry sized, so the Screamers anti large does not help them whatsoever. Goodbye to the Shrieking Sky Race, goodbye to the other Screamers, goodbye to Zinch, as Army Losses takes. Shiggy Diggy coming in after I already said what you said, and you're trying to steal my credit, steal my thunder, as you've stolen everything from me. I do not appreciate it, and it makes me angry. Harpy's got pretty good value, Marathi got pretty good value too. For zero, it was a Chad build. It struggled. The Blue Scribes did fine. Screamers did alright. Changebringers, I like them in this matchup. I think they could be fine in this matchup. It's just... Heimdallar played great about shutting them down. It wasn't like Zero made a mistake bringing them or something. It was just really tough. He could maybe bring Furies to try and help defend him better against Harpies, but even I didn't expect Triple Harpy, and I didn't expect them to do that well. Grand Cathay versus Bretonia. Uh, that's Bahrain. Bahrain's in chat. There, we have a different Bahrain replay we can go to, but it's more fucking High Elves, man. It's not, High Elves aren't the worst. They're the worst. It's just like, if I have to cast anything too much, it gets, it gets a little sad. Bahrain on Lizards versus Parrier Post on the High Elves. Kai, I... You know what? I'll admit it. I'm pissed off at Parrier Post. You can't have a name like that and not take a Tyrion. Alright, Illyrian Reaver Archers start in the Vanguard, but so do Ripper Dactyl Riders that immediately catch them and are going to try and push those guys off the field. For the High Elves, we have Silver Helms, Dragon Princes, Imric, Rahagra's Pride, a front line of Spearmen and White Lines of Krace, and then some Aladdin Seaguard and a Lifecaster. And we used to have an Illyrian Reaver Archer. For Lizardmen, we have two Ripper Dactyl Riders, one of which is the ROR. Two cold one riders, two feral cold ones. A front line of Saurus and Skinks. Kind of mixed in there. Mostly Saurus, though. A Sacred Croc score and a Life Swan. I'll bring the Changeling next week. No! Cold one riders fight the Dragon Princes, and oh boy, that is not a close fight. The Dragon Princes are slamming them. Oh! Looks like now that the charge is wearing off, it's getting a little more even, but still, damn, dude. Calm down. Rahagra's Pride plus Imric dive onto these other Cold Ones and Feral Cold Ones. Feral Cold Ones are already terrorizing off. Terrorizing off. Cold One Rider's not feeling too hot about this either. But the Ripper Dactyls fly over. They want nothing to do with that in fights. Instead, they're just going for the Lothern Sea Guard. They're going to try and land on him. As a Slon throws his banishment onto the Lothern Sea Guard as well. But the High Elves have killed off the Cold Ones on that far side, and they can come rejoin the fight, countercharging these uh, Ripper Dactyls, hopefully. Other Cold One Riders are stuck fighting our Augur's Pride, so the High Elves are really holding down the fort on the sides quite well. Nice breath attack onto some Saurus, though I kind of wanted on that giant clump of Ripper Dactyls. I felt like it would have been rather pog. And that was not the player's fault, but Emmerich aimed for the stupidest model and completely missed. Slon Mage Priest of Life taking some damage. Of all things, a High Elf Lizardman game is skippable. Yeah, but I look at the builds too, and I like some of the builds. A bunch of Saurus and like Cold One Riders and shit versus High Elves taking some weird stuff. Alright, Imric is trying to dive the Slon Mage Priest of Life, and he's getting a lot of damage out. He is fully surrounded. He has Rahagra's Pride to help him out just a little bit, but he's getting big chunks out onto Lizard Boy. Meanwhile, Saurus are beating up that uh, High Elf front line. We talked about it earlier in the stream that I don't really like Saurus in this matchup. They will eventually beat the High Elf Spears, but that's not my point, is that they take too long to do so if the archers can keep firing. 
But uh, there were not 50 archers firing like last time. This time there was Imric running around, so it's a little more fun. Imric does route the Song Mace Priest of Life, though, so the High Elves took out the healing of the Lizardmen. If they can make sure that he goes off the map or straight up dies, that would be huge. But this has not been without cost. We lost Rahagra's Pride in there. You can see they're routing. We've lost a lot of the Sea Guard. We've lost most of the High Elf front line. So while Imric might take out the Life Slon, he's still going to have a lot of work left to do. Slon being a Slon is very hard for Imric to get to, but he finally figures his shit out and does a charge attack. He needs two more attacks to kill him off. And he might get him as the Ripperdactyls try and chase him around. High Elves trying to hold, but the Saurus are slowly getting through them, and Imric gets distracted, allowing the Slon to get a, a little bit of distance. Negative one leadership, which means if he gets distance away from Imric, yeah, he's going to rally. He'll rally like nobody's business. All right, Imric's free and clear to go get the life slon. Bounce power is starting to favor the hives a little bit. I disagree, but sure. I guess we still have some silver helms. Ah, one more hit onto the slon will do it. As Imric just shoves his nose into the chair. Yeah, dude. I, I fucking hate Slons. They need to redo their models so badly. I hate Slons. They're impossibly tanky in melee. It's it's so goddamn annoying. Anyway, I, I digress. Dragon Prince is trying to hold down the fort. Man, we could use a giant Imric breath attack onto this thing right now if he wasn't following a Slon off the battlefield because nothing can figure out how to hit Slons. This anger brought to you by brood horrors following slons off of many, many, many battlefields. <laughs> slons, you just, like, can't hit them a lot of the time. It's it's annoying. I hate slons. Fuck slons. And CA's like, hey guys, we have to buff some slons because Loremaster of Sotek said so. Boo. Oh, that's making me irate. He's just walking them off. God. Anyway, Saurus and Croxagoras surrounding the Life Mage do knock her down a peg. Silverhelm's trying to rejoin the fart. Uh, the fart, yes. The fight. Ripperdactyl's still routing off stuff. Oh! No, you let him come back that close to the edge of the map? Like, I get it. I get it. You wanted to actually kill him, and you were just following him. I get it, but you can't let him come back like that. Oh, god damn it, he has regrowth. This shit's over. It's over. It's over kingdoms. It's over kingdoms the maw. It's over kingdoms the campaign. It's over kingdoms DLC, all Noblar edition. It's, it's done. Nice breath attack onto Pasta Hunters, gets a little bit of damage, but it doesn't matter. Because it's over bulls with dual weapons. It's over bulls with iron fists. It's over bulls belchers. Are Slons the best lords of the game? Yes. By far, in my opinion. I think when Kairos had regrowth... Kairos is probably the best lord in the game, even with Slons being buffed, but after Kairos lost Regoth, it's probably Slons. Alright, this is over kingdoms, I can just fucking fast forward, nothing matters. Fuck Slons, dude. That was upsetting. Poor Perry. I, th I still think he would have lost that game. Because Bahrain had so much left, and it was just Emmerich. You could see what happened to Emmerich when he finally landed. The Salon didn't have anything to do with that. When Emmerich landed and he had no reinforcements left, the Lizardman just ate him alive. So I think I think Bahrain was going to win. It just t it just triggered my hatred of Salons, is why I kept talking about it. But like ba Bahrain played it great. His build was pretty good. Um, he got a good W. Even if Emmerich kills the Life Salon, the High Elves lose. For... Alright, there was a weird-ass K 
Chaos Dwarf one. Okay. For the Chaos Dwarves, zero, my boy, this is not legal. <laughs> I, I love you, this is not legal. <laughs> there are way too many single entities. You're limited to, I believe, four single entities. Fine. Actually, I have to check. It's been a while since I've run into this. And I get nervous. I forget things when I get nervous. Total single entities is four. What is a single entity? It's anything that has a model count of one. My bad, Zero? It's fine, dude. It's fine. Like I said, we take these new player tournaments pretty chill. Alright, so for this wild-ass Chaos Dwarves build, we have two Iron Demons, three Magma Cannons, a bunch of Chaos Dwarves Blunderbusses, Drives off the Ashen, and a Demon Smith Sorcerer. On the other side, oh, and we also have the Blazing Beards of Bazrock. On the other side, we have Zaytang, Crane Gunners, Jade Warrior Crossbows, and Jade Warrior Frontlines, Jade Lancers, Iron Hail Gunners, Yan Bo, and the Empress Croman, with some Peasant Horsemen in the Vanguard. The Magma Cannons are trying to outduel Zaytang, and let me tell you, it ain't gonna work. Christian? Yeah. But I feel like that's unrelated. I'm allowed to hate Salons and hate Toads that killed my grandparents. Like, both are true. You just followed unit caps? Zero? That's actually funny you mentioned that. That's so. Okay. Sorry, I'm going to pause it because I don't want to... I'm talking over this replay too much, but I'm not casting it enough. So I just want to answer this and I'll get on with it. Some people are like, why in multiplayer do you have specific unit caps? Why don't you just use unit caps that CA has? Because the CA unit caps are sometimes really fucking stupid. Like, I think with CA unit caps, you can legitimately make a Nurgle army with nine models. I think you can take Kugath, a Cultist on a War Shrine, Uncle Frunkle. Beasts of Nurgle, I don't think are SEs unless they changed that. But you could take five Beasts of Nurgle and it wouldn't stop your it wouldn't count as an SE for some reason. So that's eight. And then I think maybe there's one more you could do, like a Soul Grinder or something. But, like, yeah. So, CA's unit caps have some problems. <laughs> but this isn't OP. This is silly. If, if anything, I think this is, unfortunately for you, not a great build. As the Magma Cannons are going to do some damage, but in come the Peasant Horsemen to just stop you for a little bit. Zaytang is still trying to deal with the Iron Demon in the background. This is very funny. Peasant horsemen are not going to have a good time. They won't even do that much damage to the magma cannons, but they're stopping them from shooting for a little bit. You did recall 400 bottles in army? You did. You did. Also, this is the funny kind of thing. This is a funny little army. I love it. There are some that are not funny. There are some that are just stupid. All right, Peasant Horsemen are all pushed off, but the Empress Crowmen are here now as our blunderbusses fire over sideways. <laughs> the dwarves, they're just lighting up anybody that comes at them. <laughs> they're just... Oh my god! Oh, <laughs> fucking... The Gene Warriors are just getting melted, man. They're not taking that much damage, but it looks brutal. Like, this just, it just looks horrible to go into this stuff. The Empress Crowman land. Thankfully for them, the, the blunderbusses are choosing the worst targets to shoot at. They aren't shooting at the center of mass, they're shooting at some of the disparate little forces. Iron Demon in the background fighting some Jade Lancers. A Crane Gunner's trying to get in a position to shoot it, but the Empress Crowman get mulched by the blunderbusses, and they're demonic now, so they're gonna crumble real fast. There we go. We did lose a Magma Cannon. The Chorfs are still in it, however. Ah, oh, the Magma Cannon missed a point blank range. In cars? I think you might be full of silly. In comes Yambo. He's currently getting Spirit Leech. Magma Cannon misses again, because why wouldn't it? And then he lands. Zaytang continues to snipe out the Demon Smith Sorcerer. Say goodbye to some magma cannons. Things are starting to look a little rough for old Chorfos. This is going to be a beautiful side shot, but I don't think Zaytang's bow works that way. 
Oh, it does! Oh, that was so much damage! That's funny. Are Trorf trains limited to one? They were when Magma Cannons were like OP and Iron Demons were OP, but those times have passed. Now they're just like strong. Alright, Blunderbuss is not feeling too good. Demon's Source are not feeling too good. Balance Power shifted pretty heavily against the Chaos Works at this point, but it was a fun build. It was a fun build. That is going to be GG, so I'll hit fast forward at this point. But it was funny. I'll give you that. Zaytang, how are you doing on value, my friend? 2100. Honestly, not terrible. I kind of assumed he'd do a lot better than he ended up doing. Like, he's doing fine, but... Just would have thought. Should be OP. Sometimes you just need a little bit of love. I have a ping. Why? All right. Uh, I had a lot of things and stuff. Yeah, GG's. GG's. Alright, Dark Elves and Greenskins. Uh, what do I feel like casting right now? Bucket, Tomb Kings, Slanesh, send it. Pale Ale and a key. A Kairuichi. Samarik still taking Cetra. God knows why. If he's on his chariot, I'm going to be mad. Do you think the Dwarf Can's the best cans outside of Cathay's? Uh, outside of Cathay's, yes. But there aren't a lot of good cannons. <laughs> dwarf Cannons are, like, fine. I wouldn't put them in the good category. They are good versus very few things, but when they're good, they're quite good. Alright, for Samurik, his front line is Nekar Warriors and Skeleton Spearman, backed up by some Ushapti. We have triple Ushapti Great Bow, including the Chosen of the Gods. We do have more Skeleton Spearman and Tomb Guard of the Halberds. Then we have Setra the Imperishable on his chariot for 3,000 gold. We have Side Force Slanesh. We have an Exalted Keeper of Secrets of Slanesh with Pavain Acquiescence. We have some Chaos Spawn, some Devoted Marauders, and Chaos Warriors with their Hell Scourges, Chaos Knights, Marauder Horsemen of Slanesh. That is it. VP cans are so good? Uh, they're dog shit, but alright. I have never seen a VP cannon do well. Exalt the Keeper of Secrets is taking a lot of damage from new Shop to Great Bows on the way in. She's already down to half HP and falling. Uh, and I have a rules question. One second. What is it? It's actually 3,200 gold. It's so expensive. It's very expensive. Seductive Glory, the AoE Rampage of the Exalted Keeper is cast to pull Cetra back into the fight, but she is just going to flat out die from the Ushapti. I have also had this issue with the Exalted Keeper, where I feel like she just dies all the time. Her AoE Rampage is nice, but it's it's tough to keep her alive even to proc it. Pavain of Slanesh Rampage is the Tomb Guard of Halberds. I think that was a misclick. He's probably trying to get one of the Ushaptis not a random halberd back into the fight. And the cavalry of Slanesh are going to have to get involved. Nice rear charge onto the Skeleton Spearman. Exalted Keeper Secrets is trying to get in here. 
Ballet of Blows is active, but she gets... Mysterium Incantation Vengeance is not going to do too much damage to her. I guess it could be a good slow, but there's probably better targets to use it on, like the Chaos Knights. She is going to Demonic Hit's ability crumble here soon, however. Currently healing up just a little bit from her Feasting on Fear. There she goes. She is gone. Slanesh has lost their leadership and their caster. We shopped a great bow under attack by the Chaos Knights of Slanesh, but there's Spearmen and Cetra nearby to offer a little bit of aid. Meanwhile, the Chosen of the Gods shooting at other Chaos Knights. That's a great target for them. Chosen of the Gods of their spread missiles are great against cavalry. And Skeleton Spearmen get downhill charged by Marauder Horsemen in the rear, but Tomb Kings are way up on the balance of power, and I definitely agree. Losing your expensive void like that is quite brutal. Devoted Marauders and Chaos Warriors still grinding away with the best of them. The Tomb Kings are focusing on taking out some of the cavalry and just securing their mobility a little bit so they can kite back if they need to. And we still have the Ushapti Summon waiting to be used. What up, Bavara? How you doing? Nekar Warriors and Ushapti regulars fighting back against the, the hordes of Slanesh. We still have some Halberds. Bounce power is dangerously low for our friends Slanesh. Better Usarian's Incantation Vengeance on the Rider Horseman. Gonna push them off. Chaos Knight's also feeling the burn. That's honestly GG. I'll just fast forward at that point. As we watch Slanesh slowly grind through the Tomb King's front line only to lose. Damn, Exalted Keeper. You tried to do something. GG to Samurai. I mean, like, played it solid, kept all this shit safe, but look at those who shopped your values. Yeah, they carried. Doing good, having exams? Uh, just finished my last week of work at my current job. Let's get the Rogue Idol game. Let's fucking do it. Buttonized Mark versus Akariuchi. I would have skipped this if not for the Rogue Idol. I would have. Because it's Hero Hammer. The easiest way to get me to lose interest in a replay is Hero Hammer. Are you having a vacation between jobs? Uh, a couple weeks, but it's mostly to move. Grace and I are moving soon. So we gotta pack our shit up and get up to the a different city before we start work. Alright, Greenskins versus Dwarves. Night Goblin Archers and the Rusty Errors. We have a Night Goblin War Boss with his Rampage and his Net. We have Death Creepers and Morgan's Winter Marauders to ROR Skirmish Cav. Four Rock Lavas, one of which is the Hammer of Gork. And Squigs and Goblins... Orc Shaman with Brain Burster, and uh, here we go. The Swamp Things and the Rogue Idol. On the other side for the Dwarves. A bunch of Miners with Blasting Charges. Slayers. Longbeards with Great Weapons. Thane, Grombrindle, and another Thane. And then their own Goblobber Grudge Thrower. That is currently fucking up the Goblin Rock Lobos. In go the Squigs and the Goblins. But Miners with Blasting Charges go boosh. Miners of Blasting Charges go boosh. Miners of Blasting Charges go boosh. Let me see it. Give me that last boosh. Grompy's about to get clapped, so we'll see both at the same time. Never mind, Rogue Idol's just walking into him. But with the Miners of Blasting Charges, man, the Greenskins have already lost most of their front line. Rogue Idol's stomping around. He manages to miss Grom Brendel with 100 weapon strength and bonus versus infantry, but sure. And the Goblaba needs to refocus onto uh, Goblin Rock Lavas that are not currently routing. Grombrindel and his Longbeards fighting back against these uh, Swamp Things Goblins and the Rogue Idol. You'd die laughing if the Rune Golem was a Rogue, rogue Idol painted gold. That would actually be fucking hilarious. I'm down for that. What's the limit on Grails and Hippos?
Alright. Some, someone keeps asking me rules stuff about a game they're playing right now, so it is important. Rogue Idol's still trying to deal with Grombi. Meanwhile, the dwarves are punching through the front line like nobody's business. They're rolling these goblins. Slayers might want to just die for the cause and run at the hammer of Gork and these other artillery pieces. Oh, there's a gyrocopter. Hello, gyrocopter. I missed you. Rogue Idol's still trying to kill Grombi. It's missing a, a strange amount of attacks, uh, attacks on Grombrindle. He gets Rampage to lower his melee defense. In comes a big shot. Again, the Rogue Idol is missing. Swamp Thing's taking a lot of damage. Rogue Idol's still trying to snipe out Grom Brindle. Meanwhile, Orc Shaman is in a fight with the Thane and some miners. The dwarves do need to be spreading out a little bit more and really taking down these rock lavas and stuff. Too many of them are like clumping around this fight, for example. Thankfully for them, their Gob Lava is doing really well versus the, the Goblin Rock Lava. That's not confusing at all to say it back to back. Fanes and Dwarves running around, still trying to disrupt all of the green skins. We still have the Longbeards fighting alongside Grom Brindle to beat up these Goblins and the Swamp Things, but Grombi was not enjoying this. Tormentor Sword's going to net him in place as the Rogue Idol tries to get over to him. Maybe it'll clap those cheeks. Nope, gets distracted. Nope, it'll clap them cheeks. Nope, gets distracted. Nope, it'll clap them cheeks. Or will it? Don't you worry, gang. It'll do it someday. Clap. Those. Cheekers. Nope, nope. The goblins and the orc shaman are just standing around watching the rogue idol struggle to do anything. He's just kind of walking around. Gyrocopter's trying to harass the goblin rock lavas. Meanwhile, more dwarves in other places still push off a lot of the green skins. Grombrindle's pretty low. Runex of Grombrindle does provide that uh, discourage. Rampage holds him in place as the rogue idol belly flops. I don't know if it hit him or not. I feel like it would have done more damage than that. But he's still trying to figure it out. There we go. That was a hit. Grombrindle is unbreakable. So he doesn't care. He'll, he'll keep going to the very end. And yeah, what else is going on around here? Goblob is still chucking at stuff. Thane's chasing things around. Archer's kiting out the dwarves. That is a big problem for the dwarves. Melee rush is that they're just so slow that they get kited even by like foot archers. That's why usually dwarves have to play on the defensive, is just they can't chase anything down. Is the rogue idol ever worth it with that price? I like it versus the Warriors of Chaos, specifically. That's probably the only time I'd take it. Grombrindel still fighting it out. He's doing actually surprisingly poorly against stuff, too. Like, I thought he would be doing better against the rogue idol and the shaman and all this stuff, but he's actually just doing fucking nothing. Which is a shame. Dwarves continuing to pile up on the rogue idol. Try and poke it down. They're out the swamp things again. I keep losing sound every so often. I don't know if it's the game or my headset. What about against VC? Oh, I hate it against VC. In theory, it'd be good, but it just kind of sucks. It just takes too long to do anything, and VC can back off and heal and charge it again and stuff. Brain Boasted down onto all these dwarves who are piling up around the rogue idol. Grom Brindle finally died. The greenskins are up on balance of power, but they've just been kiting the dwarves out. Your cam died for a minute? Yeah, I bumped it with my foot. That's on me. Swamp Fangs running back into gyrocopter fire as a wah is out. And the rogue idol continues to bop. Oh, there we go. Thane friend finally getting what Grom Brindle couldn't. And uh, beating up this Orc Shaman actually is real, real good. Kicked his ass. He's shattered. Get a Rampage. Uh, fermented Fungi under the Gyrocopters. Let's go. Brings those guys down to 
the swamp things where they will hopefully die. Bounce power is still attainable here for the dwarves. Marker's Midgey Marauders out of ammo and pushed off. Night Goblin, the Rusty Errors kiting away from the Thane. We still have the Longbeards fighting back against the Greenskin Tides. They don't care, man. They don't care about nothing. Gyrocopters with that rear shot might actually cause a mass route here. Say goodbye to your leadership, little greenskins. Gyrocopters, don't shoot at the war boss. You're not the brimstone guns. You don't snipe single entities very well. Just keep hurting the leadership of these fools. No, stop shooting at the war boss. Stop it. You're not going to do damage to him. Fuck him. The rock lava is firing over at the rusty errors, getting good damage onto them. Oh, the flag is way out of position. I was wondering why it was so far off. Bop! That was a good hit, actually. That was a real good hit. Morgan's Mansion Marauders routing nearby while getting hit with artillery might actually cause the rusty errors to route off the map. We'll see. Rogue Idol's getting a little dangerously low. And the gyrocopters might route the swamp things again. That might be the third time they've routed, so that could shatter them. Nope, just a second time. Things are getting a little spooky scary here. On the side of the greenskins. Oof. Yeah, big damage on the rusty errors. Routes them off. And the gyrocopter is going to follow the swamp things. Good stuff, good stuff. Good plays. Can the rogue idol beat armored infantry? The literal thing it's designed to beat. That's a good start. The rusty errors are back for now. Though another gob lava shot's coming in for him. Eh, they lived. And now they'll probably go stock, so they actually can't be killed. This Thane needs to just rejoin the fight with the rogue idol. This Thane can't spend his time chasing around the rusty errors. It's not going to go anywhere. Oh! That was big damage. Longbeards, though, with their natural ITP ain't going nowhere. They are still fighting to chip down the rogue idol. And the swap things rally in front of the gyrocopters. One of the gyros is actually down in melee with them. That's how hard they were trying to chase these guys off, and it just didn't work out. Terror out in from them to push the gyros off the map, and that is a disaster for the dwarves. Nothing they can do about it, though. It's just that kind of weird thing where, like, balance of power sometimes dictates whether or not things will keep routing. Rock Lava pushes off the Death Creepers, but the Rogue Idol gets rid of both Longbeards. And then the Night Goblin War Boss also takes them off. Ooh, and a Terror out in on the Thane. The Rogue Idol all of a sudden coming to play. And now it is simply the Rock Lava with two volleys left and a just above half HP Thane versus a Rogue Idol, a Night Goblin War Boss at full HP, and a Regenerating Troll in the distance, and a Regenerating Cav. And there's a good hit in. He does have Deadly Onslaught pops. Nice shots from the Goblin Rock Lava getting like 400 damage out, which is quite nice. But there, the Rogue Idol hits the Thane in the face. And that is GG. Hi, Mr. Casual. Nice job from Mark. It was a silly build. Akai also had a silly build. They were creative. I just, like, I have a hard time being excited about dwarves. Even when they rush, because their rush is just, like, so slow that it's like, yes, heavily armored infantry slowly waddling after things everywhere. Mm -hmm. Excitement. Thrill. Feckin' dwarves. We got more replays to go. We have one hour left before I have to leave. What do we do? Let's do this one. Bahrain versus Niklaus. I want to see some Peg Knights. Ugh! Peg Knights versus Cathay! We love Peg Knights versus Cathay. Bahrain versus NC's Niklaus. 
a nice static box can be exciting. I do think that at least with the Dwarven box playstyle, you get a lot of Daka, which I find interesting. But their rush, like, is just slow. It's just a very slow rush. Alrighty. For the forces of Bretonia, we have a Pegasus Knight that's having a bad day. Another Pegasus Knight, Royal Hippogriff Knight, Lewin. And then some Knights of the Realm and Questing Knights on the ground. Some Peasants, some Archers, and a Damsel of Life. On the other side for Bretonia, not Bretonia, Grand Cathay, we have one Grand Cannon, Zaytang, some Jade Lancers, Peasant Long Spears, Jade Word Crossbows, Iron Hill Gunners, Halberds, and then a Yin Caster Towns Knight and Ancestral Warrior Summon. Zaytang correctly aiming at the Damsel of Life first to take out Bretonia's healing. As he slowly pushes down the Damsel of Life. Who actually didn't bring regrowth. She brought Earthblood and Dwellers Below. But yeah, Zaytang is just going to snipe her out. This is always the right thing to do is to aim for the caster first as Zaytang. She's already close to routing. Peggy Peg Knights try and land on the Iron Hail Gunners. And they do, but some Jade Lancers get in the way a little bit. And Zaytang is going to keep making sure the Damsel stays routing. Nice shot. Should route her even further. And Lewin and the Hippogriff Knights are actually landing on Zaytang to try and save her. The Pegasus Knights are going to die to these Peasant Longspears super fast. These other Pegasus Knights get killed by the Jade Lancers and Peasant Longspears coming in. And now the Bretonian Knights are trying to get in, but of course there are more Peasant Longspears. The Questing Knight's going to get rolled. Ohio's Tomb King's replay wasn't very good to see. I did pretty bad. Oh, okay. I can skip it if you want. Questing Knight's trying to get in here. Ancestral Warrior Summon is out, though, to hurt them even further with that armor piercing and uh, frostbite. Goodbye to the Questing Knights. Goodbye to the Pegasus Knights. Goodbye to more Pegasus Knights. And this is a, a bit of a slaughter here. Lewin is doing okay, surrounded by Jade Warriors and stuff, but uh, he's Lewin, so he could just path through them and not take any damage. Look at him. He's not taking any damage walking through these halberds. I hate Lewin. I want to like Lewin, but they overbuffed him and they overbuffed Bretonia in general. Lewin's ridiculous now. Iron Hail Gunner is shooting at the Hippogriff Knights as they try to get into the air. They're taking a lot of damage, though, from the Ancestral Warriors frostbiting them. Zaytang even smokes him a little bit. Balance power shifting too far away from Bretonia, and I must agree. Lewin tries to land one more time. He will harass Zaytang, but Zaytang gets another shot off on the Damsel of Life, routing her yet again. Not shattering her just yet, but routing her. Over and over. Hippogriff Knights are gone. Quest Knights are trying to come back in. Lewin has landed in all of these spears and cavalry and everything. Cathay is winning the front line too. Of course, of course, uh, they should. Versus like four regular ass peasant mobs. Come on. Zaytang's just shooting at Questing Knights in the meantime. Damsel of Life looks to be dead. And in comes an Ancestral Warrior Summon that should put the nail in the coffin for this game as it kills the Questing Knights, kills the Royal Hippogriff Knights, and then army losses should take them all out. Well, Hamas do if this game and get a busted trait rework next. And the next, though the next most complete roster after Lizards and CA doesn't plan Brett and Lizardman DLC soon. Skaven on that list. I mean, I'd be sad. You never want your faction to be bad. But you never want your faction to be too good either, because then it'll just get banned so much you'll never get to play it. Alright. GG. Good counter build versus Bretonia here from Nick Klaus. Grand Cannon, Jade Lancers did fine. Zaytang did fine. GG. Skaven still needs Thankful. It's true. It's true. So I need to get rid of Tomb King's High Elves, apparently. Alright. 
seems fine. Corn Lizard Man. I can do that. With Pale Ale versus Zarkas. Devoted Legion of Killers, I do not ask you to fight. I am Four corn. We have a bunch of dogs. Flesh hounds of corn, four of them, one marauder horse with throwing axes, four minos of corn, one with great weapons, some chaos knights, and Valkia. Uh, that troop count is too low from Samurai, by the way. You do need at least 400 models, but we're pretty chill about it in new player tournaments. On the other side, for Lizardmen, we have a bunch of Feral Cold Ones, Skinks, Cohorts. Wait, yeah, the Court of Sotek, another Red Crest Skink, Ancient Salamander, two of those. A bunch of Skink Skirmishers, one Temple Guard, and a Salon of Life with a Croc score or two. Okay. I'm a little worried about this corn build with no infantry to support them at all. Feral Cold Ones are ignoring the fact they got charged by Chaos Knights of Corn. They're getting run down by Flesh Hounds, so. These two Feral Cold Ones are a bit out to dry. If possible, they need to fall back to their infantry support. Because Lizardmen, Lizardmen here are getting pulled out a little bit too much. Like, they're, they're separating a lot of their armies and involved in the fight, but they keep committing more and more resources to a losing fight. Jeremy, are you winning? Um, probably. Feral Cold Ones, both of them are routing. The Skink Skirmishes have moved up to offer a little bit of supporting fire, but another Skink Cohort is going to die. Spear Slopnir went through three Skink units, while Minotaur is charging a big old blob. That's unfortunately not the best, though I did just notice that we have two Ancient Salamanders versus a build with literally no infantry, so those Ancient Salamanders are going to have next to nothing to do, unfortunately, for themselves. So Korn might be fine here. Again... He needs more models. He only has 300, and uh, the limit is 400, but whatever. Flesh Hounds and Chaos Knights pulling around. Croc Scores just arrived at the fight with their little skink companions. Valky actually just straight up lands on the Slong, gets some good damage out. Skink Skirmishes are going to try and peel her off, but they have a hard time dealing damage to someone so small, high armor, and bronze shielded. Ancient Salamanders firing a point blank range actually gets decent damage. That's interesting. Yeah, she's just after the slon. Minos are cleaving through all the skinks. So far, haven't taken too much damage. Now, the Temple Guard being here might actually get some good work done as the Minos keep trying to pile into the Temple Guard. Temple Guard need to hold their ground, though. They can't get distracted. If they go back for Valkia, they won't do too much damage to her, but they're also let the Minos through. Because they're right now getting an amazing trade into the Minotaurs, so they need to just stay here. As much as it sucks what's happening in the Salon, someone else has to deal with the Salon. Maybe the Croxors can go, but the Temple Guard need to stay in the fight with the, the Minos. Blood Statue of Spite onto Valkia the Bloody. It does not do a lot of damage to a single entity. It is a multi-entity model killer. Meanwhile, in the distance, we still have Skink Skirmishers and Skinks and Croxors fighting the Flesh Hounds and stuff. That is what it is. Man, look at the Temple Guard value onto uh, these Minos. 1,300 and climbing, but the Minos are all getting nice and low. Regrowth will try and save the Salon. Meanwhile, Flesh Hounds chase off more Skinks in the distance. Lizardmen are a little down in the balance of power, and I would tend to agree. We'll see what the Temple Guard can do. This replay is only to see the Salon suffering. More Temple Guards still cleaving through Minos. And now Korn is falling behind the balance of power as the Salon is still healing up. He's on fire, so that healing is reduced by quite a bit. But healing is healing, and he'll take it if he can. Two out of the four Minos are routing right now. It looks like a third is about to join them. Fourth is doing fine on leadership, but not so well on HP. And the Salamanders are still firing away in here. Skinks and Crocscores push off the Flesh Hounds and Chaos Knights in the distance. How effective is the new Temple Guard passive next to the Lord? What is it again? Uh, cause fear, immune to psychology. It's pretty whatever. Yeah, it's pretty whatever. Then having Guardian and Predatory Fighter is more important. All of the Minos of Corn are pushed away by those Temple Guard. 2,300 value in climbing for them. 
Flesh Hounds of Corrin now in the fight, but as long as the Slon sits on top of his Temple Guard and just heals up, he's gonna win this game. Yeah, Lizards are starting to rally around the battlefield. Corrin's running out of gas. Croc scores get a fight with the Chaos Knights. In the distance. Apparently you don't fuck with Temple Guard, guys. There goes the Flesh Hound. Other Minos trying to peel off these skinks with the help of Valkia. And that's about it. I'm gonna fast forward as this one is over as hell. Healing strong. Slons are also very, 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 very strong. Minos tried. They were doing okay, and then they piled in the Temple Guard, and that was the end of them. For Zarkus, I really like that he didn't get baited into pulling his Temple Guard away from an extremely profitable fight. And instead just used other stuff to try and peel a Slon. That was good patience. Liked it. Good build. GG. G. G. -G. Sure. We'll do some Hohenheim versus Corvus Glaive. More High Elves. More High Elves versus Chaos Dwarves. Chaos Dwarves not bringing a caster. Zatan is not a caster. As much as, honestly, sometimes I glance at him and I think he's a caster, but he's not. So we have Zatan with all of his abilities, including his very, very short-range net, but it is a net. He is on his Lama Su mount, so he has Withering and a Feebling Foe. We have some Bull Centaur Renders, the regular version. We have Chaos Dwarf Blunderbusses, Chaos Dwarf Warriors, some with great weapons, some without. And aside for the High Elves, one Eagle Claw Bolt Thrower, two Sisters of Avalorn, one of which is the Ever Queen's Court Guard. Then we have Silver and Guard, White Lines of Krace, Spearmen, and then an Arch, an Arci Mago Vita, which means an Archmage of Life in Italian. I believe it's Italian. He does cast a net. It's true, but it's not. That's not. That's not a spell. Sisters of Avalorn throwing their sparkly glitter wands at the, the Castor of Blunderbuss. It's already that unit's down to half HP-ish. I'm just getting raked over the coals. Other, other Blunderbuss firing up the hill at these spearmen. The Blunderbusses really don't do that much damage to infantry of that range. One Blunderbuss is out of the fight. Now the Hiles brought zero cavalry. Oh, they have the Fireborn. I missed those. Okay, I was going to say. Bull Centaur Render should be uncontested on the sidelines. They should still do fine into the Fireborn, honestly, but not with Archer support. Fireborn get a lot of damage out on the charge. When their charge bonus wears off, the Bull Centaur Render should start to do better, but actually they're just getting trucked on the whole time. Damn. Oh. Oh, Bull Centaur Renders only have 50 armor. Never mind. Never mind. Fireborn will beat them up. Because Fireborn don't have armor piercing, but they have insanely high stats. And if you don't have armor, you're dead. Zatan has tried to land in the Sisters of Avalorn and stop their, their horrendous massacre of his forces. This Blunderbuss is still trying to move up before officially dying off. We still have one Bill Centaur Render doing well, but the other one behind me is probably just actually dead. Yeah, it's dead. Zatan pops his net onto the Arch uh, Mage. The Withering also lowering her armor and leadership and melee defense. It does not matter. He is still losing that duel, and Silver and Guard are going to poke him in the butt. This is looking like a very one-sided high elf victory. The front line is holding just fine. Their archers are winning. Their lord is winning, and they have a caster the enemy does not. That is going to be a GG. You gotta break a caster. You got it. Burning Head is really good at clearing out uh, high elf front lines. Archers are just gonna slowly fire in. This Bull Centaur render is getting slowly poked down as the Fireborn have chased him down. The Fireborn probably got a ton of value killing two Bull Centaur renders. Yeah, 2,200. Lamasus are so bad, they are. Lamasus are trash.
You gotta take them casters. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, what next? We haven't cast any ogres today. I'm gonna cast some ogres. Let's go. Ogre Kingdoms versus Dark Elves. Yachkov taking a Scrag the Slaughterer and a Gorger. Please tell me you didn't take the Cauldron of the Great Maw. I, I hate that item. It takes so long to charge. Okay, good. He didn't take it. He just took Blood Gruel. That's fine. Okay, okay. So we have, for the Ogre Kingdoms, two Saber Tusk packs, a Gorger, a Mornfang Cav, Ogre Bulls, Ogre Bulls with dual weapons, Iron Guts, then Noblar Trappers, and two Lead Belchers with Scrag. And Scrag took a uh, Bull Gorger and Bone Crusher. For the Dark Elves, we have two Dark Rider Peer Crossbows, but they get engaged on by Saber Tusk packs in the woods. The Saber Tusks don't actually have attack orders, they have movement orders. They didn't know the Dark Riders were here. So they need to stop and actually attack those guys. Elsewhere for the Dark Elves, we have a bunch of Cold One Knights, Spears, Witch Elves, a Dark Shard, a Supreme Sorceress of Dark, and another Cold One Knight. There, now the Saber Tusks are actually attacking them. The Cold One Knights will get a rear charge in. We'll see if the Saber Tusks can finish these guys off. But that's a really good pick for the Oak Kingdoms in the early game. All Total War channels hate posting Ogre Victories. Oh, uh, I don't hate posting Ogre Victories. Like, I cast a decent amount. It's just like, the, for me, in land battles, the healing meta is extremely old. So if an Ogre's replay is them just abusing healing and getting a whole bunch of Crusher's heal capped, then that's probably not going to make it to my cast. Big Soul Stealer onto the Mordenfang Cabin Gorgers. But the Mordenfang Cabin Gorgers should win this fight handedly, as they are. Bull Gorger was even on the Mornfang Cab to give him more damage and more weapon strength. The Saber Tusk Packs did their jobs. They took out the Skirmish Cab before the Cold Knights wrecked one of them. The other one is still fine. And Lead Belchers are firing away at whatever they can really get their hands on. Looks like that Black Guard Nagarond is having a bad go of things. Scrag is fighting back in Supreme Sorceress of Dark. Every spell he casts gives him a little bit of healing due to that Blood Gruel he brought for himself. And Lead Belchers are actually just going to shoot at the Dragon Lord. I don't agree. You should probably focus on killing all the spears and whatever. As these guys are going to get recharged by Cold Knights, that is going to be a dead lead belcher. But this flank went amazing for the Ogres. Out of the three Cold Knights involved, they're all below, I'd say, a third HP. So that's a good win there. Sabertusk coming back to the fight in the far side. We have Dark Rider Peter Crossbows that have rallied but need to actually be ordered back in. And Witch Elves are ganging up with the Cold Knights and Dread Spears to kill off Lead Belchers. This other Lead Belcher continues to shoot at the Dark Elf Lord. And once again, it's a reoccurring theme in my commentary, but I really do believe it. If you're dealing with something that has significant healing, you need to kill it or, or just don't bother. And versus something with a Soul Stealer, I definitely go for the don't bother. Just kill the whole Dark Elf army and leave her as the last thing in the game and then just attrition her out. In comes a Bone Crusher onto the Black Guard of Nagaron for a nice little bit of damage, but also the heal up Scrag. What would you give Ogres for DM DLC? More Noblar variants. More Noblar variants. Uh, I don't know. More monstrous. More monstrous units like like Saber Tusks, but other types of things or whatever. I don't know. Ogres are just such like a limited roster in general. You really changed my mind on streamers, so thanks for that. Oh, shit. Zero, did I convince you to just take all DLC units? Anyway. Ogre's still trying to grind it out. Dark Elves are rallying in the late game here. They've done pretty well for themselves. These Blackguard are hanging on against it all. The Supreme Sorceress is doing good work with her Soul Stealers and stuff, and the Lead Belchers are mostly pushed away. For the Dark Elves, what do we have? I mean, the Sorceress is obviously a big, big problem. Other than that, we have a healthy Hellebroni and some tattered remains of Spears. For the Ogre Kingdoms, Scrag still has a little bit of life left in him, especially if he can cast more spells and heal himself up a little bit more. We still have Iron Guts who are pretty healthy. And then some Mornfang Cab that can maybe come back, but the Ogres are kind of just running out of gas too. Scrag's starting to fall back as Lead Belchers throw on guard mode and shoot at the back of this Dragon Lady, but they're really not doing that much damage, and Scrag does get terror out of the way.
More gimmicky man eaters. Should be fun. Something in the lore. Yeah. I would for sure add a Firebelly Lord for the Ogre Kingdoms DLC. That would be an easy one for me. They also could use some more fun single entity monsters. It's weird that they only have the Stonehorn. Not that the game needs more single entity monsters, but campaign would be fun to have more single entity monsters. So I think probably a Firebelly Lord, some single entity monsters that are a little more unique and fun, and then some monstrous... Monstrous support, I guess, is what you call them. War beasts that are a little more fun. I feel like their Ogre Ogre roster is filled out pretty darn well. Um, and then some more Noblar variants, like Noblars with dual weapons or something. Lead Belchers, fine value. Fine. Gorgers did okay. Morn Fencat, the Great Opens did well. Ogre Bulls did okay. Saber Dispacks did all right. Not much effort, still okay. Nerd. Duh, 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 duh. Pretty good value on all of his Cold of Nights. So I just played this. Hold on, let's see. If I go to multiplayer, multiplayer battles. I have a pretty good Ogre Kingdoms versus Dark Elf build. This is not it. Ogre Kingdoms, Dark Elves. I do actually go Lord Lord Beast, just with Flock of Doom, and then Wild Heart. That's it. Um, keep him really cheap. I don't take the Blood Cleaver, because most of the Dark Elves are going to be Spears, and I can't just sit in them and heal. But I can spam Flock of Doom on a Black Art of Nagaron box, and if it's not a Black Art of Nagaron box, then whatever. That's fine. I honestly take, like, four Iron Guts... Three Noblars, five Noblar Trappers, one Lead Belcher if I can just kite them out, and that's fine. A couple Saber Tusk Packs, and then some Ogre Pulse Dual Weapons. That's that's roughly my Ogre Kingdoms versus Dark Elves build. You just run at them. The Lead Belcher and the Flock of Doom are enough to deal with the Black Guard of Nagaron box, especially with five Noblars supporting. So, yeah, just run at them. Kick their ass. Do some good work. I don't really take any Morn Fangs. I think Morn Fangs are risky and slow. Alrighty. We've cast a good amount of Chaos Swords recently. Cast a good amount of Green Skins recently. So we'll start with what else here? But as far as actual ingredients that were Warhammer Fantasy, they're pretty much in. Nice. Maybe a Trapper Hero? I know you Mayis would disagree with me. This is Trogdor versus Button Eyes Mark, by the way. I know you Mayis would disagree with me, but I think uh, Gorda's Backstabber is trash. <laughs> Thanks, Frika. We have 30 signups today. Okay, Wood Elves versus Greenskins. It's off to the races. We have two Wild Riders in the trees fighting some uh, Forest God and Spider Riders. A Blade Singer, Triple Glade Guard, Durthu, more Wild Riders. And yeah, Durthu has Flock of Doom, Curse of Andre here. What cures, kills their Cold and Spear Riders? Iron Guts and Noblo Trappers. Iron Guts and Noblo Trappers, for sure. Uh, the Swamp Fings on the other side for the Greenskins. Frontline Goblins, some Stone Trolls, Night Goblin Archers, Orc Shaman, Night Goblin Warboss, Morgan's Mage Marauders. And then four Goblin Rock Lavas again. And then the Broken Dust Mob. Damn, dude. Really likes his Goblin Rock Lavas. Swab Riders fighting a Forest Goblin Spider Riders. They should win that, but not multiple units fighting them. Hiles Mounted Lions. I really don't like this green skin build, personally. I think four Goblin Rock Lobbers versus what else is not good. Flock of Doom Overcast plus a Sword of Daith doing really good damage to the Goblins and the Archers in this area. But the Swamp Things are more than up to the task of killing off the Dryads. Meanwhile, we have another big Cav fight. The Wild Hunters of Kuranos and Wild Riders fighting against Spider Riders. And Broken Toss Mobile being shot in the back by Morgan's Vanging Marauders. But Durthu is already through the front lines and Wild Riders have caught up to the Death Creepers and pushed them off. On this side, it looks like one Wild Rider died. No, actually, this Wild Rider's... Yeah, he was alone. He didn't have any help, so... He's doing just fine against those guys. And now this guy's about to roll down the line and take out all of these Goblavas. 
Grog lavas. Grog? Grog lavas. Grog lavas! Lob some grog. Grog some lob. I don't know, man. There's too many things. The gob lava, the goblin rock lava. There's too many. Hammer gore. Wild Riders rolling through. They got one and on to two. Say goodbye to your rock lovers. The Blade Singers are up here, and they'll they'll slap some fools. I love Blade Singers. They're not a great unit because any winds of magic can kill them, like Burning Head, Fate of Yuna, Pendulum, like anything, because they're supremely low armor. But when they actually get in a fight, oh, they're so fun. Durthu gets onto a Goblin Rock Lava and also pushes it off. We'll see if Wild Riders can finish chasing these guys all around the map. Meanwhile, up on the high ground, this Wild Rider ran away from Force Goblin Spiders. But he ended up fighting Stone Troll, so actually that's going to be a whoopsie. That Wild Rider will be gone. In the background, Blade Guard have helped these two Wild Riders peel off the Orc Poor Boy Biggins. And yeah, this is looking all Wood Elf all day. Durthu just looms ominously as the Orc Shaman Terror out's like two inches away from him, but then Durthu just leaves anyway. He was tired of it. He was tired of this shit. Big route from the Wood Elves, so the Greenskin's feeling pretty good about getting rid of those two units. The Blade Singers take some damage from a Brain Burst. Dude. Don't know where the Greenskin's DPS is going to come from, though. Swamp Thing's running forward, gets set on fire by the Starfire Shafts in the distance, which they hate. Durthu's doing some good damage to him. Blade Singers might want to just turn around and take the fight, because they're currently getting rear charged by rear trolls for free. Greenskins bringing their last pocket of resistance up to deal with these Blade Singers. Blade Singers do catch the Orc Shaman eventually. They'll kill him. They'll kill him right quick. Look at him go. And he's dead. Is that it? Here we go, getting cast. Oh no, it's from Durthu. It's a Curse of Honor here, so that's even worse for the Greenskins. They lose a whole bunch of stats. They're all routing. A Sword of Daith follow-up, lowering their armor and dealing damage to them. And a Flock of Doom. God damn, they just can't get a break here. You love that Durthu has Vanguard? There was an update for the Wood Elves a while back that gave all of their Tree Spirits Vanguard, and Durthu is a Tree Spirit. In the distance, Morgus Major Marauders are fighting the Wild Hunters of Kronos. The Wild Hunters of Kronos are winning that fight. The Blade Singers here, beating up on Stone Trolls. Even without Anti Large, they're just really high stats, magic damage, and armor piercing are good versus the Trolls. Though I guess these Trolls don't have physical resistance anymore. Say goodbye to the Trolls, say goodbye to the Greenskins. That is going to be a GG. Nice job. Nice job, Trogdar. Good dub, good dub. Wild Riders doing okay. Blade Guard didn't have to get too much value, but they were supportive. But nice Mark. His Lord didn't get to do too much. Some of his cab did alright, but the uh, the Lobos did not have it in him. Archers did okay. Skirmish Cab did okay. Light Cab did okay. GG. Three games left. I have 30 minutes before I absolutely have to leave. We should be okay. I'll wait to go to the... I'll, I'll wait to go to the bathroom. I think I can maybe... Just tank it out. McCallium. Okay. I'm just gonna call him Michael. I'm trash. Michael versus Geraldo. It's the Norska one of everything, man! So we do have Skin Wolves, the Maws of Savagery, Mist Stalkers, Beasts of Tashnar, Chieftain Up on his Mammoth, Deathcaster with only Spirit Leech, Marauders and Marauder Spearmen, Skin Wolf Werekin, more Skin Wolves, Norskin Trolls. On the other side, for the Chaos Dwarves, Hobgoblin Wolf Raider with bows, three of them total, including the Wolf Boys, Bull Centaur Renders with Great Weapons, Orc Laborers, Infernal Iron Sworn, the Demon's Tongue, yet again, and Astragoth Iron Hand, yet again. In come the Maws of Savagery. Ah, uh, their charge got blunted by these Goblin Laborers. Boo! Anyway, on the far side, a real fight is happening. Bull Centaurs with great weapons are getting a much better fight than the last time we saw this build. This, this was versus Greenskins the last time. And they got charged by Orc Borba Biggins for free. So they died instantly. This time, they got the charge, it looks like. And they're doing a bit better. 
the more skin wolves are coming for him. And again, these guys have such low armor. And it's getting sundered by the Femir that the skin wolves should be able to eat them up. So these bull centaur renders are going to have another bad game. Skirmish Cav for the Chaos Dwarves is winning versus the Norskin one throwing axe guy. And meanwhile, this Hobgoblin Archer is trying to shoot at the Marauder Chieftain nice and slow. And again, the Demon's Tongue is back to just shooting its cannon at big targets. I love that he's committed to that now. Bull Centaur Renders destroyed for a second game in a row. And the blasting charges from the Infernal Iron Sword. Amy and a Shame Source for Death, but they don't do much damage to it, so that's a bit unfortunate here. It's over for Chorfs. I mean, they're getting good damage on the Marauder Chieftain. He's already lost almost half his HP. Ogle Khan's Wolf Boys fighting with Trolls and Skin Wolves alongside some Orc Laborers. And the Infernal Ironsworn still have full Blasting Charges. They need to turn around and use them. Honestly, they could use them on the Marauder Chieftain. That wouldn't be that bad. Skin Wolves are trying to get a big route. They're getting close to death. And the Mammoth does wander up to the Infernal Ironsworn. While Astrakoth is also hitting him, this could be overextending. Vermeer and everything moving up down the line. A lot of the Chaos Dwarf Chaff have died off. The only hope the Chaos Dwarves have now is to snipe out the Marauder Chieftain and just rely on the low leadership of the uh, Norskins to take them out. Demon's Tongue is still slowly burning away the Marauder Chieftain. On that mammoth, he can't dodge nothing. <laughs> the grenades of the Infernal Iron Sworn just say get out of here to those Skirmish Cav. I kind of love it. Iron Demon is under attack. It looks like Astrogoth's going to run over and try and bail it out. We do have Skin Wolves healing up on the sides. Mist Stalkers moving in. Norskin Ice Troll, Norskin Regular Trolls moving in. And I have to agree with the sentiment. It might be over. Infernal Ironsworn did go try and catch the Shaman Sorcerer of Death. They're getting some decent damage, but he could just kite away if he wanted to. These other ones have so much of their blasting charges, I really want to see them use it. Probably on the Marauder Chieftain to just try and burst him down. Yeah, they did throw after him. They're getting a couple hundred damage in here and there. Hobgoblin Archer is going to route. Goblin Labors are routing. Astrogoth's fighting. I feel like Astrogoth's stats are pretty good, but for some reason, ever since his nerfs, he feels really bad. But I can't figure out why. Because, like, his stats seem fine, but he just, like, never seems to hit, never seems to do that much damage. I don't know. Anyway, Astrogoth and the Demon's Tongue going down side by side. Some really nice blasting charges in from the Infernal Iron Swarm. That is quite huge. But they don't have the DPS. They don't have the deeps. Still a full health skin wolf over here. Where are the Maws of Savagery? Weren't they around? Oh, they're back here chasing off Pokemon's wolf boys. Yeah, Norska has a lot of regen left, a lot more troops, a lot more everything. Astrogoth is getting poked down. That is probably GG. There it goes. Skin Wolves did great, as they usually do. Femir did fine. For Geraldo, Astrogoth, even though he was like in a fight the whole game, still didn't get a lot of value. Iron Demon did okay. I love that he just uses it as a cannon. That's just so funny to me. Two games. Two games left. Beastmen versus Empire, Mr. Chalk and NC's Niklaus. The Klaus of Nick.
Alrighty, for the front line here of the Empire, we have spearmen with shields all across the board, a bunch of crossbowmen, not huntsmen, crossmen, halberders in the back line, silver bullets, Empire Knights, or are those Reich's Guard? Yeah, Empire Knights. Then we have Boris Toddbringer and Amber Wizard with Flock of Doom. On the other side for the Beast, we have Centigors and Chaos Warhounds on the side. Mortar the Shadow Gave in the center. A bunch of archers, Ungor Spearman herds, more Centigors, so pretty standard rush. And we have Zongors in the front line with some Bracium of Death. Got it. Understood. All right, Centigors taking a fight with Empire Knights. They're going to take forever to kill these guys without Razor Gore Herds or any form of armor piercing. So this is going to be a bad fight for the Beastmen, unfortunately, for them. Crossbows are even aiding a little bit. Boris lands on the front line trying to stop the bleeding a little bit as the Butcher's Cub Guard get through. And they're going straight for the Crossmen. I like this a lot from the Beastmen. Just getting into that back line and shutting down those guys. Ungor Raiders dealing with the Silver Bullets and a good spawn summon. So actually really good play here by both players. The Empire with a great catch on this side. And a good dive in from Boris while the Beastmen had a really good charge and focus. Not just letting these guys uh, shoot you down. So that's good stuff. Uh, well played by both players so far. More Centaurs and Dogs still really struggling against the Empire Knights. But they do have some Ungor Spearmen support. And Zongors not going to kill the Empire frontline particularly quickly. But they also won't be going anywhere too quickly. They'll they'll be around. The Chaos Bond Summon is using the most of its time to chase off Crossbowmen for now. Push the Calcum Guard, tear her out off the crossbow over there. One of the Centigors is routing. Empire Knights look like they're able to chase it off all the way. There it goes, and a dog is soon to follow for sure. The Empire's down the balance of power, though there is a Chaos Spawn Summon on the field. That will go away in 30 seconds and make things look a little bit better. Which the Calcum Guard have taken a lot of damage. Silver Bullets are rallying on the far side. And the Centigors and Dogs of the Beastmen, the traditional flank-dominating units that can chase off the Empire's... Uh... Oh no! Fate of Buna on the Beastcaster! That is a huge mistake! Fate of Buna is only good versus large uh, model counts. It, Amber Wizard is doing like net no damage for 24 wins of magic. That is really brutal. Big mistake there from the Beastmen. Anyway, what I was going to say is Empire has secured their flanks, meaning that their crossbows can sit and fire while being perfectly safe and sound. The center has fallen apart, however, so Zongors and Centigors are coming up through the middle to try and pressure those uh, crossmen down. The second spawn summon is out from Morgur, so after that fades away, he's just kind of a, a slightly tanky footlord. But man, look at the surround on Boris. So much damage onto him from the Butchers of Kalkengard, as they have just the perfect, perfect surround. Like, there are no gaps here. Empire Knight's going to get a good rear charge in. And with Boris's various leadership debuffs, maybe they can shock these guys enough to push him off of Boris for a second. Doesn't look like that's the case. The Butchers of Calvin Guard are in, uh, inflappable. Unflappable? They don't care. They do not flap. Ugh. They just stand here and beat up Boris. A Spirit Leech follow up onto him, too. Big overcasted flock of doom onto the Beastmen forces. Gets rid of their Zongors. Butchers of Calvin Guard still taking damage. And this is a fake spawn summon that'll eventually go away. It was a misclick. Yeah, I meant to cast Spirit. All right, as long as you know. As long as you know. Boris gets away, somehow sneaks through the lines, gets up into the sky where he can heal and get to safety. The Empire is not doomed yet. Centigors have gotten out of the back line, push off another Crossman and a Silver Bullet. It looks like that Crossman's going to get going, but one is still firing. The other Crossman over here is under duress, but currently holding position as Empire Knights will fly through Zongors to buy these Crossmen just a little bit of space. Centigors do run over to this other crossman. Bor Boris is back. He needs to dive onto the back line and save these crossbowmen on the high ground. And the second spawn summon is out. It's gone. So the Beastmen now just stuck with the Reliance they have. Ungor Raiders routed off by the Empire Knights, but the Empire Knights are going to have to get out of here before the Butchers catch them. They'll need to chase down these dogs and all this other stuff. Oh, uh, they opt into a fight with the Butchers, which is going to be a mistake from them. They will deeply regret it. Boris, at this point, has to just go around the map and route stuff off like this. He's routing off these cast warhounds, needs to route the centigors, then he needs to go over here and a rear charge in and route all these guys. The Empire just has to clean up forces and let, you know, these halberdiers grind with Morgur and the uh, stuff. Don't try to snipe Morgur right now, it's not really worth your time. Spirit Leech onto the Amber Wizard. And some Empire Knights are doing what we're hoping. Centaurs get a rear charge on them, but if the Empire Knights can beat those guys back, then they can keep chasing stuff up. Butchers opting into a fight with the Halberdiers. Halberdiers should probably change their attack orders onto the Butchers of Calvin Guard. Get good damage over there. 
And the Empire still have some crossmen with a lot of health on him if Boris gets some stuff done. But Boris is distracted. He's overchasing the dogs. And he needs to be a little more aggressive on the map. There's also a full health Zongor I didn't know existed. So that's not great for the forces of the Empire. Empire Knight's going to try and clean up the Zongor Spearman Herds. Should route them off with a good charge from behind. And Halberdiers do tear away from the bushes of Calvin Guard. Things are getting a bit dicey here. Oh, I don't know how or why this Amber Wizard landed in the Zongors, but he's going to deeply regret it. I wonder if he thought they were Ungor herds, not Zongors, but either way, he was wrong, and he got fucking bodied for it. Now the Empire is just taking too much damage. I think the little mistakes are piling up and into a bit of a snowball here. Spirit Leech on the Amber Wizard to make sure he keeps going off the map, since his leadership was positive. Looks like he might actually rally anyway. There we go. He finally ticks down into really negative leadership. So no flock of dooms for you, Empire. Butch the Calc Garden Zongor is going to push off Boris. They don't want to they don't want to deal with his, his shenanigans. Empire Knights should be able to bail out these crossmen. More Empire Knights and Halberdiers are chasing off lots of beastmen elsewhere. Boris just needs to get back to his lads. Heal up as much as he can. The longer this game goes, the more spirit leeches are coming your way. So it's rough. Centigors fighting as bravely as beastmen are meant to. A rear charge from Empire Knight should seal the deal. And Boris flying overhead is fine too. Boop. There they go. Can Crossman and Boris really hold on? Gonna times two speed as both sides kind of re coalesce for a second. Crossman cannot run the Butchers. Looks like they're maybe trying to get back to the Halberds. But we'll see. Butcher's chasing around some Empire Knights. Boris lands in for a nice little pick onto the, the de Deathcaster. I like this a lot, actually. Try and stop those Spirit Leeches. Because if you can just quickly route him and push him away, then you can chase him off the map. That's fine. Unfortunately for you, though, Brace of Death does hold his ground. And the Butchers are back. Crossman going to start attritioning the Butchers once again, poking at them. 45 armor and silver shields, but if the shields aren't facing the right way, you can get good damage out. Your heal cap is in sight. 20 euros. Thanks for the tourney. Cash and cheers on finding a new place. Thanks, man. Thank you so much for the donation. It means a ton. Boris is trying to push off the butchers. Now, he can't terror up them because they cause terror. But he is getting them nice and low. More halberds are joining the fight. Empire Knights are going to tear out away. And Boris has dead the onslaught pop, so he has a little bit extra bonuses. But a big spirit leech from that deathcaster he was unable to fully finish off is going over the top. Crossbows are still shooting in. Balance of power is tipping against the Empire. And if Boris routes, it's going to army loss them for sure. There it is. He routes. Army losses hits. And that is a win for the Beastmen. Nice job, Nick Klaus. Good attempt from Chalk. A couple little mistakes added up against him. But he had some good picks. His Empire Knights were mostly doing the right stuff. Like they were shredding some Centigors. Decent value on those Knights. Forest, all right. Flock of Doomcaster, all right. GG's. Last game of the day. I have 14 minutes, so let's just do it. Greenskins versus Dark Elves. After this, I got to get going. Heimdala versus Zarkas. GOE. Greenskins, Dark Elves on ye old pillar of ye old bone. It's not new bone. It's not a new pillar. It's the old versions. All right, for the Dark Elves, we have two Harpies, one just the Crows of Cain. We have some Shades, Siren of Red Ruin, Marathi with Melkoths and Pit of Shades above a box, a box of triple black guard and a whole bunch of Dread Spears. Simple enough. On the side of the Greenskins, we have Orc Boar Boy Biggins, Spider Rider Archers, Azhag with Aspect of the Dread Knight and Spirit Leech, a Giant, and then some Savage Orcs, Night Goblin Archers, and two Goblin Rock Lavas. My mans really loves his Goblin Rock Lavas. <laughs> Unfortunately for the Goblin Rock Lavas, there are Harpies here, and nothing was left behind to actually protect them. Tamo, thanks for all human. Hell yeah, dude. Was there any Skaven in this four-hour stream? It's actually going to be a five-hour stream, and I do not think there was a Skaven, a single Skaven game. Actually, I can confirm it. There was not. There were no Skaven today. And I'm not shocked. 
Orc Borbe Begins getting hit with the Melkos Mystifying Miasma as they charge into Spears. A Doom Bolt is also coming down on them. Meanwhile, the Harpies should be able to take out these uh, Rock Lavas. They're having some issues over there, but nice Doom Bolt. So, really good start here for the Dark Elves. Greenskins are closing in, and once their Archers can get in range, they can fire in freely against the Shades and the Siren of Red Ruin. Big pit of Shades on the Orc Borbe Begins who are over committing. And they do get routed off. One of the Goblin Rock Lobas is down. The Crows of Cain do have to come over here. Do have to kill off that other Rock Lava. The Orc Boys are here. Spirit Leech onto the Siren of Red Ruin as Archers are firing away. Uh, these Archers being stacked up is a worry. If Pit of Shades wasn't on cooldown, that would be a great target to Pit of Shades onto those two. Next turn, he only casts gaming games. Then I wouldn't have a stream because we wouldn't have any games. Skirmish Cav is trying to fire in onto some of the Spears. As Hag and the boys are here to fight uh, the Black Guard of Nagarond and such. Sign of Red Ruin's probably going to use her Whale of Malice now that she's in a giant blob of stuff. And the Crows of Cain do seem to be forgotten as these other Harpies are running away from Savage Orcs. There's her Whale of Malice down. It doesn't do a ton of damage, but it does a little bit. She's taken a lot of damage fighting As Hag. And Night Goblin are still firing in onto the Shades. Blackguard also taking a lot of damage. Well, the one that's fighting those guys is. The, the other ones are fine. I only recall a few factions we didn't see. We didn't see Nurgle. We didn't see Warriors of Chaos. No, we saw one Warriors of Chaos. Okay, we didn't see Nurgle. We didn't see Demons of Chaos. We didn't see Skaven. We didn't see Vampire Counts. You're right about that. We didn't see Kislev, probably because they were banned all the time. Yeah, I think that's about it. Orc Borbing is charging back in again. The Hellebron are going to beat up on this poor giant as he gets shot in the face by the Sign of Red Ruin. There we go. The Harpies are now remembered, so they're diving on the other Goblin Rock Lava that will soon be dead. There's going to be a big old pit of shades. Killing off some Orc Boys. A little bit of Blackguard friendly fire, but eh, all's fair in love and war for Dark Elves. The archers are still firing in. Nice spirit leech onto Marathi, plus the archer shooting. It was actually getting a lot of damage out. She didn't bring soul sealers. She has no healing. Yeah, Siren Red Ruin routes off those orc forward begins again. Overall, the greenskins are in mass exodus now. And soon it'll be just as heck here as this giant's even about to route. Bound Doom Bolt is going to hit the two Night Goblin archers. And since they're so clumped, it might actually do damage to both of them. And the Harpies are coming in for the final blow on these guys. Oh, one of them actually commits to the Forest Goblin Spider Riders, but the Harpies probably just take out those archers for real. Everything's routing now for the Greenskins, except for Azhag, pretty much. The archers are left alive for some reason. There goes Azhag. There goes the game. GG. Dark Elf Box. Dark Elves are stinky. I miss the days when Dark Elves were quote-unquote bad, even though Marathi Double Manticore could carry most matchups, but people still thought they were bad. My friend plays game, but he forgot to check in the tourney. That's unfortunate. Well, we're always around. He knows where to find us. That'll be it for today. Ladies and gents, good try from Zarkus. Good build from Heimdallar. Dark helps be strong. And GG's. Thanks to anybody who played today. I'm gonna go. Oh, I might stream tomorrow, not sure, but I'm definitely streaming. If you look at the channel, it has all of my upcoming live streams. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We have a stream every day. Goodbye forever!